Chcete sa aj na tom pýtať, či... Ja neviem, čo to znamená. No to len, že, že bol chvíľ vo skláne a že pýtať, že to je to najlepšie, čo bol to Kto ste voľní, tom, poďte na ten. Tak 
pripravujem sa na tomto počítači a na to vyhazuje, či to treba to vyriešiť. Všetci budeme sedieť v týchto rádoch, tam tá ráda nie je, hej, či je tu. Viete to tam potvrdiť? No, to skúšal som to aj na mojom internete. Vypísal to, či tam... Ja tam, že vypísal to, či tam... Ja tam, že vypísal to, či tam... 
A keď povie niekto nejaký vulgarizmus, tak je to na ňo pol hodinu natočené. Oký vtipný, no. Starý, no, tak zase. Čo počkaj, ešte ako som ho na to? Prepli si konto? Tak ho vypnúť. Nie, ho vypnúť ho musíte fyzicky. Normálne ho musíte vypnúť úplne.
Začneme, chcem vedieť, že všetci z tej zrozumenie, že budete kladiť otázky. Však, čiže na Mariana Ferka položí otázku o to, Kasinský je tu? Nie? Píše si otázku. Áno, Rigen je tu? Nie, výborne začíname. Pýta sa Kasinská. Dúfajme. Potom na Matlaka položí otázku Plaskorová, Uliniak, Mareš. Mareš. Dobre. Na Matlaka položí otázku Stanko, kde je Plavušťák, kde je Rafajová, kde je Potom Matúša Menku položí otázku Pučeková z Volenský Kožák. Ste tu? Dobre. Potom po obede budú klásť otázky Tadecová, Sikora, Kráľová. Kráľová tu nie je. Potom ďalší Valentko, Čarný. Valentka tu? Áno. Čiže miesto Kacinského položí otázku Ema. Áno, áno. A keďže Riger tu nie je, tak miesto Rigera položí otázku, kto sa hlasí. Koho? Áno. Jozef. Na miesto Stanka položí otázku. Kto sa hlasí? Čurko. Áno, čiže Adam, na miesto Stanka, Šimonovi Bachačovi položíte otázku. Do minúty začíname, je 9.78, takže už prosím potom mikrofón.
20, a kedy som poslal poslanku, čiže cez tvoj účel. Treba odklikávať všetky hosty, ktorí sa prihlásili. Checking sound. I'm not a good singer, but it's okay. Yeah, it's perfectly fine on our side, and the uh, 360 camera, it's, it's fantastic. It's very good. I, th so, I can see your students over there. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can uh, very well our hands. Uh, and uh, I, I will uh, make some uh, uh, first work for our conference, and uh, then uh, I, I will uh, give the work also to uh, different people. So, 
welcome everybody on uh, our conference. Uh, uh, I'm very glad that I can open this uh, two days meeting of our students and students from Belgium and uh, students from uh, Lusofora University, from uh, Portugal School. And uh, in the f this first day, we will share our experiences and uh, uh, of, of students. And the second day, uh, we'll uh, see the knowledge of uh, uh, professionals or professional teachers. So tomorrow will be program from uh, speakers from uh, Spain, from uh, uh, London, from uh, uh, Belgium, from uh, uh, kind of Canada. Yes, so I want to welcome Peter van Oite that came personally here. Yes, he hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. And, and tomorrow we will come also um, uh, Mrs. Nicoletta Wood from London. And she will come also personally. And uh, she will share with us her experience with uh, as a senior uh, supervisor of uh, Netflix. So it is uh, really a great visit. For, for us, uh, and uh, for today we have a program. Uh, this, this program is based on a presentation of our students from uh, Vushino, from uh, the first uh, class from uh, uh, graduate studies, and, and uh, uh, we'll welcome uh, Mr. Ferko, Mr. Matlag, Mr. Shimon uh, Mahaj, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Nonke. Uh, and uh, in, in the afternoon, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see uh, uh, students from uh, Belgian school, Mari Gallet. I, I uh, am very interested in her presentation, and she will do it uh, together with uh, Keoni uh, Fotogo, uh, that she is uh, from original from uh, Greece, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, she started to uh, study in uh, Belgium. The next group of students that we represent is uh, Sasha Pedin and uh, Dario Graf. And I, I think I, I saw this uh, on uh, this uh, uh, our uh, teams now in this moment. And uh, then there will be two groups of students from uh, University of Lusophona. Uh, there will be uh, Alonso Cuna, uh, Antonio Rodriguez, Enrique Montero, Julia Costa, Ricardo uh, Lauro. So they, they will present their uh, project. They, I, I don't know too much about it, but uh, they will explain in the afternoon everything. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the last group of uh, uh, presenting will be oh. Tiago Berlin and Madalena Cordillo. Uh, I, I saw her on Teams meeting now, and uh, uh, Mr. Jose Reis. Uh, in the end of our uh, meeting today, uh, we'll speak uh, together with uh, Mr. Dirk uh, Lambrecht. He's a uh, supervisor and teacher from uh, Belgian School uh, of West University uh, uh, that uh, uh, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think that is the best school in Belgium regarding visual effects and maybe the only school and maybe Peter van Hoyte will tell us uh, maybe more with uh, Mr. Dirk uh, Lambrecht and, and uh, then I will ask also Philip uh, Roos, we saw here uh, a moment uh, before uh, that he is supervisor and teacher on Lusophona University in Portugal. So it is program for today's meeting. I, I want to uh, give some word to, uh, to uh, the participants on the <coughs> meeting. I, I try to put in on, on the screen them to see them. And uh, it is... Uh, uh, it, it is uh, time to tell hello for Mr. Philippe uh, Luz. Some uh, opening word for you, please. Yes, now the sound is, uh, the sound was a little bit uh, strange on the microphone, now it's perfect, but uh, we understand it uh, quite well, your words, I hope. 
So thank you very much, uh, Professor Lepic, uh, for the, the organization of the event and for this special um, invitation. Uh, it's not our first time here. In the past, we saw some of amazing works from your students. Uh, the SMU has a fantastic uh, alumni and students doing some jobs. So um, it's uh, also a great opportunity for our students presenting works. Uh, there's going to be a presentation on games, um, basically. So our two sessions in the late uh, afternoon for today's session will be more oriented towards game uh, design, game programming, game development. So I'm looking forward for all the presentations and thank you once again for the for this amazing event. Okay, thank you. I see a speaker from uh, the tomorrow's in program, Mr. Wilson Almeida also from uh, Portugal School. So please, some uh, uh, interesting uh, work uh, for you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, the invitation to, to be in this conference. Um, well, I will be talking tomorrow more about game design. Um, I hope you, you, you like it, specifically about the, the puzzle design and process. And thank you for, for inviting me. Yes, yeah, so uh, because I see um, more students, I, I will want to uh, give them a work too, ju just uh, uh, some uh, introduction for you. Uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, yesterday I spoke with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Daniel de Graaf, so uh, as a great player for connection with uh, uh, in this way. So, uh, Daniel. Uh, good morning. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Yes, everything is fine. Um, Thank you uh, for having me. I'm a student in, uh, at Hoest in Belgium, uh, and I'll be presenting with uh, a, a group member, Sasha, about our uh, group project from last semester that we did uh, for VFX. Uh, and uh, we worked in uh, Unreal, so that's uh, we we're going to talk a little bit about our design process and how we worked in Unreal and our team dynamics. Uh, so thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, please, Tiago uh, Berlin. No, no, we don't hear you. Something with the microphone. Try to. Uh, oh, hello. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we are students from uh, Lusofne University here in Portugal, and in the afternoon we're going to talk about uh, two of our projects that we one we are developing now, and the other we already developed. And we're going to talk about a bit, a bit of the development side and the, our plans for the future with those projects. Thank you very much. And uh, Jose Reis. Uh, we don't hear you. Some technical issue. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm one of the colleagues from Tiago Berlin. I'm also a student in Lusofne University. And I will be also speaking about our projects in the afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalena Corrido. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank you for this opportunity. I'm also a student at Lusofne University in Portugal. And uh, as my colleague said, we, we are presenting two games that we developed last year and we are going to talk about them and uh, our future plans with them. Uh, thank you. So now introduce uh, uh, all students that in this moment are connected in uh, uh, Teams. So in the afternoon, there will be much more students. Uh, we will see uh, on Teams probably uh, about uh, 20 students. And, and now it's time to uh, start uh, our first uh, uh, presentation as I said so uh, our students are in the first class of uh, graduate studies and the first uh, student that we will present is uh, the main team is uh, Mr. Marian Ferko. As I said that uh, the idea is uh, of, uh, of this presentation that uh, students during, during their studies find some uh, 
for knowledge or information that they come at the most important. So the idea is that uh, our students will present the most important idea they got uh, during these three years of uh, or three and a half years of studies. So uh, if I uh, need to uh, introduce Mr. Marian Herko, he studied on a secondary school of performing arts in Bratislava, later obtained a BC degree at the uh, uh, Visual Effects uh, Film Faculty National from 1993 to 1995. Uh, he worked uh, for Gratex International, where he created many television soundtracks and uh, commercials. He also created the music video, The Ballad of Four Horses, for singer, very famous singer in Slovakia, Super Ripa. Uh, for which he won the music uh, video uh, uh, of the year award in uh, 1996 uh, and uh, 2007 he co-founded uh, uh, production studio Caldron and uh, uh, top three line studios focused on professional production of uh, computer games. From uh, 2015 to 2020, for he worked for Bohemia Interactive as a managing uh, director. In 2015, he co-founded the Slovak Game Developers Association, where he became the chairman of uh, the association. In uh, 2020, he co-founded uh, Nine Rocks Games. <coughs> Over time, he collaborated on the development of uh, 26 digital games. So it is a uh, huge amount, 26 digital games games. Uh, Mr. Ferko is uh, uh, currently also uh, the teacher of uh, game design uh, department. So please, uh, Mr. Ferko, uh, come here and uh, try to uh, tell your uh, presentation, to, to share your presentation. So uh, now you can make your comfort in, in teams. You can switch camera off if, if in a case or <coughs> whatever. Uh, so be uh, very comfortable and uh, and uh, uh, say join our meeting. Want to want to sound test if everything works. It's perfect here, I tell you. Okay. Everything proceeds in fine. Second microphone. Okay, so now I have two microphones. Microphone. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, and 
and uh, the resulting work consists of thousands of assets that are interconnected. So it's uh, very important to plan the work. With a large number of tasks, it is necessary to use suitable tools for planning, which can also be used in a personal life. So uh, I will present a brief overview of professionals, or, uh, professional as well as non-standard tools that are also usable by students. Actually, okay. So, uh, actually, the entire professional life of a creator consists only of tasks that need to be carried out. With a lower number of tasks, practically any software solution can be used. With hundreds or thousands uh, of tasks, uh, that's uh, another uh, situation. So uh, let's uh, take a look at the possible software solutions. But for example, this one uh, is a bone of uh, from Ishango site uh, in in uh, Africa, and it's uh, more than twenty thousand years uh, old, and it probably represents one of the first records of information of mo modern man. So our ancestor, the hunter had the need to record a certain numerical, numerical pr process. The bone contains a sophisticated number of notches in certain groups. Notches can mean a counting a certain process with a reverse ver verification. So it is something like the first Excel table. <laughs> uh, but it's quite important uh, in, in uh, our ev evolution. So, uh, currently uh, we can use various software so solutions for uh, task uh, shadowing, uh, simply uh, to, to do uh, programs. Let's uh, take a look at some of the simpler and fastest to use programs designed mostly for individuals. So the first one is a program called uh, Toodaloo. And it's an older, robust online solution that started as a side pro project of a software company. And over the time, it grew into a fairly complex software ecosystem that uses several programs for uh, functionality. Uh, actually, the only disadvantage of the, uh, is the charging of the use of subtasks, which, which are important in the more detailed planning. And uh, it's uh, one of the interesting features is uh, using tasks based on a geolocation. Uh, it's uh, absolutely free, uh, it's uh, open source, and uh, I used it for several years uh, in, a, in the past. Uh, it, it has absolutely everything uh, what you need. You can, you can check how fast uh, you, you, you finish your, your tasks, and it has inside gun graph, and so on, and so on. So it's, it's a really, really useful tool. Uh, the only disadvantage is that you need to synchronize all the important files by uh, separate uh, cloud uh, services. Another great uh, program which I use is uh, Kli on the notes and it's something like uh, uh, extended uh, notepad. It's a, it's a free open source uh, program and it's multi platform and uh, customized with cloud data storage uh, so solution. Because sometimes it's ideal to quickly write down uh, shorter tasks and do them step by step without uh, deeply planning. So uh, really I recommend it. Uh, <laughs> sticky notes uh, looks like, uh, like a joke uh, than a solid solution, but for simple writing down a quick tasks, they are quite enough. So it is always better to use simply uh, sticky notes than nothing at all. Uh, of course, sticky notes can also be used as a classic paper solution. So they are not children's toys, even with more extensive planning. Uh, for example, in the past, we had worked with Activision Minneapolis uh, in the company. And the <coughs> managers there tried to use various available software so solutions in order to keep track of the status of uh, several projects. And uh, in the end, they ended up with a lot of paper on, on the walls, uh, since everyone in the office could immediately see the current status. So 
uh, it can be compared to the clock on the wall of the office. Uh, many times it's more practical than the clock uh, on the monitor in the desktop bar. Uh, so it's simple, but it works. Uh, and actually a notepad next to the keyboard may also sound like an old fashioned solution, but it's still the fastest way to jot down notes. The advantage is that paper doesn't need electricity and the notes can be used even when the work screen is full. Uh, they help really well to focus only on important tasks. The problem is if most of the tasks are, uh, are compiled on several papers, then it's necessary to rewrite all open tasks uh, to a new clean paper. Uh, this dilemma can be solved by a tablet using electronic uh, ink and paper and uh, for example the tablet remarkable uh, device can fully replace a paper notepad. The conversion of written text into digital form works brilliantly and uh, uh, really I like it. Um, of course Google Calendar is a classical among users and it's probably the most widely used planning system on the planet, so, so when you use it, uh, use it, it's really, really excellent. Uh, and maybe uh, the office uh, at the Activision studio probably looked uh, similar. So, uh, some uh, professional solutions, uh, for example, Redmine, uh, and uh, Redmine is a Swiss army knife of planning. It is a robust solution that requires installation on its own server. And uh, however, uh, for the average experienced Linux user, the installation is not a big problem. Redmine is uh, free open source solutions that contains everything that every developer will, will use. The number of plugins expand the possibilities to the area that we can already talk about professional use. In the past, we used it several times in, in the company and uh, uh, it's a really, really great uh, tool. The user <coughs> interface is quite ugly, uh, but it's very fast and uh, flexible, so I recommend it to you. Uh, Redmine. Uh, Jira uh, from Atlassian is a planning rocket, actually, and it uh, contains uh, practically uh, anything that comes to mind when planning. It is a paid uh, so solution, which is uh, relatively expensive when there are more people uh, in the development team. Unfortunately, it is uh, no longer it no longer works as an installation on your own server due to enhanced uh, security, so it's much more slower than uh, Redmine. Uh, the system is free for small teams, and it's currently also easily connected with uh, Microsoft. In the company, we have been using the system for many years and, uh, for example, in the current uh, project, uh, Way of the Hunter, in four, fee, in four years, we created over 22,000 different tasks for team members, so a huge number. Uh, of course, there are also alternative solutions, but with such a high number of tasks, they become largely unusable, like uh, Asana, Trello, Google Tasks. Microsoft Project also effort, and so on, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> solutions that tie together multiple systems under a roof of one application are, are also interesting, um, but their compromised security is already at a disadvantage because uh, the user gives access uh, to passwords, important data to a third party and loses control over the passwords. So, uh, in this case, the granularity of uh, security features is uh, still poorly resolved. So if we want to tie together uh, Google Calendar, Teams, uh, Jira, Confluence, and so on, I don't uh, recommend it to use it because of the uh, security issues. So how, how to plan? And uh, uh, just, just a few words about it. Uh, it's really true. The correctly estimates time's uh, requirements. It's, it's uh, very important, it's, it's may, maybe the hardest uh, thing. Uh, usually you, you, you have to mul multiply your estimation by, 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 by two, and then again by two. Uh, of course, um, you, might to, you, you have to uh, set your main goals, uh, so you, you, you have to set a huge uh, milestone. And uh, plan in detail up um, to two weeks in, in, in advance. 
to, to have detailed plans for several, several months, it, it, it makes no sense. Um, and of course, constantly check your time plan. It's uh, very important. And um, and then, then the regularly meet and discuss the implemented and planned work. Uh, for example, in a company, we have meetings uh, each day and, and uh, huge meetings we have uh, tw tw twice a week. Without that, uh, the, the cooperation is uh, simply not uh, possible. Actually, uh, each manager uses a different planning system and uh, different approaches appropriate for, for, for each. So in your, in your uh, professional work, you need to find your own uh, solution. But uh, as a student, if you want to uh, control your work uh, behind uh, your computer, an excellent tool is this uh, Procrasty tracker. It's a very small uh, utility, very small impact on RAM or C CPU, and, and, and you can simply analyze your behavior uh, behind uh, your uh, computer. And actually, uh, uh, how to set time to, to work? Because my opinion is that work is like a sleep. That imagine that someone would disturb you 10 times during your sleep, so you wouldn't get much sleep. Uh, the same applies to work, uh, so create a suitable work environment uh, for suffused work. Uh, safely storing passwords is a category in itself, and um, in this way uh, you can uh, very easily lose a lot of work that can uh, already be done. Several people in my, my area have already lost important project information just because they used services <coughs> like uh, Bitwarden and, and so on. So don't store your passwords in a browser, in unencrypted uh, Excel files, and so on and so on. It's uh, just a question of time when you will lose all your uh, information. Great tool for this is, for example, KeePass. Uh, it's, uh, it's an open source solution that keeps your password safe uh, on your storage media. And again, you need to synchronize the files, the important files, by your own uh, cloud services. And uh, importance of, obviously, also it's a part of planning and, and uh, we have to think about it. For example, a construction worker has the opportunity to protect his eyes, hearing and body during the heavy manual work. But how you do you protect your mind during the hard intellectual work? And the only reasonable solution is a normal sleep. So lack of sleep triggers many dangerous processes in your body. Actually, uh, simply the brain is not normally rested. Uh, the effects of a kind of drunkenness occur. And uh, the brain is poisoned by its own chemical byproducts. Therefore, when tired, person can get into a state of euphoria and an excessively uh, good mood, uh, especially in, a, in creative groups of uh, people. So uh, work is carried out more slowly than tired and frequent errors occur. So it, in the end, a person spends more time on the same work than if uh, he was rested. If a person is tired, he quickly loses the ability to learn. That's important also. And uh, my short prediction uh, for the future. Uh, and actually, in the current situation, it is assumed that uh, artificial intelligence will take the work of people. But my view is exactly the, the opposite. So far, every tool that was supposed to speed up a person's work and add more free time ultimately made the person work harder. Therefore, the artificial intelligence can be kind of a trap uh, for humans. Artificial intelligence is very good at finding connections in complex structures. In our case, it may be the essence of DNA and RNA coding. So it is possible that in the, in the future, we will be able to produce any organism with any functionality. As we now uh, produce electronics because we understand the, its uh, basics. Regardless of the potential dangers of this idea, 
there is the possibility of the targeted human computer interface where the human could have all the added features of the computer. So we have a human being as a working machine who theoretically doesn't even need to sleep anymore, probably like a dolphin. A similar human condition was previously described in a book with a story about the planet Arrakis. So, in this way, indirectly, our great ancestor carved a few notches into the bone of uh, Babu, began the path that paves our life full of blank paths and words. And that's the end. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marian Ferko. And now it's time for questions. So uh, I, I have prepared uh, two students to put a question on uh, these themes. The first uh, will be uh, Emma, our future student of visual effects. Please, Emma, put a question. Uh, we have sound uh, box. question uh, for me personally uh, meetings and kind of just discussing uh, the workload helps me when I'm working in a team and if you maybe have uh, like an advice how a person can substitute meetings in their personal projects <coughs> when they're working alone uh, yeah. and alone online uh, in a flat <laughs> for example yeah uh, for, for, for example now uh, we ended with uh, several uh, so solutions in a company uh, we tried to put together a Microsoft teams uh, Atlassian confluence and uh, Jira and it uh, it works very well uh, in, a, in a bigger team when you have uh, more than uh, 60 people. But uh, uh, when you when you work alone and uh, and uh, you want to have uh, meetings uh, with uh, with with who? Kind of like uh, if you have maybe can may, let me rephrase the question. If you have any advice for just how to run over the important tasks, like how. Um, <clears throat> for me, it helps when I like phrase it out loud, like when I run it out loud. But uh, when you are alone and you kind of do not have the sense for structure, like what is important today, like mm -hmm. maybe the question is, how do you prioritize your tasks each day if you work alone and you lack the structure? Uh, yeah, when I'm alone, it's. It's a problem because you you always need to uh, check your work with uh, someone if you if you do it uh, right. After some time, when you do it alone, uh, usually creators uh, fall down into into the into the hole because uh, they are always turning uh, around same problems and same ideas, and for them it's <coughs> quite quite. It's, it's quite a dangerous uh, situation. So I don't have such a recommendation of what, what to do because I'll, I, I don't know. Uh, the only, for, for my point of view, the only solution is to discuss with others a, a, a lot. So not to be alone. <laughs> so. Yes, thank you for question. Uh, Mr. Rigard. Yes, so you uh, talked a lot about uh, managing uh, solutions, but uh, I would like to ask you, uh, do you use or, or and uh, can you recommend some tools to eliminate uh, distractions? Uh, yes, for example, I used that uh, tool, uh, Procrastic Tracker, which uh, uh, analyzed my be behavior uh, in front of a computer and simply after some time, I was horrified how much time I spent on Facebook, on Twitter. So, so now I don't have, I don't use uh, such a 
accounts are really uh, social or, or maybe as are very dangerous. I, I, I spend just few minutes there, few, few minutes there, few minutes there. And when you count it to, to, together, it, uh, it makes really uh, huge num numbers. So, so disconnect from, from the internet <laughs> uh, as much as, as you can. Uh, that's the simplest uh, solution. And you need to be hard. So, so for me, for, for example, uh, for each day, I write uh, minimal three tasks which I want to complete uh, the, the, the next day, and they need to be done. Okay. But uh, sometimes you need to go to the internet to uh, look for some uh, yes. tutorials on YouTube or uh, other sites. Yes, yes, but uh, as, as I said, uh, disconnect from your uh, social account. Mm -hmm. So simply log out and don't log in. <laughs> it's simple. Uh, most of the times I have a problem that uh, I'm going to search something on, on the internet uh, for uh, the work, but I start to search uh, some more stuff and uh, then I'm in the <laughs> loop of uh, searching other things. And, yes, uh, I happened also to, to me, so I, I want to find uh, something important which is connected with my work, and after uh, half half hour uh, I, I realized that I was reading some articles about something what, what is absolutely not con connected with my work. So. It's a normal state, and uh, simply uh, you need to learn how to behave uh, on the internet because it's uh, really, really dangerous. Excellent thing, for for example, for me, it works when I listen to uh, music, maybe okay. classical music or, or something like that, and it really speeds up you uh, dur during the work, and you are not distracted with, with uh, yes, uh, searching of different. Uh, uh, Information. But also easy. sometimes I use an uh, add-on uh, for Chrome or maybe it works on other web browsers that uh, eliminates uh, like the feeds from, from a certain website. Mm -hmm. So so when you uh, go to for example YouTube and, and you search for uh, some tutorials, it doesn't show you the other stuff uh, mm -hmm. that it is normally recommends. So you click on a video and it doesn't recommend other videos to, to connect. So yeah. I use that for example. The best way is simply to, to have a clean working machine without any additional pro programs and stuff and accounts. Is is the best way. For example, in the past, when we were not con connected uh, on the internet in a, in a company, we were able to work uh, really uh, more than uh, 12 hours a day and, and <coughs> sleep during the day a lot. So, so the internet is the main problem. <laughs> yes, Ms. Tiskova, she is preparing uh, one question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the procrastinating tracker. Procrastinate. I don't know how it's called. Mm -hmm. I just checked it. And, uh, I think that if I download it today and check my work, I would see a lot of idle time. Do you have like any suggestions or something that could help with that? But what does it, does it mean idle time? So you are uh, not behind computer? Uh, I checked that uh, like if you're like, let's say I'm working in Unreal Engine mm -hmm. and uh, the idle time was set to like 10 seconds and the uh like not offline but like i'm just looking at it was set for like three minutes or something like that and i think if i like downloaded it i would be like i see myself just staring at the project <laughs> and not knowing what to do so if you have maybe any suggestions like what could help with that or like more like with procrastination or something yeah when People are all overwhelmed by tasks. They start to do some something uh, totally <coughs> simple work, like taking care about flowers and mm -hmm. and so on. So it's it's a normal behavior. Uh, 
try to write down three main tasks which you want to do during the day and 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 fo focus it when it's uh, written on a pa paper because also when the screen is, is full of different uh, windows so so the notes are hidden still paper behind the key keyboard is is the most important thing because it focus you to the most important thing what what you want to do during the day so simple pen and paper and three 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 important tasks Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, free time for uh, next question of uh, uh, another students if uh, they uh, want uh, to ask something on this team, maybe from internet. Okay, so I want to thank you to uh, Mr. Felko and uh, we'll continue with the next presentation. Uh, thank uh, you a lot. studies uh, and uh, his, his, uh, his short uh, bio. Uh, uh, he graduated from uh, the Department of uh, Animated Creation on the uh, secondary school in Trenčín. Uh, it is approximately 100 kilometers from Bratislava and uh, subsequently obtained uh, the BC degree in the study plan of visual effects from faculty Bratislava currently. In addition to uh, studying and creating visual effects, he works as 2D compositor and 3D uh, generalist in the PFX studio in uh, Bratislava. So maybe we can mention also about some of his uh, experiences about uh, his uh, professional work and compare it uh, with uh, his uh, right ideas that uh, they had or, or original one. So, hello guys, do you hear me loud and clear, clearly? Some of the things. Perfectly defined, thank you. Okay. Thank you, so I can start. So, thank Mladen uh, for uh, introducing me. So, I will add some details to, to the start. So, uh, hello, I'm Fede Medlak. Uh, uh, I studied uh, at the Trenchia, as Vladik mentioned, and I was studying animation. And uh, uh, I was uh, applying on uh, performing School of Art in Bratislava. I will do yeah, basically this way, but a little bit differently. Yeah, and uh, I didn't get through at the first try to uh, animation, and I tried the uh, next year, but I uh, decided that I will not go so I will not continue in animation, but uh, I will go in uh, RFAX and uh, they accepted me. So I'm glad for that and that's basically how it all started. So now it's four years and I'm in first master years in RFAX and presently in Fuse presentation. And uh, currently working as uh, also Mr. Ladig mentioned 3D generalist and 2D compositor at PyFX. These are some titles that I had the opportunity to work on. Uh, first, uh, Black Demon. Uh, well, I would like to say something nice about that, but it was terrible. Also, uh, it's, it was terrible also on working on that. And uh, in the end, the uh, movie turned out to be also terrible. 
So don't watch that. Anyone who hasn't seen that, please don't watch it and don't do that. Real bad. Next one is uh, Land of Death. Uh, it was better, but uh, also <laughs> not really fine. So, uh, but it's, uh, you can watch it. It's pretty fun action movie. And the uh, uh, last one is my bachelor's movie, which I created uh, in a school. And uh, yeah, it didn't turn out as I wanted to, but uh, from these three, it was uh, most fun to work on that. So. Yeah, obviously, but... Okay, so I will now play uh, the short teaser from that Bachelors movie to show my work. And, uh, yeah. So that was it. It's basically a short story uh, about uh, finding yourself and finding finding fi finding your goals. Uh, uh, there is a robot that uh, lost his uh, idea of life, and he's trying to find a new one. Basically, yeah. So. Back to my presentation finally, so uh, today I will present uh, creating the 3D characters. Uh, I will show uh, my uh, basic pipeline and uh, how I created uh, this piece right here, uh, my outro portrait. Uh, why I decided to do this presentation? Well, as I was studying the animation, I was always interested in designing and drawing like the creatures and characters. No, 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 no not that the creatures, mainly humanoid characters. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to present present that something that I'm passionate about it about. And uh, yeah, that is the only reason why I'm doing this. I think. <laughs> okay. And what are those uh, CG characters? Well, uh, as many of you know, CG characters are a big part of the FX industry and all that stuff. Uh, important word, CG, computer generated. Uh, characters are digital creation made using computer graphic techniques. This character can uh, range from simple geometric shapes to highly detailed and realistic humanoids, animals, and creatures. And uh, even abstract entities. I think I have a slide there. So, yeah, uh, basically, I uh, in my head somehow di uh, divided them. So, you have simple, really like uh, CG characters. You can see these are like a uh, few geometric shapes, and it's mainly about uh, uh, that visual language. There are not that much of uh, details. Then you have a toy story, uh, uh, I will mention this is, uh, this is called Alike, I don't have it written here, but yeah, really nice short, you can find it on YouTube, definitely watch that. Okay, okay next one, our stylite, basically, basically the same, like uh, also geometric shapes, but a bit more details, and you can uh, see the differences, that these are more work on. And uh, oh, the last one uh, is uh, realistic, basically, yeah. Uh, a lot of shapes, really a lot of details, complex shading techniques, and so on. Okay, so this is Avatar, and it's very surrealistic. I hope that everybody knows that. Uh, yeah. Uh, give me a second, I need to find it. Yeah, CG characters find application in various fields, including film and television video games and advertising and marketing. So film and television, pretty simple, right? Avatar, uh, Ice Age, that's it. Video games, God of War, Hellblade, Sinema Sacrifice, 
the whole fame of that, but I didn't try that in the wild. And the uh, last one is for me is advertising and marketing. So like uh, um, Alzac or M&M's, uh, I think that uh, people on teams or from different countries or don't know this guy right here, or maybe they do know, but don't Google it. It's real bad, and I hope it can be well someday. Some so, my process. So, I always start in the research and concept. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about that concept. So, yeah, I have an idea that I want to make something, and I always wear a sketchbook with me, and I always get some stuff, and... Uh, uh, trying to find and I started with this character actually started with some civil war like those kind of weird things that wanted to be historical and uh, yeah but uh, after a uh, few sketches I uh, uh, find out that it's uh, harder to do like historical stuff when you don't have uh, access to like many reference or something like that. Like you can Google something, yeah, but uh, it's not uh, that great. Then you can you can go into galleries or something like that, but I'm too lazy for that, so didn't have access. So I uh, left that idea. Was continuing with sketching on a uh, like more present day and st slowly starting to shift around a little bit of sci-fi and uh, then I come up uh, come around this sketch well I was doing this just for fun and I uh, realized that I, I wanted a sci-fi character that looks like like his, clo uh, his clothes are mostly from present day but there is something like sci-fi like not too much and yeah uh, and I got to this one, and uh, yeah, also in concepting, I try to like think about what that character is. So I write it some notes over here. I hope nobody can delete that because it's horrible. But yeah, just my thinking process about that. Um, uh, and there is a uh, research, and uh, I split the research in uh, three parts basically: anatomy reference, visual reference, and quality reference. So yeah, anatomy reference. Uh, oh, I pr I promised that there was a lot more things right here, like not just three images, but yeah, anatomy reference, like looking at the muscles and structure of a human. Uh, also, this image is really useful. The, this one, so like uh, the nose, ear, lips, and eye divided into shapes, really helped, really helped me in sculpting. Then is a uh, visual reference that basically represents for me everything that connects in my head uh, to create that character. Like uh, you can see this one, this was for the makeup, like the trousers, uh, top, and uh, basically combination of all those. I know some people like to like divide it even more like visual reference for clothing, visual reference for, I don't know, mood, and I, I don't like to do that. I, I some, sometimes I like to have a little bit of mess in that. And the last one is a quality ref reference. Well, uh, this basically means for me that uh, I'm looking uh, at the works of other people and try to compare it with mine, so I know when there is uh, enough detail also, I am not overworking that, and uh, and also keeping that quality bar, or tr try to keep that quality bar uh, at the highest, yeah, like. So yeah, creating 3D models, so I use uh, a lot of shortcuts, but I'll talk about that at the end. So first, the photogrammetry, uh, who doesn't know who that, what that is, it's basically like, creating a 3D model with uh, from a lot of photos or from a video. And I did this one from a video, like I was uh, sh shooting uh, some short, uh, uh, some kind of, like, I don't know, shot with my friend, cameraman. And uh, yeah, uh, I had, I already, in that time, I had an idea of that I want to make 
different city character and I told myself right on the set that it will be cool if I will use my own face. So I told the cameraman to record my face and he didn't know what photogrammetry is. So I was trying to explain him, like go with the camera around me and try to be slow and so much weird, but actually somehow it worked out. So here is a process camp in a reality capture. Really nice application for photogrammetry. Um, uh, yeah, the results were, uh, results were ba very bad, worse than I expected, but I think it will, I found at the time that it was a solid foundation, like I have some anatomical reference there and overall shape of a head, so after that I bring that into the ZBrush and uh, clean that up a little bit with those record photos of my head. Yeah, creating a 3D model. So, yeah, so as I ha have that uh, clean head, I uh, did uh, also another shortcut. I downloaded uh, already scanned uh, uh, human. Uh, you see that on the left. Uh, it has uh, like uh, really similar proportions to me, so I like that. And I took that and cut off his head and uh, placed their nine head and connected that with. Like everybody who does ZBrush with basic like sculpting skills, with Dewey Mesh, uh, Dynamesh, and so on. And then uh, there is an interesting part about this. I found this in a tutorial, uh, this program called ZBrush, amazing tool. Uh, wow. Uh, I had a scan of a 3D scan store of a really detailed, like this was a really good photogrammetry scan uh, of a Mail and I basically took that with the Z wrapper and wrapped that on, on my model. And uh, what is the advantage is that you get all the texture maps, all of the topology of that model, and all of the details like uh, skin bounds and so on. And uh, you get that all over in a ZBrush. So if you have like sub D level 1 to 7, it all will transfer to your proxy mesh. Like to this one, right? And also, this shouldn't be looking like that, but uh, it was, because I decided to uh, later on uh, do the head separately. Like, also the one did the scan, scan but uh, just photogrammetry, photogrammetry scan of a head from uh, texturing XYZ, and I uh, projected or, or zebrat that on a face. And then later on, combine that in ZBrush and in texturing. Yeah, so as I have. Okay, so as I had a final proxy mesh that I was happy with, so I came to a program called Marvelous Designer. Also, this is a gold uh, application for creating clothes and uh, simulating clothes. like. You can do that in Zebras, like also you can sculpt the clothes, but I think the results are not that fast. If you are good enough, they could be like really good. You can sculpt like pretty amazing clothes in Zebras, but really slowly. And also it's not usable for uh, simulation if you want to do that in 3D and 3D, like straight from Marvels. So we have created that in Marvels. So you can see how it basically looks like. And uh, some technique that I use right here. So basically you start, uh, you know, like overall basic shapes and add details like slowly down the line. And uh, yeah, we use uh, double layer cloth. And I'll, yeah, I remember uh, after, so I use double layer cloth, some uh, like internal lines. I use like uh, detailing uh, around sewing. Uh, I don't know, my pronunciation is bad. Uh, and after that, as I was finished, uh, Marvel also did. It's a problem that was going on for years that the topology, topology is really bad from our roles. You cannot bone creep that. And if you want to do that properly, you should take that so into some 3D application like Maya or Blender and create a new topology on top of that and project that. 
But uh, in this case, I firstly find out that uh, my levels, I think it's nine or ten, added the uh, like retopology tool right in the software, and it like best in the best tool that I saw in a years. Like it was real quick, real amazing, clean topology. So I don't have to go between more applications. I just could go from my levels to ZBrush straight. So we have back in the ZBrush, yeah, take the clothes in, detailing more, adding some uh, chain, I think there was a ring also, nostrils, earrings, also, yeah, boots. And uh, bringing that to the level of not detail too much, but some details, like to not have like, you know, 150 million polygons, but keeping it uh, reasonable. And also, uh, I forgot about that. That uh, retopology tool in Marvels, it, ke it keeps UVs. So you go in a ZBrush with uh, UV clothes. And even before that, from that ZBrush that I was talking about, that mesh, that also keeps the UVs. So you are working already with UVs. So that's important for the next step and that's uh, like texturing. Yeah. So, software I use is uh, called Mari. I don't know that if even someone from uh, like in Slovakia uses this software. I hope so. I'm not not the only one, but uh, uh, it's great. It's uh, more. It's better for like organic organic stuff and like stuff that uh, you wanna have a full control of. Like if you wanna work with with real tight details. So, like uh, skin details and uh, bumps and all, all kind of, of this stuff, it's better than, the, for example, substance paper because, yeah, more control and also bigger advantage against substance paper. Uh, the Mary uses, uh, or you can use their no, node workflow, so it, you, it's more clear, uh, like you don't have like 40 layers stacked. Uh, under each other and you know, when you have a complex thing like this you are not scrolling like 15 minutes and finding that the right layer that activates uh, some dirt or something like that in node workflow you have it basically all shown and uh, you can do tricks pretty quickly so yeah this was according to that so texturing workflow yeah as you can see bringing that uh, zebra map into Mary uh, you can see here that it didn't uh, wrap properly. I fixed that in texturing, because it did uh, some of my tattoos, adding those uh, tears. I don't know, like thought it looked cool, and uh, some dirt on a on a skin overlay to make it reasonable with that tears. And in the last one, I think I just uh, polished some of the uh, dirt on the face and I did some hair because it looked weird. Same over here. And also, yeah, I forgot again. Um, uh, only for what uh, I use substance paper is a uh, baking utility texture because I love Mari, okay, I love working in that, but if you want to bake utility textures, like it's, uh, for example, ambient occlusion and curvature, in Mari it will take like hours. If you want to make an 8K eight, eight uh, map, it will take uh, like forever. So, in a substance, you have it like in a second. And uh, yeah, so I bake that in Substance Painter and use that. For example, you can see that here that uh, I'm doing uh, like uh, the dirt in a not much occluded area. Basically, AO, what it does, it uh, bakes the shadows in uh, areas that the uh, light isn't uh, like getting through that easily. So, yeah, it helps to add more details and the fast pro pro uh, process with uh, masking and so on. So, yeah, added some dirt and this will be all. Here are the, I wanted to show like texture maps that I created for that. So, this is Albedo, this should be displacement, this is a roughness. And also, there is a one map I use, and that's Metalness for like the earrings, necklace, and these other stuff and uh, I realized later that space doesn't have any metalness so you have a grayscale image 
so I'm sorry. Okay, and now we are getting to rendering, and I basically just uh, uh, edit there also a glue link that's not part of a rendering, but I'll do that in, in the end when I'm creating the final image. So I don't know, you probably can't see much here, but I groom everything in my XGEM. Uh, basic like workflow around the idea is to create like scalps from a mesh. So you cut out parts when you want to have a hair, for example, like here. I cut out this part because I wanted to have mustache and beard. This part, whole like hair, eyebrows, eyelashes, and so on. And then you can uh, apply XGEM on that, and uh, it will, if you choose that, uh, I think, or it will create automatically like the uh, curves or guide curves workflow that you, you will place uh, every of those red uh, lines and uh, like sculpt it, shape it, and it will generate like those micro hairs. And uh, yeah, for that, it's, it's real, really important to like place your guides and shape them really correctly because if you don't do that at the beginning uh, and you will later on apply like modifiers on that hair and your guides are not correct, uh, it will look weird because you don't have solid foundation. So I think it's really important to invest time in the beginning of shaping the guides and then if you have a solid like uh, hair already with guides then apply mod modifiers like uh, uh, noise clumps and so the stuff you can find out in tutorials and uh, I think you will have a great result from that also I have one image here, these are masks so it's important, this, basically this means that black is no hair and uh, white is full hair and gray because <laughs> Yeah, this is like half hair because we sit in hell and whatever. Look at them. Okay, so this is the first part or look them, I think. So first part is a look them, and uh, this is basically the end. You set up uh, your basic like light rig. You import your models and you are applying shaders on that on that models that you on the textures on the shaders that you created and. Uh, yeah, in this process, it's really important to play like it's, I have a meme right there on only one meme in my presentation. It's to play ping pong between applications. Like you do the first version, yeah, and uh, then you realize it looks like shit, and oh, sorry, and uh, you go back to applications like for example, Mari or ZBrush. You sculpt some stuff, you add some more texture, then you bring it, bring it back, bring it back update your shaders and you go through this multiple times it says here that it's version 4 so i was playing this ping pong like eight times or even more we created four versions of that yeah so here is a look now and the uh, last one is a lighting so when you have this one finished you create a scene uh transfer your model from the look now scene into a lightning scene you can do that as a reference or whatever and uh, yeah, you light it into the shot how you want it. So this is the final product, but you have, you've seen that in this presentation. And uh, yeah, this should be all. So final words for me to uh, like uh, tell some something that I learned along the way. So take shortcuts. Don't do everything like uh, how it's supposed to be or how it's like how it's harder to do like make your life easier basically skip some steps or whatever like for example that photogrammetry on the face i didn't start from ball and didn't was trying to match like anatomy with photos i just shortcut shortcut it that through photogrammetry yeah then put hard work yeah everybody knows that like be patient and uh, yeah, don't or don't be sloppy in a, in a, in a things because when you are sloppy at the especially at the beginning of that uh, creating of a three D model, it might happen that uh, it will transform along those steps that I showed. 
and in the rendering you find out that uh, your model is not really anatomically correct. So put hard work and um, treat every step as a final. That's the best for that. Set yourself goals and deadlines. So goals, what you wanna achieve with this uh, project and deadline, and that's pretty important. Like, okay, if, if it's a, like a passionate project, there could be like a, not that tight deadline, uh, but a sad one because it will like push you to do 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 the things, and uh, you will not uh, waste time on a project. Like you will not be working on project for three years or something like that. So yes, set deadlines, rule this destination. Yeah, basically, uh, don't focus on uh, like uh, the final image or something like that. If you are not in the end, if you are not happy with the something that you created, think about the things that you learn learn uh, along the way, and that's mostly important for me, like uh, to learn and get better at it. And the reason doesn't. And the result doesn't matter that, that much if you are working uh, at the, some of those passionate projects. And have fun, like don't stress about some things. It's, uh, it's really important because in these projects you should have fun. Uh, when you will be working in a production and uh, for some clients and so on, there is not that much fun because there are money involved. So. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, uh, time for uh, questions. Uh, uh, later, I will uh, give uh, opportunity also to put question to our guest, <coughs> Mr. Holite. So, first question will put uh, Ms. Laskurova. Hi, so my question is, uh, which part of the process was the hardest for you of creating this character? Oh, that's a good one. I don't even know, <laughs> to be honest. Everyone, <laughs> every step was hard, right? Um, yeah, rendering. Yeah, I was doing that in Redshift. That was the first time that I was trying to render a character in Redshift and yeah setting up shaders and all the technical stuff. I don't like that much, so yeah, that was hardest. Okay, next question, Mr. Ulmiak. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I keep thinking about characters like uh, Alzac, you mentioned, or some... Why? <laughs> Why do you do that? They will not let me sleep. Um, they look so horrible, and the companies obviously have enough money to order some better character, but they stick around for so long. So, why do you think that is? Yeah, it's. They tr uh, like they try to, uh, in my opinion, they try to like save uh, every money on these things because. Uh, they they know it will work. They have like uh, campaigns, uh, advertising, and those set up. And uh, I think it's not about wasting money or s uh, losing time and creating like really good or uh, compelling characters. It's uh, all about the uh, idea that he is green and loud and really boring, and that sticks in your mind. And uh, that's the idea. And after that idea, then. The Mr. Maresh. Okay. Uh, first of all, first of all uh, thanks for our lecture. I really enjoyed it. And I would okay. really like to ask uh, how do you stay in creative mode? Like most of us have uh, struggled with it. So how do you struggle with this one? Okay. Another hard question, yes. I don't know, really. I don't know. Uh, um, uh, when I'm uh, like uh, burned out or I don't have that creative mood, I try to go for walks. I always have a sketchbook with me. I always try to do some little things. And 
after a time, uh, when I'm sketching or walking, uh, I'll get some crazy idea and it will overcome that laziness. And uh, I have a feeling that I want to create. That's the basic. Okay, thanks for the answer. Uh, uh, I will ask if somebody from uh, online uh, viewers uh, want to put some questions from Teams. Okay, so... Okay, uh, yes. thank you. I have... Can I make one simple question? You will put uh, your picture on our screen to see you oh, as, uh, <coughs> as uh, you put question. Oh, thank you for your two. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first, no. for, yeah, yeah, yes, please, please. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, nice work, a nice show real flip, uh, nice name also. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> um, um, just a simple question now um, regarding the school projects. Um, at your school, uh, you are in develop it, uh, You are invited to develop those projects as a solo work. There are a specific briefing, or you are free to choose randomly an uh, idea. And also, a second question um, Do you integrate with other film departments, for instance, to integrate VFX work uh, within live action uh, image and CGI uh, generated content? Yes, yeah, so uh, first question. Um basically the brief for this semester uh, was a <laughs> great uh, we have like uh, the final like a brief that will be in the like the masters uh, years we are creating the movie and uh, uh, I try to like combine with per uh, my personal projects and school projects and all of the tasks into one right so uh, I want to create like sci-fi movie on a ship, right? And I know I will play there as a character. So I created the uh, um, the model of me to like uh, fit that in the scenes that uh, will be like far away from the camera. And I will be not moving too much. So I try try to combine that into that. And uh, the second question, yeah. Uh, we are working with uh, other branches, but uh, I don't do that really like personally. Uh, I uh, worked on uh, some stuff, uh, but uh, I didn't have a good experience. But I think that's uh, that could be because of me that I'm not like used to uh, uh, talking with like uh, the cameraman and uh, gaffer gaffers and that. But uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we are working together, and I work also in separate. Yes, for me. No, that, that is really challenging. Also, in our universities, we have the same issue because sometimes you don't give time enough for the people from VFX to do their job, and the things are not filmed shoot correctly. So I totally understand that. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, totally. I want to just add to that. Like, yeah, it's true. I totally forgot about it. The, um, the problem in that is uh, they don't really understand the work that uh, we are putting into that and then uh, giving you like really tight deadlines, uh, at least at the project that I worked on, and uh, like really hard tasks, harder, much more harder tasks than in the production. Yeah, so that, that, that's weird and I hope it will change by some time. Okay, uh, one more question from uh, our guest, uh, Mr. Peter van Hoyte. <coughs> uh, if, if you want to ask something to uh, our student. No. Oh, um, I was, I was, uh, we, were, we were just chatting. Oh, yeah. Um, my microphone. Uh, where is the microphone? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, intending to ask a question at all. But um, <laughs> uh, Michal and I were um, were just talking, uh, reacting a little bit on um, what Philippe said um, uh, about how uh, when when things are filmed, they don't understand the visual effects uh, process, and that's and that's 
you know what often what often happens. Um, I can I can tell you from experience that's not always so. Um, that's it's and um, and it also works the other way around. So sometimes, um, and I know this because I've been on set myself. Um, visual effects doesn't really understand how it works on set, also how expensive it is, and how important every single second is on on the set. So one of the last projects that I worked on uh, was a film called um, Obja, which was very interesting um, because the visual effects supervisor um, left the production for about a month because he was getting married. And I had to step into his shoes with about a two-day overlap to do, to do briefing. Um, and this was, this was five months into production. So everyone was already used to each other. Um, and the set was very organized. And what happened, and what was the most difficult thing for me to get used to, is that before a shot was filmed, I, as the sort of stand-in visual effects supervisor, had about 30 seconds to talk to the director and the assistant director to say, you know, what, what, what needed to happen, if anything needed to change, and it was only those 30 seconds, and it was, it was a schedule. It was like, after the DOP, before this guy, you, you, you say something. And often, often I just had to look at the set and, and say, well, yeah, okay, let's, let's go. And that is your moment. If you forget anything, you, you cannot go back. It's fix it in post. And even, even the best supervisors, the best, the best people on set will sometimes make mistakes. That's just what happens. And then it goes, it goes, you know. And it's easy, well, easy. It's, it's, it's very common to then hear um, after the shoot, it's like, ah, oh, why didn't anyone think of that? When the things were, were, were being shot. Very often, people, people did. There's just, there's just no time. Um, or, or, it's, or, or not enough money. To um, to do it just just right, but that can also be an exciting process. And again, that's 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 why I always advocate for um, as much communication as possible between the partners, between visual effects, between film. And as time goes along, you get to know each other a little bit better. And then what also happens is that you 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 you, you accept each other's mistakes more easily, um, which you know it's like you, you know you get the, you get the feeling that you're kind of in it together uh, in some way, even, even if you did make mistakes. So I'd say, I'd say never, um, even though you might feel like it, n never try and isolate yourself from other departments, from other people, even, even people outside your, your field altogether. There's always, there's always a reason, there's always a story, there's always people. Um, yes. So it's 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 more of a it's more of a statement than a question. I realise. Thank you. We will discuss about this uh, issue later. We have several uh, types of students. Some are team work uh, students, and then there are students individual as artists. So Philip is, for example, artist, and uh, he uh, he is mostly working on his project, and then. Yeah. And then he accepts the cooperation of another student for his project. So he is a kind of uh, leader. Uh, and Fantastic. in case if uh, nobody will cooperate with him, so he has to go it himself. No, <laughs> 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 okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice work. Uh, our next presentation will come from uh, Shimon. Uh, he is also a student from uh, the first uh, uh, class of uh, the graduate studies. He studied advertising at uh, the High School of Art in uh, uh, Trenčín too, so he is the same school, uh, the student from the same school. L later he received a, a BC degree at uh, our uh, VFX uh, department. Since, since uh, uh, 2018, he has been working as an independent designer, photographer, and graphic artist in the film industry. He mainly works in, with uh, compositing and uh, color grading. He is currently working as a freelance artist for Radios, Solek, and Foreigner production. So more he will tell himself. Uh, uh, please.
Hello and welcome. My today's presentation will be on the topic creating environment in gaming and film. My name is Simon Machar and I'm a master student at the Academy of Performing Art in Bratislava. Today I will discuss the issue of creating environment with the realm of game and film. From my perspective, everyone in film or games are rarely foregrounded and are often underestimated. Uh, the environment is one of the key components that is frequently as important as the story itself. The space surrounding our heroes and stories can be often tell a tale even without the need for action and in games it can guide us where the author indeed without the need for a single navigation point but how it's possible and that's about my presentation the field of environment design is complex and its fundaments can be found in interior design the interior design shares many basic aspects with the environment we use in film or games when we look at any of the fundamental Principle of interior design, we find their application in environments of game and film. For example, the principle of contrast. Contrast helps us create without striking space, and its key lies in the combination of opposite elements. Uh, opposite distrust, the flatness and monotony of space, adding or indeed placing elements with contrast characteristic together in space and this can be accomplished through various aspects of design such as contrast in color, shape, size, material, texture or style when using contrast in all environments it is important to remember that too much contrast can make the space where our viewers or players will be too crowded a lighting the exact opposite of headlining and interest, interest from the space. Therefore, it's essential to find a right space when using contrast as uh, interest and help define space. When used correctly, it can make a room feel dynamic and exciting or highlight key point in game where we won't be at the player. A good example is also post-impressionist art such as the painting by Rindman. In the painting we see the use of contrast to headline the object of interest and its so-called dream view, but to not just focus on painting, we can show the same utilization of contrast in the movie The Lord of Rings, which most people are properly familiar with. Uh, the Lord of Rings is perfect example of the use of contrast in film in the particular shows. Just one look at the frame explained to us, even without any action, what the essence of the scene will be. This action will the essence of the scene will be this principle of contrast at various level can be observed even more in games where contrasts are often used to headline and generate interest as mentioned earlier. Contrast in game has become a well established standard, sometimes even excessively so. The essence of contrast in game was indeed for a simple navigation of the player where you playing without the player even being aware of it. Uh, a fantastic example is the Assassin's Creed game series known for its parkour mechanism in open spaces which can be changing in terms of player orientation on where they can and cannot jump they utilize all possible contrast for this purpose for the example of contrast i use a mission where we try to escape from enemy in the first screenshot of this game it's precisely two white cloths leading us up to the space 
and players don't even realize it. In the second, after jumping onto the boxes, the mix of repetition of the standard object com complexed by the light contrast guide as well. However, what is less visible but significant is precisely the striking red carpet at the end of this pattern, which guides us to jump on the its place. Such almost invisible elements are crucial for orientation and contrast need to be considered because with the right use, it can be elevated or environment to a higher level. Color. The use of colors is a powerful tool and is uh, the core of the psychological impact on our viewers and players. It's often with, with other fundamental elements through which it can help influence many perceptions of players or viewers. Uh, color can conveil emotions and moods often tied to specific narrative along with involve of other components allowing us internally clarify the dynamic of storytelling elements such as making the position of our main antagonist or with just use of color. Furthermore, color can be used in other sense, for example, has the ability to visually expand or shrink spaces through light, bring colors such as white can optically angulate or spaces, while darker colors tend to construct them. Uh, this understanding can be helpful for instance in creating dramatic environments or visually more open space in stories. This phenomenon arises from the fact the bright color necessarily reflects more light, while darker color absorbs light. This, however, may be not be the only way. This principle of color can be also be in connect. For example, if we paint the ceiling and the black wall with dark colors and leave the side uh, side walls green, we can expand the space sideways. Uh, this is a technique that can be utilized in hallways or narrow corridors. There's much more to discuss on this topic, but if you're interested in learning more about these principles, you can go on article by Eduardo Souza on Archidaily, which was how colors change the perception of interior spaces. Furthermore, colors can be utilized to convey emotional mood, which clarifies to the viewers and English the players' incurred emotion. Cold colors evolve loneliness and sadness often associate with scenes using colors such or such as blue or purple. A great example of utilization in environment is film Blade Runner from 2017, which use a combination of this color long for loneliness scenes, this change the emotional impact of the moment and full Color can be also associated with narrative and time, often used alongside reputation, regular teaching or players or viewers, which color refer to which timeline or specific narrative. It's important to consider this in the stories, the initial stage, it often refers back to the narrative. Color especially in games is often used to defined between different areas. For example, the Legend of Zelda colors are an important tool for navigation and orientation in the vast open world of the game, which really religion again in the game has this characteristic color which helps the player to choose between different areas. Green symbol is grass, uh, here fields, blue is associated with water and sky, while red and yellow orange represent volcanic regions. The use of colors in this game allows the player intuitively recognize and explore various parts of the game world. Another principle is 
pattern, pattern is about repetition, does not in this sense. Pattern is about similar trees created by the story and its idea. A good example is the film of Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson has a well-established name pattern in form of pastel flawed environment with uniform color palette. The simplicity and visual style are evident across all the, his works and it's one of the many reasons why people adore them. All of these emphasis patterns which often need to be strictly adhered to throughout the creation of the environment in the film. The essence of pattern is as said, based on similarities as we seen with Assassin's Creed games with the element for jumping which as said we across all environment. The simple and quick means to identi identification can be utilized in many ways for association. We can teach the viewers or players to associate the tools, subconsciously provide them with information we want them to perceive. It can be about color object in the environment, but ultimately it can be about anything. For example, in film Gone Girl by David Finch, time and even the typical statement are conjured to us through the repetition of scenes and or elements follow. Another is other. Other can mean this or this. Other in context refers to representation of other in our story. Other mainly concerns consistently and should be consistent by our story in all its forms. One of the things the focus on right from the start is whether you understand the story and learn as does the story take place. What do you want to show the audience player and in what form? These and many other questions are critical. Once we have the basic, we need to gather information about what we want to create. For example, do you want to create a post-apocalyptic metro environment? Here many questions arise in terms of such as culture where the story takes place as the there is a big difference between a metro in Russia and one in China. What is the time period, future or past of the story? But also from a technical point of view, where do you want our player or camera to go? what should they see and what should be subtly shown. All of this has enormous implication for our environment and with the theme or change it is a big question that would occur later in the process could cost a huge amount of time. That brings me to another part I like to mention today. Uh, this is anything other than wisely discussed AI. AI is changing our industry and from my perspective to the better work that once to 10 to 100 hours has now been significantly shorted. And this is also evident in environment creation. Today we can create 2D environment using AI, which almost everyone who has been interested in it has tried, but there are many other AI tools, one of my favorite being Luma AI, which opens us for creating 3D models using AI. This function is based on pho photogrammetry. The difference between Luma capture and standard photogrammetry is the AI speed, uh, speed up the calculation for model simulation and tremor speed and reduce file size. The increasing the speed of model displays of of this runs on NVIDIA NEV system, NEV using neural network learning to rendering images in the so-called fields of neural radiation. This system still has problem today, however, with the proper use, the system can already be utilized in professional environment. 
So each application can be served in backgrounds, function likes uh, change and full flag reflection and by learning map subsequence we can turn each limitation in an advantage this creating a new style of art videos for example music videos uh, another function that is more interesting to me is Jenny from Luma Labs it's AI which create models directly just speaking the word we want to generate such a possibly given artist a tremendous amount of option as it save time without the need to create special 3D models or skin design as Jenny from Luma Labs is free this te technically still has its drawback to them For you can see the latest model from Jenny, which aim to create croissant for likely using word. It's amazing how this technology has advanced, and I took forward to seeing it in few years. Few of the most flexible AIs tools that can help us with this are green textures and the uh, area for the system. Both of these AI tools work on a similar principle and give us ability to create environment assets and textures directly in 3D. All you need to do is write down what you imagine. For example, if you need texture for a model, just speci specify what you need, exchanging the size and quality of the texture and it will be created according to it. The texture request you can work endlessly. Such texture in new AI models are already essential compared to texture in professional environments and other advantages, including infinite tiling, as texture can be generated infinitely, plus it creates perfect connection between two different textures that is great. Another option is to work with any texture size we specify, so if we need high quality, we just generate high quality, which we can also use reverse to easily optimize textures according to our needs. Another way to use green texture and error for D is for generating output, essentially function as a render engine what essentially throw it unlike standard renders they are much more user friendly all you need to do is envision to space and enter your image prompt to better illustrate you this let's consider an example with an apple imagine we want to create advertisement featuring an apple well, all you, you need to do is create a simple model representing the face and basic shape of our imaging object, enter the prompt, and voila, we have our end render. If you want it to look different, we simply create another variation or adjust the prompt. The system also supports the option to assign material to our objects based on which it can better create our enriched material. This AI tool open us to possibly create a huge number of variations and change in a relatively short time. Such a workflow allows us to directly discuss design with the client and make real-time changing to 3D space equivalently to vision of both you and the client this take the efficiency of create environment to a different level while the was present only dream of at the end i would like to emphasize the creating environments in games and movies 
it demands discipline and requires not only technical skills but also artistic vision and understanding of how the element emotionally affect the viewer or player. It's important to realize the artistic responsibility won't solve all our tasks for us. I hope this lecture provides a useful insight in the world of environment creation and inspire through the exploration of the fascinating area. Remember that every detail created in an element has the potential to influence our perception and embrace us the story of experience. Thank you for all for participation and interest. If you have any questions, okay. your presentation and uh, now we'll put uh, questions uh, the first question we'll put uh, uh, Mr. Stanko I can finally show my mad basketball skills <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so I stand it um, so uh, hello what, what happened uh, Martin, tried <laughs> uh, Ma Martin tried to repair it Okay, so I'm not. Okay, so Mr. Stanko, first question. I make reference of the environment what I want to make and after that I uh, take that in AI and make some AI generated imaging and after that I make my imaging in Photoshop from these images and that, that's for me I start. That's enough, Mr. Pauszczak. Uh, my question is, which part of process do, do you wish for uh, become easier in the future for you? Mm, render. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, render is more okay. difficult. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a lot of AI. So I'm wondering which part uh, would, uh, with AI would you want to improve, like a lot? Uh, today start new render AIs and it's very difficult to work with that AIs. Mm, and I want to uh, in few years uh, better AIs for render. <laughs> that will be all. I don't know if uh, Ms. Rafaela is here. No. no. Uh, so, uh, Michal, uh, ye yes, <laughs> Ms. Rafaela. Okay. okay. Hello? Okay. So, uh, my question is uh, which part of the process do you enjoy the most of creating environments? Uh, for me, it's a start where I find references. Uh, Read the stories what I want to make and start. It's for me the best. <laughs> yes, uh, some questions from the internet. Michal? Thank you. Hi, Shimon. Thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, can you describe some good workflow to use these tools? Because uh, I, I liked about this presentation that you show us the thought process and the importance of color and all of 
these things. Mm -hmm. And after that, we saw the AI. And I, I imagine it could be quite nice to tell something about a good work yes, probably. Yes, I, I understand your question. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, my English skills are, are as well as great as my basketball skills. <laughs> Uh, where to start? Uh, we starting with story and the reference. Um, we make some concept art, and after that, when we want to make better concept art, we go in AI, and we have all uh, things when we want uh, write, and we write the prompt, and make fun with prompts and making new renders and new renders, new renders, new renders. After that, I take that in Photoshop and mix this image in, in one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I under understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, what tools can you... What tools? Uh, say something about uh, them. Now I use a uh, drink texture. It's uh, AI for brand Blender, it's free and you see in my presentation in start of AI what can you make with this AI. This AI can make uh, images from 3D and can make 2D textures, environments, hardware maps and that's all. <laughs> Sounds very interesting. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I want to confirm that uh, uh, Shimon is uh, really interested in, in the colors very much, and I remember that on uh, entrance uh, examining that uh, he was uh, different with the colors uh, with comparison with uh, another student. So it's, it's sure that it's a very important uh, thing for him. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Last presentation uh, in the morning will be from a student Matush Menke. Uh, uh, he's student of the first year of the master's degree in visual effects at the uh, Mekio faculty in Bratislava. Since uh, childhood, he has been fond uh, of uh, digital art, creating illustrations and graphic design thanks to which he gradually got into video production, film, and creation of visual effects. He graduated from the field of image and sound technology uh, at the Karol Adler uh, University of Applied Sciences in Bratislava. And here he strengthened his technical skills in the creation of audiovisual content and uh, subsequently obtained uh, the uh, bachelor degree in the study plan visual effects, visual effects in Bratislava. Currently, in addition to studying and creating visual effects, he mainly focuses on uh, filming and post-production and uh, advertising content. My addition to this uh, is that uh, uh, now he works on project together with uh, Shimon, and it will be a fourth uh, or first uh, class uh, Final work, and uh, then he will work also on diploma in uh, film. Okay. So please, your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you all for uh, staying here and not leaving for uh, an early lunch break. Uh, I promise to make it quick. Uh, even though my presentation is pretty lengthy, I will go through it quickly, hopefully. Um, so the title of my presentation is VFX can be done without money and how to start for free. Uh, and it may be a bit misleading because I'm not going to go through the step-by-step -step guide on how to uh, spend the least amount of money. Uh, it's not really going to be for uh, complete beginners, but I will try to make it interesting for everyone. Um, and, okay, so, let me. <laughs> now, for the introduction of the presentation, uh, I will try to, at the end of the presentation, I will try to get you to think a bit differently about uh, the whole process of creating VFX. Um, and I will try to show you some alternative ways that you can create effects uh, that are even, uh, that are maybe cheaper or different, maybe even easier for some people. 
than the usual ways. And um, I will also compare some uh, some the software that's considered standard to software that's uh, considered uh, an, an alternative, as well as uh, I will talk about some budgets and why they do, and at the same time don't really matter. Um, so now let's talk about the cost of VFX, and uh, we all know that uh, in movies, in the film industry, it's mostly the thing that costs the that takes the most of the budget. Um, now I chose these four movies, and the reason why I chose them is uh, some of them are random, uh, and <laughs> and for example, Avengers was the one of the most expensive, or or even the most expensive film made. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once, the movie on the on the most right. Uh, what is considered to be one of the cheapest ones, right, uh, with VFX. Um, now, uh, if, you look, if you look below the, the posters, you can see the film budgets, and we can assume that uh, a big portion of them was used for VFX. Uh, and if you compare those movies, yes, they are all different, but at the same time, they have many things in common. Uh, and I wanted to compare the effects, right? You could say that with bigger budgets, there is usually more effects, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't always mean that effects are going to be better. Um, art is subjective, and so uh, I believe that there is many people who, for example, love Avatar, and there is many people who hate Avatar, and at the same time it works for other movies as well. So, in my opinion, the budget really doesn't matter uh, when we talk about the, uh, the quality about the effects. It only matters when we talk about the quantity of effects, right? Um, so let's do, let, let's look closer at, for example, Avatar and everything everywhere all, everywhere all at once. Um, some of you may argue that those two movies are uh, too different to be compared. Uh, I would like to disagree because even though there is 15 years difference between those films, and one of them is uh, almost completely CG, right, uh, Avatar, and the other one uses real footage and combines it with... Uh, with uh, VFX, um, they both won an Oscar for VFX. Uh, and even everything, everywhere, all at once, with the budget of 14.3 million, uh, won an Oscar. Um, and the thing I want to, to, there's few things I want to compare. And one of them is the fact that uh, Avatar was made with six supervisors and many, even thousands, of artists. Uh, on the other hand, everything, everywhere, all at once was, uh, was made by six artists in total. There was only six people in the team working on it. Um, and as well, uh, Avatar used what's now considered the standard software, so Maya for the 3D work and Nuke for the compositing. Uh, and everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, used Cinema 4D uh, and Blender, which is a free software for the 3D work. And they also used After Effects. They said that there was no Nuke used, uh, which, is, which is crazy for me, considering that they used free software and won an Oscar in the film. Um, now, uh, we could go through a quick comparison, right? Just to show you. Uh, this is the software used in Avatar. It's definitely not all the software, but it's uh, a selection that I chose. Uh, it's the main things, right? And if you look at the price, it would cost you around seven to 8,000 a year, right? It depends on whether you are an, an individual or a company. Uh, and if you look at uh, everything everywhere all at once, you can see that <laughs> thanks to Blender, uh, it's seven times less, or around seven times less, the entire price. Uh, and that's completely great, right? Uh, here's a quick comparison, if you couldn't imagine. This is what uh, six VFX artists looks like, and this is what uh, way more than six VFX artists looks like. Um, now let's talk about the requirements or standards in the VFX industry, right? I'm pretty sure that uh, this is, yeah, it works. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is something you all know. You definitely don't want to work on something that's slow and doesn't get you enough power. Uh, you want to work on something that's faster. You definitely want something that runs smoother because if you work on a slow PC, I know it from my own, own experience, uh, and you want to be creative, uh, all the loading time, all the crashes, all everything, uh, everything that slows you down uh, takes away from your creativity. It pretty much uh, makes you hate the work that you would otherwise enjoy. And so for that, I would say if you want to work uh, in VFX, if you want to do VFX, Definitely, it's, it's the one, one of the most important things, definitely spend money on a better PC, uh, or at least on a better GPU, right? Uh, that's what you need for renders. Um, so yeah, uh, slow PCs are not good. Um, and, good. and fast PCs are good, yeah? That's uh, just so you can visualize it. 
Now let's talk about the software, right? On the right side, we have what's considered the standard. Um, on the left side, we have we have what's considered the alternative. I had to include Canva because that's what uh, self-code designers use, so I had to include it. Uh, and if you, if you, uh, some of you may, uh, may argue that After Effects should be on the right side because it's also used for uh, other things than just compositing. But if you, if we compare it as a compositor program, uh, you would definitely consider Nuke to be the standard, not After Effects. So that's why it's on the left. So now uh, we definitely know that the standard is good, but does it make the alternatives bad? No, it doesn't. Right? They are also good. It just depends on when you use them. Um, now let's talk about free and budget-friendly alternatives, let's talk about software in general. Mm, what software should you use, and does it matter? Uh, short <coughs> answer, it doesn't matter, use whatever you like. Uh, long answer is more complicated. Um, I would say that the most important thing for you is to use the software that you enjoy using. Uh, if you feel comfortable using the software, if you enjoy using it, then use it and uh, don't care about what others say, right? Uh, firstly, the most important thing, uh, or second most important thing, is to never force yourself into using something that you don't like. Uh, and the reason is that if you force yourself into using a software that you don't like, uh, it will only lead to your burning out, right? You will burn out simply, creatively. Um, so for that, uh, don't force yourself into using something that you don't like. Uh, definitely give a try to different software, but if you give it a try and don't like it, then use whatever you like. Um, now, uh, another thing, don't be overwhelmed by uh, all the tools that the software uh, offer, because uh, I, heard this some, I heard this somewhere on the internet, but uh, I don't know the source anymore, I'm sorry for that, uh, but I heard that you only need to know 20% of the software 80% uh, of the time. So uh, even though software nowadays offer many tools, you don't need to know all of them. So don't let that discourage you from uh, trying a new software. Um, now, do you need to use the industry standard software? And it depends again. You need to ask yourself these three questions. Do you want to cooperate with, uh, bigger, uh, with other artists on bigger projects? If you do, if you want to work on, well, let's say, feature films, and you work, want to work on, in a company that already uses a certain, uh, certain type of pipeline, you need to adhere to the, to the pipeline. So that's why you need to learn the software, right? You need to use the same software as your colleagues use, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to work on the same project. Uh, yes, you would, but it would be complicated. You would need to find uh, workarounds, and it's always better if you if you fall under the pipeline. Mm, so that's the first question. The second one would be if you can afford the cost of the industry standard software. Obviously, in companies, uh, the companies would pay for the license for you, right? They, they have their own, own computers. But for you to get and start working into a company, you firstly need to learn it. And for that, you uh, need to ask yourself if you can afford it, right? And uh, I will talk about different types of licenses in a while, but uh, yeah, so ask yourself if you can afford the, the cost to learn the software. And the third question, the most important one, if you enjoy using it, right? Again, don't force yourself into using something that you don't like. Um, so, different licenses, here we go. Um, if you're a student, <coughs> uh, definitely take advantage of that, definitely. Uh, try to get student licenses. Some companies offer discounts. Some companies let you uh, use the software for a year for free. Uh, if you are not a student, then look for demo or trial versions. Uh, I don't think that the 14 to 30 days that you get for free are enough to learn the software or to, te to test it, but it's definitely better than, uh, better than not using it at all, not trying it at all. Um, for example, Foundry offers non-commercial versions. You can try that. It's, it's limiting, so... Uh, uh, you may not get the full, uh, to, to test it fully, to test the software fully, but it's definitely better, again, than not, not testing it at all. And my advice would be to always read the terms of service, because sometimes even when things appear as free, uh, and you get it for free, for example, for a year, then you may, you may sign up for paying for another year, right? So you need to read the terms of service, so you accidentally don't have to pay for another year or something. Uh, now, don't. Uh, don't pirate software. Uh, <laughs> I heard some people do that, right? Uh, don't do it. Uh, that's my advice. Now, let's compare some of the alternatives. And why are they not considered standard? Now, now I'm not going to go through all of the software. I'm just going to show you three examples. Uh, but let's look at Photoshop, for example. Um, with Photoshop, we have to pay monthly uh, with the new Creative Cloud. And uh, it may end up costing you a lot over time. Uh, 
there is alternatives. You could use GIMP, for example. It's it's really 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 stripped out version of Photoshop, but it's free. So if you need if you want to start uh, doing something, if you want to uh, test it, it's free. You can. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to get a copy of Photoshop, let's say, if you want all the same tools except for the new ones, the new AI things, then I would recommend Affinity Photo. Uh, it's pretty much the same as Photoshop, except you only pay like eighty dollars a year. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you pay eighty dollars one time, and then you can use it forever. Uh, which is way better because with Photoshop you have to pay monthly and uh, with Affinity Photo we have a lifetime license. Uh, again, it may not be the best to use in, uh, in companies uh, if there's multiple people working on the same projects and sharing them between each other. But uh, at the same time, if you're a solo worker, then definitely Affinity may be a better option for you than, than Photoshop. So uh, yeah, they're both good. Uh, <laughs> now, let's talk about Blender and Maya or like the, the main 3D software. Uh, nowadays, Maya is the standard, uh, and Blender is slowly becoming the standard as well. I'm noticing with uh, with mainly the younger younger classes that uh, many new people are are using Blender instead of Maya, and I think it's great because uh, I don't think there is much difference. Of course, there is there is a lot of uh, disadvantages. There is a lot of advantages of using Maya, but at the same time, Blender is free, right? It's co compared to Maya, it's free, um, so. Yeah, that, that's nice. Um, I was always told that uh, I, I wouldn't be able, or that it's impossible to work on great films or to do something bigger uh, with Blender, right? That I would always need to use Maya or something. Uh, well, it's not true because we have everything very well advanced that won an Oscar with Blender. So uh, that, I guess, it proves something. Now, uh, just to test it, let's look at this 3D donut, right? Try to guess which software it was made in. Uh, some of you may guess it was Blender. Some of you may recognize the blur background in the uh, the blur software in the background uh, and think it's Maya. Well, in fact, it was AI, right? It's it's not even it's not even a three D software. Um, so I guess it proves my point that it doesn't really matter what software you use uh, because to the to the pub to the public to people who are not in the VFX industry, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. So <laughs> now again to Blender. Uh, some people may not like Blender because of the default render engines. Uh, in my opinion, Cycles gets the job done. It's, uh, it's great. Uh, if you know how to use it, you can pretty much do anything with it. But if you don't like it, Blender is great because you can get a lot of add-ons. And some of the add-ons are uh, extra, 3D, so, uh, extra render engines. You can get Octane Render completely for free uh, for Blender. Uh, so if you don't like Cycles, it's a great alternative. Uh, Renderman is uh, free for non-commercial, I believe. And Redshift, uh, you have to pay monthly. It's quite ex quite costly, but uh, it's option as well. If you if you like Blender and you want to render with Red Redshift, uh, you can. It's an option. Uh, now uh, let's go to okay. That's that's cool animation. Let's go to sculpting. Uh, now, if if I mention sculpting, most of you are probably going to think about ZBrush, right? It's the main software, and I have to I have to uh, agree that it's the main software for a reason. Uh, because in my opinion, it's, it's way better than Blender for sculpting. Um, some people may be able to sculpt in Blender. I honestly tried it. Uh, it's okay for if you need to adjust something, if you need to deform uh, an object, but it's definitely not great if you want to make uh, make characters in it, right? Right? If you want to start from scratch and make a, make a character. Uh, so in this case, I would definitely not recommend Blender for sculpting. If you only want to learn sculpting, uh, I would go with ZBrush. But at the same time, uh, if you want to try it, definitely try it, it's free, why not? Um, and yeah, but ZBrush is the better option in my opinion. Uh, also, if you, have, if you have an iPad, uh, you can get Nomad Sculpt, it's also great, but yeah, ZBrush is the main thing. It's not even that expensive, I believe. It's, uh, you also have to pay monthly, but it's not that expensive as other software. Uh, now, alternatives when it comes to compositing, right? You have Nodes in Nuke, uh, Nodes in Fusion, uh, and you have Layers in After Effects. Uh, now, uh, I <laughs> Nuke is great. Uh, Nuke is awesome, and you should try Nuke if you have access if you have access to it. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that After Effects is bad, right? Just because Nuke is good doesn't make other software bad. Um, yeah, I love After Effects. Uh, it's great if you're a solo worker, if you if you only work on your own projects. But if you have to share them, uh, then it's it's not clear with the layers, and it often takes time for other people to actually work through your projects and figure out what do, what does what. So that's why I would recommend trying Nuke if you can, but if not, <coughs> definitely try After Effects, definitely go with Fusion. Fusion is, uh, is great because it's, uh, 
is affordable. If you buy a DaVinci Resolve, you already have it, have it in license. So uh, try it, it's great, right? Uh, now let's talk about different things for a while. Let's talk about free stuff, right? Embracing the keyword free. Um, now, I think you know this, right? You can just Google free anything and you get it. Um, and although internet is full of free stuff, uh, not everything that appears to be free is actually free, right? Um, again, no pirate stuff, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of illegal free stuff. Uh, but at the same time, the free stuff that's actually free may come with a lot of catches, right? You need to give attribution to the original uh, uh, original creator. You need to uh, ask them ask them for a permission. You need to I don't know do many things, give them some uh, some revenue. Uh, so keep that in mind that free always doesn't mean free. But also you should seek free things because uh, it's uh, first of all it's free, right? It, you don't need to pay for anything. And second of all, there is so much free stuff that uh, oftentimes it saves you time and you don't have to create stuff. You can just download it and edit it. Um, and now let's talk about whether free stuff is good. Uh, and to be honest, it's not most of the time. Uh, as you can see at the examples, uh, I chose three images of a doge. doge. Um, and those are all from Sketchfab. All are available for download. And all you have to do is uh, credit the original <coughs> author. And as you can see, they're all free, but they're all a different quality. Um, and it's this way with everything, right? You may find good stuff, you may find bad stuff. And so uh, you should, search for free stuff. Uh, uh, even if you find something that's not exactly what you want, uh, you can always uh, use it uh, to, to learn from it, you can use it as an inspiration, you can reverse engineer the topology, for example, and make it yourself. Uh, or if you're working on a scene where something uh, needs to be blurred in the background, you can just download something that's low poly and, and blur it. Uh, it nobody will, nobody will, no, will notice. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Free online resources. Again, uh, as with free things, you can find a lot of inspiration online. Uh, now, uh, look through look through social networks. Look through everything uh, everything online. Uh, I think you all know this. It's it's pretty basic thing. But uh, let the algorithm on social network help you. So search for artists. Uh, react to the posts. Save them. Like them. Comment them. Follow the people. And the algorithm will slowly recommend you more and more inspiration. And uh, I heard this opinion many times, and uh, people say that getting inspired is stealing, right? Uh, everybody wants to be unique. But in my opinion, being unique nowadays is really, really difficult and almost impossible. So you should, you should try to be inspired and uh, definitely get, ins get inspiration from other, pe other people, but don't, uh, don't completely steal something, right? If you, if you feel bad about uh, being inspired, uh, reach out to the original author, ask them for permission. Or if you feel bad and you don't want to talk to the person, just give them credit, right? <coughs> Say that you get inspired. Uh, but yeah, it's not stealing. It's just you are, you are taking inspiration, you are not stealing from them. Again, another thing, uh, search for YouTube tutorials. That's all this slide is about, right? Go to YouTube, search for stuff, learn stuff. Uh, I heard that the less views and the stronger accent the person has, the better the, 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 the tutorial is. I don't know if it's true, I heard it. Uh, so <laughs> So definitely search for uh, tutorials. Some people also offer project files you can learn from, uh, so you can download those. Uh, those are also a great source of, uh, of uh, inspiration and uh, learning source. Um, now, if you don't like YouTube, if, if you don't find what you <coughs> need, it, then you could try uh, sites like Udemy or Skillshare. Uh, you can't really still see the logos, but it doesn't matter. Um, and even though you need to pay for courses there, uh, they are great because you learn more, I guess. I, yeah, you can, you can pretty much pay for stuff and, and learn it that way. <laughs> and it's better than YouTube. Now, uh, these are just some sites that you could use to find footage. Uh, Sketchfab, TurboScript, I, I guess everybody knows that, it's for, free, it's for uh, 3D, 3D stuff. Then you have Pexels, Pixabay, that's for uh, video footage, uh, music, pictures, all mostly free. Uh, and then if you need some footage like explosions, fires, uh, water, rain, stuff, uh, action VFX, FX elements, all are great. Uh, but always, always check for the license and to make sure to uh, follow it because you definitely don't want to get sued by someone. So either give attribution or ask for permission. Uh, okay, now let's talk about AI quickly. Uh, I really love AI because it saves money, it saves time, and it's fun to experiment with. Uh, now, GPT, right? You can use it for many things. I'm pretty sure most of you use it to uh, write your thesis and stuff. Uh, you shouldn't. <laughs> but it could be great. It could be a great tool for uh, filmmaking as well. 
It could help with script, it could help with uh, shots. And something I learned from, uh, from our teacher uh, a couple of weeks ago is that if you get a script from, your, from a director, let, let's say, and he asks you to make certain VFX shots, uh, you can pretty much ask GPT to analyze the script for you and to find the, find the VFX shot to tell you what, what technology you should use, what software you should use, how, how you should do it, and it's gonna do it for you. And this way you save hours of time scrolling and reading through the script and finding the shots because AI does it for you within seconds. Now, uh, let's talk about generative AI. You could generate images. You can see the really uh, bad, badly generated image of me uh, <laughs> on the left. Uh, now, there is so many generative, uh, generative AIs, right? Uh, I would recommend using Stable Diffusion, uh, mostly because it's free and you can run it on your own PC. Uh, but there is also Midjourney, there is, da there is DALI, there is uh, Adobe Firefly or uh, the included AI in Photoshop directly. Uh, but yeah, some of those may, may, may cost you some money. So for that I would recommend Stable Diffusion, it's great. Um, and it could help you with many things. Uh, it could mostly help you with in the pre-production, right? You could, uh, here is just a random image from the internet and I decided to change this guy's uh, outfits. And imagine this is your actor and you want to test the different out outfit for him, right? So instead of getting to, uh, the actor to come to you and <coughs> paying for his time, all you need to do is just get his, pic get his picture and experiment at home, right? And now you decide you, you want him to look as a copy in your movie and you see it works, so you do it. Uh, so it helps, it, it helps you save time and money. Mm. Another example is that you can uh, fix stuff in post with it. Uh, this isn't the best example because uh, this could be done with a, uh, with a uh, rotor brush or a clone brush tool, uh, but if there is something covering your frame uh, and there is something detailed supposed to be behind it, you can use AI to generate the part of the frame and then just track it back in. And that way it saves you time, painting, painting stuff, color matching and doing all those things. And uh, again, uh, it's, it's free. It's mostly free if you use stuff like Stable Diffusion or the AI in Photoshop. Um, now, you could use it to create actual effects. Um, this is one of the examples I was working on. I was asked, it's for a student film, and I was asked to add, uh, add uh, clouds to the background. Uh, now, I was thinking about how am I supposed to do this. Uh, my first idea was to find the stock footage, uh, or like a, like, a, like a stock image, and then color match it. But then I realized that I could easily use AI. So I just uh, selected the, the, the top of the frame, uh, asked AI to generate cloud, and then I, after a couple of edits, I just uh, get the finished product, right? I, yeah, this is it. Um, now, this saved me, I would say, hours of time, and it only took minutes to, to get, get the cloud done with the AI. Um, now, the next example, uh, it has blood in it, so if you're sensitive to blood, then uh, probably close your eyes for a minute. Uh, but it's another example of AI. Uh, this was for a friend of mine, and he asked me to uh, add a blood splatter to, to the ground, right? Uh, and I had to use AI for that, and most AI is censored. You, you cannot use blood. So what I did was I selected the bottom of the frame and I asked the AI to generate a red juice. And it did this. Uh, now, it's really simple. All I had to do was just uh, put it back in, in, into the frame uh, and then I just did some adjustments for it to look like it's moving on the, on the bottom of the frame and stuff. And again, uh, it looks quite okay. There is reflections in the blood as well. Uh, and it took me minutes instead of hours, again. Uh, it saved my time, so it, it saves so much time. Uh, another thing you could use AI for, and again it's free, you could extend your frames. This is from another student film. Uh, and you can, it was the first frame was shot in Bratislava, uh, in, <coughs> and, I, and I like, uh, and uh, I was asked to add mountains and forests in the background. So I did that. The, first, the second image is the first generation I did. Uh, it generated some random boats, I didn't like those. So I selected it again, I extended the frame and generated some mountains. And uh, it's really great with uh, static footage. Uh, if you have uh, moving shots with, with different camera movements, you may need to experiment, you may need to track it back in, but uh, it works. It's, it's a concept and it works. Um, another great thing, uh, experiment with other AI as well. Now, there is EVSync or FSync, uh, and it's, uh, it pri its primary use was to transfer a certain style from a keyframe onto the entire sequence. Um, but it didn't take long until people found new solutions and new uses for it, and this is my example. Uh, I used it to save uh, on, a, on a render time. Uh, now, the first the first row you can see is the uh, direct render from view for, viewport. It's unshaded, unlit. It's just the thing you see in your viewport. And it's, it took around one second per frame to render, so five seconds in total. Now, uh, I rendered one frame fully shaded, fully lit. It took me another five seconds to render, right? So uh, that's 10 seconds. And then I ran it through uh, EV Synth, 
and it, it, it applied the one keyframe onto the entire sequence. So it took another five seconds. So together, it took me 15 seconds to get it to get a fully rendered sequence, uh, which otherwise directly from from Blender would take me 45 seconds. Uh, it's not great for uh, crazy camera movements. Uh, again, it's just a proof of concept that it works, and it's something that could be used in the future to save on render time. Uh, okay. <laughs> again, another effect that I did with EBSync. Uh, I did an aging effect, which otherwise you would need to need to do with uh, AI in Nuke, right? You would use copycat nodes, that's machine learning nodes, and it would learn the difference between an old person and a young person, and then you would apply them to the footage, and it takes hours, it takes a long time, and you have to pay for a new license, you have to pay a lot for a lot of stuff. Uh, I did this completely for free, in a matter of, I don't know, three hours. Uh, I get a footage of my actor, I got uh, a free phone app called FaceApp, I'm pretty sure some of you already know it, it's completely free for your phone. I choose a couple of keyframes, I made him old through the app, then I imported it back into, into my PC, I ran it through EBSYN, and it made him old. Uh, I had to do a couple of adjustments, right, it's not perfect. <coughs> Uh, I have uh, an example here. Uh, okay, this is one. Uh, once, he, once he gets up, uh, he's old. Um, it's not great. <laughs> it's just a proof of concept, but it works. Uh, and he looks old. Uh, there is another example after this. Yeah, it's a bit long. This is a breakthrough. Yeah, this was my first test, and you can see that on the top of his head, it doesn't really work well. Uh, it doesn't work well with hair, but um, it works okay with his face. Um, and that's what my, my goal was. He's getting uh, younger now, again. Um, and it's an effect that would usually take you hours, and you would need to buy a nuke for that. And I did it for free with uh, in a in, in few hours instead of tens of hours. Yeah, okay, great. Um, now, how do you actually make VFX without breaking the bank? How do you make VFX without, without spending money that you don't have to spend? Um, now, I would like to get you to think out of the to think out of the box. Think about creative solutions. Think about alternatives. You don't <coughs> always need to do the thing that's that's uh, considered standard. Um, now we all know that VFX is usually the expensive part of filmmaking. That's obvious. Um, and I and I want you to seek alternatives. Now, when I say seek alternatives, I'm not talking about using your bedsheet instead of green screen, right? Or using your phone or cheap lights instead of pro lights, or using even phone instead of camera. But I'm talking about stuff like, um, for example, let's say you want to make a, a CG film, right? You want to use motion capture. Now, instead of getting XN suit or similar suit uh, to do a motion capture, you could do something like, like Rococo. Um, it's free if you only use one cam. Uh, it uses AI to analyze the footage and then uh, applies the movement uh, into into the digital world. Uh, but um, if you if you want to use two cameras, that's more accurate. You have to pay. But it's always cheaper than uh, getting the full suit, right? If you don't have access to it, it's way cheaper. It's better. Um, it's not better in the in <laughs> after, after all. Like uh, the movements are not not going to be as accurate as if you use if, if you use suit. But it's it's one of the alternatives that you could use. You could you could think of. Um, now, next, let's say you want to photo scan something. You want to, uh, you know, want to use photogrammetry. Now, usually, you would go by uh, taking using your camera or scanner, taking pictures of the object all around it, then using your software and PC to analyze it, then clean it, and all those things. <coughs> now, why don't you just, if you need something simple, why don't you just download one of the free apps? Why don't you just scan through your phone, right? Um, if you have iPhone, it's even better. The newer ones have the wider scanner. It helps a lot. But yeah, why not? It's, it's just an alternative. I'm not saying it, it gets you a great result, but it's something you could check, you could try. Um, it's, it's a different way. Now, another thing I would like to talk about is thinking about different camera angles, right? Not all effects have to be CG, not all effects have to be amazingly creative. Um, but let's say you just want to create a shot like this, right? All you have to do is take your camera and put it inside the box and then aim it uh, towards the sky. And that's all you need to do. This is from a film we haven't finished yet, but we're working on with Chilon. Uh, and this is what we did, right? We, we put the camera inside the box, and then we threw a deer on top of it. And it looks okay, I think. Uh, it's not perfect, right? It's not finished yet, but it looks okay, in my opinion. And it's something to think about. It's something to think about different camera angles, right? 
Uh, and it's not just this. You could use camera angles to capture miniatures, for example. Uh, I've seen many people with miniatures, for example, toy cars on a, on a running belt. Uh, and it looks great. It looks almost like a real car. Uh, so think about different ways how to do things. Uh, now, another thing I want to talk about is using render farms. Now, yes, those may be expensive, but they save time. Uh, if, you are a, uh, if you are a someone who wants to create and someone who doesn't want to wait for things to, to be finished, for the renders to finish, uh, use render farms. It's, it's worth it. Uh, and at least it doesn't block you from being creative. Uh, if you are a Blender user, there's Sheepit. It's great. It's a, it's a community render farm. If you don't know it, definitely check it. I wish I was paid by them, but I wasn't. Um, you could, it works, it works on a shared rendering, so while you are rendering projects of other people, other people render your projects. Uh, and that way you get a faster renders. Uh, so that's, that's a, that's a great, uh, thing if you're a Blender user. Now, the thing I want to talk about, the thing that I, I struggle with, with the most is overcoming self-doubt, right? We all, all doubt ourselves, we doubt our, uh, our creations. And my advice would be to always try uh, and if you fail, then try again, and if you fail again, then try again, and so on and so on, until you succeed, right? It's making VFX is a learning process, right? There is always new technologies coming out. There is always something new to learn. Uh, and so just try and, and work. And don't compare yourself or don't compare your work to other people, unless it makes you feel better, right? Well, this is from Africa, Africa for example, right? Uh, now, look at that. I, I'm pretty sure you can, you can make something better. And uh, if it makes you feel better, then compare yourself. If it motivates you, then compare yourself to better people. But other than that, be yourself, right? Do your thing and don't let others discourage you just because uh, you think that they are better than you or something like that. Uh, now, <laughs> a couple more advices. Uh, when you're working on personal projects, uh, definitely set, set some, some sort of expectations. Your main expectations should be to finish, but don't, don't be so precise. Don't set up high expectations. Because then you may be you may be uh, unhappy with it, right? If you have no expectations, there is nothing to compare with, and so it makes you happy. Um, now, the success of your art uh, isn't based on what other people think. It's mostly based on if you were you enjoyed creating it, and if you if you are happy with the result. If you are happy with it, then definitely listen to other people. Mm, uh, try to learn from uh, criticism, but don't don't let it discourage you. Just create, right? And my most important advice, if you are feeling down and if you are feeling uncreative, then take a break. Because there is nothing worse than burning out as an artist. So take a break, uh, go for a walk, touch some grass, it definitely helps. Uh, yeah, now conclusion, just so I go through what I talked about. Uh, there was a lot. Uh, so find inspiration wherever you can. Uh, it isn't stealing. Uh, and if you feel like it's stealing, then give credit to your original person. Don't be afraid of free stuff. Uh, look for free stuff, use it, it's great. Experiment with things. Uh, AI is very helpful. It's a tool, it's not, for, it's not here to replace you. You should learn how to use it. Uh, think out of the box and think about alternatives. Uh, if something is considered industry standard, it doesn't mean it's the best for you. It, ju it just means that there's other people who are already, already used to using it and that's why it's standard, but it doesn't mean that you have to use it. And another advice uh, is to always explore experiment with the VFX, and just create, and be creative. And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you very much for amazing uh, presentation. Uh, some questions from audience uh, for uh, Mr. Matos Menke, uh, I'll prepare a question from uh, Ms. Puchekova first. Yes, my basketball time. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, can you provide some tips on how to plan a storyboard visual effects shot to minimize the cost? Yes. Um, firstly, use AI, right? Generate images. I guess that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, I cannot draw myself, so that's why I use AI. Uh, it helps. Uh, second of all, uh, yeah, just do it. Like many many people, <laughs> yeah, uh, many people skip the step of uh, making storyboards. Many people skip the step of uh, visual visual visualizing uh, the the scripts. And yeah, do it. It, it helps a lot. 
Yes, the second question will put uh, uh, Mr. Zvolensky, Adam Zvolensky. Uh, my question is how much money do you sacrifice every month uh, for visual effects, <laughs> if you are talking about budget? Uh, I'm trying to spend the least amount possible, but yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's uh, more than I would want to. <laughs> <laughs> do you pay for Nuke? Uh, I don't use, uh, I don't pay for Nuke. I have the non-commercial non -commercial version. For Is that version. enough for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and the second off-topic question is, wh when will I get the film that I'm supposed to be working on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> ask Shimon. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, next question, Mr. Kozak. So where do you see the current limitations of AI tools that are available to you and maybe mm, where are the limitations in regards to your VFX workflow? Uh, it's, it's quite limited right now. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect, right? It's, it's the same like all the other tools, nothing is perfect. Um, and there is always uh, there is always uh, better tools to be used. Like it's always evolving, and uh, so yeah, it's it's quite limited. And uh, all, all I have to say is that you have to experiment with it. If you experiment, you may you may find a solution to your problems. Uh, but yeah, it's it's about experimenting. It's yeah, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, I don't really know how to answer it. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, now it is uh, time for three questions, and then I will uh, give a uh, word to our guests on internet and also uh, to Peter uh, van Hoyte. So wh who wants to ask something? Okay, uh, uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Philippe Rouge. Yeah, I, I didn't but well, sometimes uh, your price control date is a little bit uh, uh, away. But uh, the presentation was, was perfect and I agreed quite well. Uh, so thank you, Matthews. And also thank you for Simon, because this question could be presented for both. Uh, Simon shows several portfolios, um, patterns and colors, uh, reference, visual reference and you show it also amazing possibilities. So, but sometimes I'm seeing, I'm a super fan of AI also, to be honest, in visual effects, games, etc. but quite often a lot of AI is very stylized, very similar, <laughs> um, very level between the creators. So this sometimes is a risk for creativity. How do you think we could tackle, combat this, uh, this stylized version. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's, again, it's all about experimenting, I would say. Um, you could find different models of AI. There is different, uh, different kinds. For example, stable diffusion, uh, you can download a bunch of models of trained data, and some of it is, some of it is trained on real-life footage, some of it is trained on uh, animated stuff. So it depends, but at the same time, I, I understand what you mean. Like it's it's uh, it could limit your creativity. It could definitely take away from uh, from your own creativity when you let AI just do it for you. But at the same time, I think if you cannot think of something, if you cannot imagine something yourself straight away, uh, I, I think it's a great first step to use AI for it. Firstly, thank you. Yes. Uh, um, I, I want to ask uh, Mr. Wilson Almeida if uh, he uh, has some uh, uh, notices about uh, our morning presentations. Uh, he doesn't hear us, probably. Okay, so uh, Mr. Peter van Hoyte, you can uh, mm, say anything about this presentation in the morning and, and then we'll have a break and then in the afternoon there will be students from uh, Belgium school and from uh, uh, from uh, uh, I'd actually I'd actually like to ask ask a question yes um, <coughs> your so the, sort of the, the, the topic of your presentation is great presentation thank you um, uh, is also a dangerous one um, because um, it doesn't really say anything about time. 
Right. So you can indeed, and there, and there is, um, as some of you may know, uh, there's been what's called a race to the bottom in vision effects for many years now, where people are trying to cut money, they're trying to cut uh, costs. Margins are increasingly thin. Um, but um, time is, is also money. And um, yes, there are free tools out there, uh, more and more. Uh, I would like to add, by the way, um, Fusion actually comes for free in the free version of Resolve. So if you want to use Fusion for free entirely, even for commercial use, you can, you can use that one. Um, but there's an old saying that says, if a product is free, then you are the product. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's proven to be very, very, very true. Uh, true. So um, how, what would you say to someone going into visual effects and trying to make a living? You know, how do they sell themselves in an environment where there is so much effort being put into um, the, 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 the notion that it's always uh, cheaper and faster and easier to get into it? It's a great question. Uh, um, yeah, it's it's something that's not easy to answer. I would say that if you want to sell yourself, you need to somehow uh, have your style. You need to sell. You need to you need to know how to do it. Like it's it's all marketing, right? Um, even as you said, you are the product. Even 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 with the time, I I really don't know. Uh, it's it's a good question. I yeah, I, I don't know. I would like to know as well. That's, that's yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it, in my view, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky balance because um, especially now, you know, AI is. Um, I, I, I like using AI myself. I like keeping track of the technology and and everything. But what I've realized also is um, it's very easy to to access. There's a lot of basically free commercials out there. Everywhere, every social network is now being flooded with AI generated mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, visuals, music, texts, absolutely, absolutely everything, which is great, you know, great marketing for the people who generate, generate the tools. But at the same time, AI is an enormous time suck. So once you get busy with those tools and they are fun to use, before you know it, you're, you've, you've been at it for hours and hours and hours, making, you know, 70 different variations. And then obviously you put the best ones online um, again showcasing the tool behind behind the images but your time up to that point has been has been has been free so also also there same same kind of same kind of questions uh, question how far do you go into into sort of supporting the idea that it is cheaper and easier and faster but still trying to make a living in the real world yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same as any other tool, right? You, you spend time using it, you spend time learning how to use it. Um, it's still work, right? Even if it's free, it's still your work. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it may be difficult to explain to other people why you should be paid for something that's free uh, or that they can use as well. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, I guess the results speak from, for, for themselves, right? Uh, I mean, tell them to try it themselves. And I, I'm pretty sure they won't do the same thing as you would do with your experience. Um, and it's the same like everybody can download any other, other tool and, and try it and use it, but they won't have the experience, they won't be able to, uh, to create the same thing as you. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's difficult to say, that's why I I never said that it's the best thing to use. That's why I never said that AI may be the best thing for everyone in my presentation. That's why I always uh, talked about alternatives and different ways of creating things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, creativity. Yeah. Creativity and, and your ability to yes, get out there with it. But on okay. another Thank side, uh, I think the philosophy of uh, our department is really to catch uh, artificial intelligence as soon as possible, as, as, uh, as best as possible. So it is the main uh, goal and the main direction and uh, uh, we'll see what will happen. It, it, it will be for future paid or not paid or how, how it will be. Yes, but uh, but uh, in this moment it is uh, really the best future for our students. Absolutely, no, I do agree. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, now we shall have a break uh, for...
almost uh, 50 minutes and uh, in the afternoon by schedule we'll start with uh, presentations of uh, students from uh, uh, Howard University. Um, it will be Mary uh, Gellet, uh, Tony uh, Fotoglo, uh, then uh, uh, Sasha Bean, Dial de Graf, uh, and uh, then there will be students from uh, Lusophona University, eight students. <coughs> so uh, for this moment, I will uh, uh, say that uh, it is a break. Uh, thank you for participants on the uh, internet. And uh, at 3.30, uh, we will uh, meet uh, each other together on this conference. Uh, for our students, uh, uh, we have some uh, little refreshments for you. So in uh, the middle among uh, these doors, uh, there are uh, some uh, breads uh, as I come so probably two pieces of on uh, everybody has to be there so so please uh, refresh you and uh, at uh, 3 uh, 13 30 we'll meet here and continue in uh, our presentations online thank you yeah. you have time Jedna vec, ktorú som ti nemal ja povedať, ktorú na to treba mysleť, keď doprezentujú.
first uh, then question about invisibility, how, how to do develop this invisibility for self-published prototypes yeah. in, in future. Yeah. And maybe more results and, 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 and so on. And, and comparison with big firms and they still can accept their skills and uh, give them a job. So uh, the philosophy of game design is uh, mainly invisible. we are our school, so we cannot prove then that they will have a job in every place. And this is for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. And this is for uh, actors, yeah. musicians, for singers, for whatever. It's very not um, easy to be um, mm -hmm. professional in, in yeah. this field. And, and, and this profession is mainly about this, how to build this feeling that I, I want to go by my own way yeah. and to develop my project and, and, and to have a risk. Yeah. Maybe yeah. a risk, yeah. yeah. Maybe a risk, maybe no. Yeah. But now, since I understand you are practical. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so, 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 so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for your workshop, it, it is yeah. a kind of, uh, uh, of this uh, maybe motivation, Um, Marie's Marie's presenting through their um, uh, computer, so I don't have the PowerPoint. Sound, I need to hear sound. Yes. Great. Very good. So now we are technically prepared uh, for uh, presentation. 
potential. Uh, probably uh, we have five minutes more, uh, and uh, and uh, then at uh, uh, one thirty we start. Okay. Yes. Thank you. can close uh, sharing for this moment. Very good. Uh, do you know something about uh, Berg? Uh, I, I know that uh, he's probably uh, busy, but the question if, uh, if you have contact with him. I think so. Can you uh, push your sound uh, higher? I, I can hear you. Uh, not uh, microphone closer, but uh, but uh, the level of uh, audio a little higher. Um, like this? A little bit more. Is this better? Not at all. It could be better. Now? Like this? Is it like improving? Uh, it, it's better, yes. Uh, now it's better. I can we also. Uh, okay. Uh, we try to. Hello? Uh, hello. Uh, so probably. I, I is it, is, yeah. is it better now, the sound? No, no, for it's me? It's perfect. Hello. Okay. Yeah, so probably in the beginning uh, you can interview you uh, about uh, where are you, what are you doing, uh, about internship or. Introduction about what, and then we will start this uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Okay. Okay. So uh, five minutes. Uh, okay. from our cases to camera on YouTube. Do you have it? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I will share the information that, uh, that on our web page, on our conference, if you have this web page, so uh, uh, there is uh, the window in which you can see the whole space, not uh, just you, but the whole space with students. Uh, now it is probably closed, but uh, it is sharing, but uh, generally it, it must be seen there. Okay, uh, so is that like where they're projecting the talk? Or? Yeah, 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 it's a okay. projecting talk. I'll start sharing my presentation as well already, or no? Uh, uh, I, I will uh, tell you when uh, we will start. Our students are on break at this moment, and we will see through this YouTube. I, I'll share you the link of uh, when you can uh, see it. see our space and you can move the camera uh, around it is a 360 degree camera okay um but i can't uh, find the link you know in, in chat in teams yes um 
Can you find it, Theoni? Oh, hi, Dick. Um, no, I can't. So I, I send this uh, link to you in the mail, okay? Mm, okay. Just popping in for a second, just to tell you good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, thank you. So, and uh, we'll see each other tomorrow in Eindhoven, I guess? Yes, we will. I am... Uh, at the moment, I'm doing all the communication, all the public, <laughs> all the advertising for you, for you too. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to leave here again. So okay. good luck. I will follow it. See you. See good luck. You. Bye. Bye. So I sent a link uh, to your email box. See it? I uh, clicked it, but it just gives me a. I am. I don't think I'm finding it. I just got another link to the conference call. Oh no! Okay, with YouTube. I think I got it now. So you, you can. Yes. See, you can see other space, yes. Yes. Okay, fantastic, Tony. Yep, I can see it. Fantastic, yep. very good. Uh, and uh, Dial? Yeah, I can also see it. Okay, very good. And uh, Sasha is here? Uh, no, Sasha will join at uh, two. So she will come later, yes? Yeah. Time to start? No, 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 no. Our, our students are still in the corridor. If you can see on, on this link, you, you will find... Yes, I, I see. Yes, so it is empty. I'll be going right now. Yes, but should I start sharing the screen already, just so it's open and I don't have to open my PowerPoint on call? to introduce you, uh, to say hello and so on, and, and, uh, okay. and, and then uh, we will start the presentation. All right. But uh, uh, Mr. Dirk Lambert, uh, he, he missed, uh, he, he uh, switched off. You don't want to be here during your presentation? Uh, I suppose not. Because at this call yesterday, he promised that he will be here and uh, that he will also describe some uh, things about your school. I, I I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry.
vlastne sa mohli vlastne zhromažďovať a pri tých podnikoch sa podnikoch Dneška, tu neviem, kde ste všetci. No, prosím vás, treba dovnútra džovnúť. Čakáme to ďalší druhý, ale zatiaľ... Dobrý. Ja už aj teraz musím odísť, ale... Belgičan nejde. Prosím? Belgičan nejde. Zdravím, dobrý. Budeme potom riešiť, teraz ešte raz nemá ďalšie. Dobre. Idete dovnútra ešte?
что не дисциплинованы, что не ты. still waiting a little while now because our students went for grade and uh, didn't return in uh, this amount as I expect. So uh, five minutes more. Celkom hamba s disciplínou, to sa mi vôbec nepáči toto. No však, áno, tak by to asi nemalo byť. Juraj, choďte nejak naháňať vonko, že aby ak sú niekde na ceste, aby pobehli alebo čokoľvek. Zastupujem celý tretí ročník, vy už toto odpočne. Tak hoďte do lava, do prava. No takto sme sa nedohodli. Kde je disciplína? No ale tak to nejde o ospravedlenie teraz. Kde sú štvrtáci? Chodte ešte zháňať niekoho, ešte konkrétne celý čtvrtý ročník, zatelefonujte niekomu alebo čo. No ale to ma vôbec neuspokuje. Je 3 čtvrte na 2. 15 minút.
괜찮았습니다. 잘했습니다. 
Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Marie Gallet. I am a Belgian concept artist, born and raised in Ghent, and I studied at HOSDAE in the 3D animation major. I am currently uh, doing my internship at Larian Studios in Belgium, and um, I am hoping to eventually go into the film industry for concept art and visual development. Great, thank you. The same uh, question for Keoni. I, uh, what uh, it is uh, interesting for me is that uh, you are from Greece and you came to Belgium for study, so I am curious also about your uh, how you decided to go uh, out from uh, Greece and, uh, and to be in, in, in Germany now. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Theoni and indeed I moved from Greece to Belgium and then got my internship in Germany. I decided to leave Greece because I didn't have a university that would um, have what I wanted to study and that's when I found DA in Belgium. It was the best option for me and that was how I decided to go there. And then um, the internship uh, where I am right now, which is Airborne Studios, was my number one company um, where I wanted to study in because I loved their style. And so I'm, um, I'm having my internship here now as a 3D artist. I'm sorry, but you're, are you, and we can't hear you very well when you talk from far away. So I hope I understood your question, correct? Yes, you did. So everything is fine. We uh, find you well. And from beginning, uh, we are interviews also uh, the second two students from Hobbes University. So please, uh, uh, Diane, tell something about you. And then Sasha, uh, she joined uh, now our meeting too. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deal de Graaf. Uh, I'm uh, from the Netherlands, uh, also uh, studying at Whole West. I actually studied uh, game graphics production and not uh, VFX or animation. Um, and um, But I've kind of have more of a passion for film and VFX. So that's why I uh, decided to join film projects um, because our group projects also has a game project segment that you could join, um, but I preferred the film projects. Uh, and now, after uh, group projects, I'm interning at Planet X, which is a studio in Amsterdam. Um, and they are working on uh, the pretty big uh, projects for the Netherlands uh, from Netflix um, and, and other uh, films and commercials and TV shows. Um, and I'm mainly a 3D artist, but also working on their virtual production team. Uh, so virtual production is where they use like a big LED screen instead of a green screen, uh, which people probably know best from The Mandalorian. Um, and it's uh, starting to really become a more preferable option for VFX, I think. Uh, and that's where I'm interning now, and hopefully I can continue in this industry. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, I want to introduce uh, Jim Sasha. Uh, so uh, tell something about you, we, we can see you some kind of shadow, so <laughs> you have not too much light on your face. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, um, well, I'm Sasha, and I'm a third year VFX student, and I'm also currently doing my internship. It's at a uh, Belgian company, VC Studios, and it's um, mainly I do a lot of uh, TV shows, but they also do a lot of commercial or personal projects. Very good, thank you. So we made a, a first uh, introduction and uh, now it's time for Mary and Theoni to share the presentation and uh, to share the, the most important probably their own project they did during their bachelor studies. Um, I will share the screen. Okay, can you see? Yes, fantastic, very good. All right, well, um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, for attending this talk. Um, so me and Theoni last semester uh, worked together with four other artists on this project called Giants of the Steppen. We had about four months 
uh, like a little bit less than four months to work on this, but we uh, really wanted to achieve something more ambitious than that time frame allowed us. So we started a bit early. So we started during the summer before the semester. And then uh, when we ran into some technical difficulties, we also continued a little bit after. Um, the project was achieved with me as a concept artist, Theoni as our character artist, but also rigor and a lot of technical stuff. And then we had four other artists to join us. So uh, this project was made for HOES Digital Arts and Entertainment. And recently we actually also won the Flanders Technology and Innovation Award, which was really nice. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we are excited to show you our project, which I will play now. So yeah, that was our project. Um, it, um, it actually originally started as just a very small portfolio project for me. Uh, it was a personal project I was working on besides school. And I was just inspired by Central Asian uh, cultures and fauna. So I really just wanted to make like a creature and some characters that fit with it. So um, it started as just this like horse-like steed uh, with her uh, with his rider and they would uh, race through like the icy landscape in winter but then um, when I finished it it left me wanting more so I um, I got encouraged by a lot of my peers and teachers to make this in 3d and make it actually my graduation film so I uh, found some people that I wanted to work together with and um, of course before production I had to do the concept art for this. I didn't want to waste time on it during production, so I did it before the semester. Um, and I reworked it a lot. So this little horse-like creature became a 13 meter tall, huge, giant, uh, walking through the Mongolian steppe, carrying this girl and her whole house on his back. Um, originally, the story had two. Uh, human characters, uh, Asel and her little brother, but uh, due to just restraints, uh, like constraints for the whole project, we didn't have enough time to include him as well, so he is there in spirit. Um, I also designed all of the objects that you see, like the environment, the house, any object that is in the final project was uh, designed by me. Um, I also made the animatic storyboard uh, also ahead of time. So um, in the story, we follow this girl going through a little morning routine. And um, 
yeah, like we we wanted to really make the reveal that she's on a huge animal really feel like a surprise. So we really had to stick quite closely to the main character until that pivotal moment where it zooms out and really like, bam, like epic uh, reveal that this is a huge animal. Uh, I think we actually really um, achieved that feeling quite nicely. Uh, in the original animatic, there was this big panning motion in the camera that would show um, the whole animal, as well as some ominous fire in the distance that they're heading, heading towards. Uh, but we changed it to a lower shot to really uh, translate his scale nicely. Yes, hello. So, of course, like um, Marie mentioned, a really important factor when you're consider you have to consider when you're working on a group project for school is that it has to be completed within three to four months. Uh, one thing that we decided to do to accommodate the scope of the project was to already start working on the character models before the project was even fully confirmed by our um, school to be made. Um, and one thing you learn about uh, when you're working on a group project is that you have to work like a cog in a, a big machine, uh, which means that before anything is finished, another person starts working on other people's props already. So, for example, when Assel's model was being modeled, I already started uh, rigging because there wouldn't be enough time if I had waited for um, a cell to be fully modeled and retopologized, textured before I could start uh, rigging her. Another part that I worked on in this project was Plov, um, the modeling for him as well as the rig, um, which was quite a, an amazing experience because when you're working on both of those things at the same time um, with one person, you can quickly switch topology and anything that you need, you already know, and you can rig already instead of uh, working with two people, which would slow down the process a lot. Um, uh, Finn, our animator, was responsible for animating Plov and creating his walk site which was the animation that was predominantly used in the short. And then after the modeling was done, um, before the animations were done, again, everyone has to work together really quickly. Uh, Arnold already began working on the fur. Um, this was his biggest task as it is because fur is not something that is in the curriculum on, of the AE, so his task was to really learn how to um, simulate fur in such a big scale. So we had a really big problem here, um, physically and mentally, because Plov is so huge. And all we had was our student gaming laptops and our dream. So as you can imagine, you have to use very dense fur in order to make such a big creature look realistic. And that was perhaps uh, one thing that we really underestimated in our group project. Um, for example, it took um, way longer than we thought it would for Arnold to simulate the fur. Um, we estimated about um, uh, like five weeks, six weeks, but it ended up taking him more than 60% of the project, um, which was something that you learn by doing a, such a big scale group project, but it turned out really amazing in my opinion so he's the fluffiest boy it's worth it. <laughs> and then of course um when it came to a big environment it was a really interesting experience all of the people working in this project um, came from di different backgrounds so we had vfx students animation students and katarina who was our environment artist was a games graphic production student which meant that she was most comfortable with unreal so we decided to go and choose unreal when it came to the big environment um which helped us both with the render time which was very, very nice and katarina also uh, created everything from scratch which really helped with the style that we were going for with this hand painted um, feeling and she never used any photo scans or like online materials in order to make everything fit together 
um like uh for the houses on the back you don't see a lot of them in the uh, short but um it is a fully uh realized model and it's a big collaborative effort uh, for three people um me theoni and katarina all work together on this so um we really wanted to give the vibe that the house is fully self-sufficient um asal barely has to leave uh, like she has everything up there so she has a pulley system in the back that I made but uh, Katarina textured uh, that really has this huge bucket pulling up water then Theoni made the yurts um, that are inspired by Mongolian real yurts they're pretty um, they're pretty much exactly matched though a bit smaller and then uh, the baskets and uh, all the modular pieces of this were made by uh, Katarina as well Um, for the final stage, uh, final stage is compositing, and our compositor Roy really had a gargantuan task, a plot-sized task, if you will, ahead of him, because we were using so many different softwares uh, to make everything, uh, especially because in the beginning we were really planning on using Unreal for everything, but with the amount of fur that Plof had, it was just not doable to do it in Unreal. So uh, Roy really had to uh, put together um, Maya Arnold renders, uh, Houdini renders, uh, renders in Unreal, and he had to match the lighting everywhere, and it was a huge, huge task. Uh, we also had a lot of trouble with rendering in the end. Um, we had a render farm that we were using with school, and it was not cooperating with Plops Fur, and though we did account for technical difficulty, we didn't account for quite this much, so we ran behind in the uh, last few weeks. Um, so uh, our hero Roy really pushed through uh, after the project still to composite everything, uh, put everything so nicely together. Um, as we said earlier, as Siri said earlier, we really wanted to have like a stylized vibe. So the project has um, some custom nuke tools that Roy made uh, that give it like cross hatching that follows the forms, a Kuwahara filter that gives it like a painterly vibe almost, and then half toning and the highlights uh, that really gives it like a nice stylized feeling. It was quite difficult as well to match everything together stylistically, especially because so many people were working together on different pieces. Um, so um, since Asel's model was the first thing that was really made, everything else kind of follows her style so everything has the same uh texturing style as uh Asel. if you want to watch the short again or share it with anyone uh, the qr code is here we would really love it if you could give it a like or something um and yeah i hope you enjoyed it and we uh would love to take some questions okay thank you So uh, our students will put you questions uh, uh, to Mari Garrett uh, will uh, put question first uh, Miss Kadlecajova. Uh, microphone please. Is she is here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I really love your project and I would like to ask uh, if you used any AI tools for the creative process and what softwares did you use for uh, modeling and animation? Um, we didn't use any AI at all. Uh, that's not really our style. Um, and back then we also, even if it was our style, we didn't have really access to it necessarily. Like we didn't really think about it. Um, everything is done by hand. I don't think there's anything automated in it. Um, we used a lot of software, but specifically Maya for animation, modeling, ZBrush as well for sculpting, uh, just Photoshop for the concepts and stuff, Houdini for Plosfer, but then XGen for uh, Acel's hair because it was too difficult to do it in Houdini. Um, I think uh, simulations for the water were also in Houdini and then uh, Unreal for the environment and Nuke for compositing everything together. So we 
Oh, and Marvelous Designer for clothes and T-shirts and stuff. So we had quite a lot of software <laughs> that we were using. Very good. Uh, thank you. The question to Theoni will put uh, Mr. Valentko. Uh, hi. Um, my question is if you uh, learned something new during the, the making of this movie or what was the hardest part or the most challenging during the making? Mm -hmm. I think I had a big learning experience in this project because I was a 3D animation student so I didn't know anything about simulations and I ended up working on the clothing and fur simulations on Asol's um, clothes so that was just out of nowhere I had to learn uh, how to simulate things it was really interesting um, and the biggest struggle was work making two simulations work together at the same time because the fur is also simulated but it's also attached to um, Asol's clothes so it was a lot of heavy um, files of simulations over simulations and a lot of trial and error. So that was my biggest learning experience for this project. Marie? Um, for me, uh, I kind of, um, because for me, uh, I really am just a concept artist. Like I can do other things, but it's not like my strong suit. And because I did all the concept art before the project even started, I spent most of the project animating and doing like some some like little like filling the gaps where people needed it and doing like small administrative tasks and I think the one place where I really could have uh, like where I wish I could have improved was specifically the planning uh, there were certain risks that we took that I kind of think that maybe we shouldn't have like uh, for example like yeah like Theoni said like the fur on the clothes was a lot of work that like maybe wasn't really in our time schedule um and yeah we uh, near the end of the project we had to rework our planning very often just like trying to still get everything done in time so i think i could have done a better planning um like i could have done a better job there um yeah i think that's like the main one that's like it was the administrative stuff that i really wasn't used to um and for the concepts i um was I, I think also I could have done more research in the art um, like art direction because we were going in a little bit blind so I could have done more research there as well so uh, but I did learn from that yes ne next question for uh, uh, Miss Mari uh, Thomas Sikora mm Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations to your short movie. And uh, I would like to ask about uh, editorial. How did you manage it? Uh, did you make a pre-visualization and then progressively uh, did 3D work or you edit some shots or you, um, how, the, how did you manage all this um, kind of shot managing and... and um. Yeah, we had like um, the pro, um, like the structure of the course kind of required us to always um, just every week we had to show a new edit to the teachers. So we just started with block out, blocked out animation. Like we all we started with every shot at the same time, um, and then uh, the animators, so uh, Finn and then me jumping in a little bit. We were we both had our own shots, uh, but Finn had more than I did. Um, and we were just like slowly working on each of them like everything was work uh, was happening at the same time so you don't really work chronologically it's not like like the only said earlier it's really like you can't afford to first make a model and then like wait for the modeler to finish it and then start rigging in it so everyone was working <laughs> yeah. at the same time um it was really just uh block like from block out to finish product uh, product everything at the same time yes i hope that like, yes yeah i hope that helped because our editor is sadly not here today uh, next question to uh, tell me uh, we'll put uh, michael sharha he's uh, from ukraine 
so it is international question. So uh, hello, and uh, first we thank you for sharing your artwork. I uh, really appreciated it, and uh, I must say the visuals are quite stunning. Um, I have a question. Um, how much in percent uh, did you have to uh, study like by yourself uh, during uh, creating uh, during the creation of this uh, project uh, and uh, how much you already knew like from school and so on like for each of you uh, it's question for Peony and then maybe yeah um, I think it depended on what each person was doing for the project so for example Finn our animator who um, already studied animation in 3D animation major was mostly doing animating so of course he had to learn and automate some of his parts uh, but for example in comparison with Arnold who was our simulation student um, they don't learn fur simulation in school but they do learn Houdini of course so he had to self-learn and be self-taught about simulating fur in Houdini. Um, for me specifically uh, I think maybe um, I would say 50% of my work was self-learned because I took a role of a major that I wasn't a part of, so simulations. Uh, but that was a unique case for me specifically. But when it came to the rigging and modeling that I did, that was fully something we learned in school. Uh, Marie? Yeah, like I said, for me, most of it was concepting. Like, that was my main task. Um, so... All of that, I like a lot of the yeah, just concepting I had learned in school. Um, I already knew how to do that part, and yeah, it means like I think I learned how to use F track, which was nice. That's like a tracking software or like tracking website that we were using, which was very useful. Um, and uh, I really learned how to like track a team, so that makes me hopeful I can be an art director someday. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, like software wise, or like I didn't uh, learn, or I did learn new things, but it wasn't really software uh, specific, I think, or uh, like technically specific. And uh, how many years are you in concepting? Um, I did DA for four years, um, like it's the end of my fourth year now, um, but. I uh, like I didn't do like a like there's no concept major specifically at the E so I did 3D animation, which has like uh, some concepting courses. But I have been drawing and doing kind of concepty stuff since like for years already. Like as a teenager as well, I went to a normal like art high school as well. So I have been drawing for quite a long time, but four years of DAE specifically. Yeah, and next question to Mary will um, put. Maybe I have a question. Yes. Uh, how did you like find each other? Uh, because uh, I believe you uh, to create something like that at uh, that quality, like you you really need to enjoy the style, the whole scenery, the characters. Uh, how did you like um, organize the team and uh, uh, find people? Um, for me, it was like, uh, I met Theony um, in my second or third year of the second year, I think, in the end of my second year, and um, we just met, like, we already we met um, just at school and became friends, and then we also had uh, some courses together, and we usually sat next to each other, and I remember finishing the concept, like, the early ones, the blue ones still, and... Uh, Theony saw them and was like, oh, I would love to make Asel in 3D. And I was like, aha, <laughs> like that, that blinked something uh, for me. So when I decided to make this my final graduation project, I was like, okay, I, I have to involve Theony in this. Um, and like that or that early concept, it was like, that's already been like a year since uh, we decided on that. It was like, I already had the plan in like February last year. Uh, so it was really early, and I very quickly involved teachers in it as well. So um, at some point, uh, I think Dick and uh, another teacher recommended an animator to us, uh, Finn, 
and we really liked his work. Uh, so he joined us. And then uh, Katarina was also just a friend of mine who I knew was capable of doing good uh, environments, stylized environments specifically. Uh, even though she's like she's very like generalist, uh, she likes characters a lot as well. Um, but I knew that she could do really nice uh, stylized environments, so I asked her. And then uh, we found very nicely, like we found the two VFX artists quite late uh, during a school project that like uh, was with random people. And we found them, and they were amazing. And we were like, Can, will, "Will you please join us as well?" And they were very happy to join. And that's how we very slowly assembled the team. So we were really looking out for candidates for a while. So, so you basically just shared your work with uh, your friends and they liked it and uh, that's how it started. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your answers. Yes, thank you. Next question, we'll put uh, Miss uh, Svitkova. She's excellent character design in our game design department. So first of all, hello, and I really like love your style. And I have two questions. The first is like, how much time did it took to to do all the concepts? And the second part is, is there uh, some like fun fact or background story to like how you make or made up the story for the giant for this project? Um. Yes, actually. So first question, how long it took to concept specifically is a bit hard to pin, like pinpoint, because the blue version, the original version, I made in like October, November of 2022. So it's already been a while. Um, so I think that took me like a month or something or two months because I was making it next to school and I had a lot of work then as well. Um, but then uh, what happened was uh, so we decided, uh, like Theomini and I decided we were going to make this our graduation project and it was going to be the ice, like the snow version uh, in blue. And um, we, um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, so then uh, one of our teachers said, hey, we uh, managed to find a spot at uh, Playgrounds um, Eindhoven. Would you guys like to rework the project and present it there? So we had like one month to completely rework it and like present it there. And then I decided like, okay, the blue isn't working. Everyone reads it as, um, I'm sorry. Uh, is that sorry? Sorry. Um, uh, so we decided to rework it into something else, uh, make it red instead of blue because the blue wasn't reading right. And then I was reworking it for like two months. So that's like, I worked on it for like on and off for a long time, um, but eventually it was uh, okay. It uh, like we got it approved, but um, it was funny because we were showing uh, the progression of the concepts to our teacher, our character design teacher, and he kept saying like, "Oh, wouldn't it be cooler if he was like bigger? <laughs> like what, he he looks too small now. Can we make him a bit bigger?" And then I made him a bit bigger, and then he was just a, like kind of the size of an elephant, and then like, "Oh, but." what if he's like carrying like some of their stuff on his back so that we made him even bigger and then they said like oh what what if she's like sitting on his neck instead of his back actually and then we made it even bigger and eventually he's like 13 meters tall and it's like what did we do <laughs> so he became so huge uh like week by week he became a bit bigger and that's kind of like a funny story i think yes thank you uh, and last question uh, adam Zbolenski for uh, Theoni. Uh, well, hello. Uh, first of all, congratulations on making something like this. Uh, from all the questions uh, and from all of your like uh, speaking, uh, it seems that it was a, a big challenge for you. But my question is that uh, to what degree or how did you do maybe the texturing? To, to what degree is it procedural? To what degree is it hand painted or yeah just like in, in general the, the texturing process how, how it went uh mm -hmm. Theoni this one's for you sure yeah so um uh, Katharina Alexander was basically responsible for creating this visual aspect of the project 
Um, it all began when she very beautifully hand painted a cell's textures. And we said, okay, this is what we need to go for. Um, I think maybe 60% it's hand painted. And then when you see the big environment with all the planks and maybe um, the uh, basket material, that is a bit more tileable texture wise. Uh, but most of it is hand painted and most of it, yes, is hand painted by Katerina who did an amazing job and basically defined the style that we needed to go for, for this project. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, here is uh, free time for free questions. I don't know if the students from Lusophona uh, they want to uh, ask something. At, at least I would like to ask something. It's possible? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, stop mm. sharing, please, Mary. Uh, yes, we, we can see uh, you with her, yes. So. Yeah, thank you. So f first of all, uh, congrats for this amazing uh, project. It looks really, really awesome. Um, congrats to all of the team, teachers, school, and you precisely, the artist. Uh, just a simple, very simple question, not to let this too much. Um, this, at the end, what are the next steps? So this is going to be... Um, a completely short movie or a promo to, to try to get, uh, get some funding investors, what will be the, the next steps? I didn't understand that part. Um, for now, like it was really just a three month or a four month um, student project. Uh, it's our graduation final and like this teaser is as much as we could make in that time. We don't have any real plans for the future. I think we would all love to be part of like a, like a longer project for this, but right now we are all making our first tentative steps in our respective industries. So we're putting it off a bit. Like if we want to in the future continue with this, we would love to, I think. But right now we're still uh, like, we're, um, we, we don't have like any tangible pro uh, projects in mind for now. It, it was perfect because you did an amazing portfolio. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I give the word to uh, our guest, special guest on our conference. Uh, so Peter van Hoype uh, is uh, from Belgium, so uh, he is friend of your school, so oh. the question of some note. And then Greg Lambrecht. Uh, Hello. Um, Congratulations. That's that's a that's a wonderful piece of, of work. Um, with with an enormous amount of different skills, softwares, um, that's, that's that's not straightforward. Um, so you know, congrats again to you know to be able to put it all put it all together. Um, Thank you everyone here as well for some excellent questions, which means that I don't have that many left. Um, but um, so when the when when this short was introduced uh, by Dick as well, um, what's always been mentioned is, well, this is supposed to be a three, four month project, but people started early, finished late. You probably did some insane hours. Um, there was clearly uh, huge amount of, of thought and effort put in to the development, uh, which shows uh, it's, it's, um, it's visually, it's, it's very nicely finished, um, especially the change in color palette, I, I, I would agree. The warmth that that film has now uh, would not have, it would not have been as successful uh, with, with, um, with a palette that's, that's mainly blue. Um, so choices like that, but they need to grow. Have you have you ever sat down and thought about what the actual duration of the project would be in a studio environment? Let's say from start to finish, with let's say forty to fifty hour work weeks and no weekends. How long would it have taken to finish this project? Um. I have no clue. I mean, we were working on it 
full time, mm-hmm. like uh, morning till evening for three months straight. Mm-hmm. And then we worked on it for uh, like just a little bit on the side during the summer. Um, so it, like that was maybe two extra weeks in total, like two extra full time weeks. And then afterwards, Roy was working on it besides his exam, like besides his thesis paper for another month. So I would say, like, he, he usually says he would have needed, like, one more or one and a half more full-time weeks. So yeah. I think four months and a little bit, I think, would be, like, the, yeah, the necessary, or maybe five months, uh, the necessary time. But that's my estimation. Uh, Dick? Yes, in my humble opinion, uh, at the end, uh, after those 12 weeks, we had the grande finale. Uh, so that means that everybody got a plus one, and we also invited the industry, and everybody was dressed up. And when the industry was there, they were like blown away in what amount of time this project has been made. I mean, they do not, they would never accept a project like this to work on in a company because they were so scared, because there was hair, there was water. There was textures. There was hair on the. There was fur on the clothes. There was hair on the on a cell on everything. And I talked to uh, Tom from Walking the Dog, and he was really blown away with it because he said, "In that small time of four, three, four months, that is amazing. We, if we would do this in a in a project, it, it would take to to real to to really produce something like that. It would take like six months." Mm-hmm. And then go to cartoon to present it to cartoon to find a distributor for uh, co-production. And now what I also would like to add to this uh, to this moment is, at the moment I am still looking around to really go to studios and ask them, is there something we can do with this? And everybody is very enthusiastic about it. But but on the other hand, they also say. The concept is there, but we need script writers because this can be really a show, an episode, a series. And uh, that's where I keep on working on because I remember when we stopped this, the six of you were like, wow, this is like the best time we've ever had. And you started crying. <laughs> and for me, it was like, oh, I would like to keep this. I would like to have this produced in one way or another. So I'm still looking around uh, to see what will happen. With this one, fantastic. Yes, it's um, yeah. Hands my hands. Hands my question. Can I? Can I? Can I ask one more? Or are, are we out of time? Yes, yes. Or I can. I can wait until half set when we chat. No, 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 no. no? Um, so, so, um, yeah. That's also why I asked. Uh, why I asked the question. So, so you've done this within within the environment of 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 a school where you've obviously had a lot of a lot of freedom and. Um, uh, some very specific support that is probably hard to get outside of the school um, or an education system. So could you um, could you tell something about what type of support you found most important making this film in the environment of Ho West? And uh, now that you're um, out and about and you're doing your first tentative steps into into the the, the industry. Um, do you find that that's already different? Um, sorry, Eugene. Is that, um, I think right now, uh, during our uh, during our project, we got a lot of support from teachers in the shape of feedback. Like yes. every every week, we um, had feedback, like personalized feedback from the teachers. They really had a lot of personal involvement. Um, we got a lot of support uh, that way. Um, and I think that's like really nice that uh, something re- you really just get in school is like you have like six teachers really really paying attention to a very small group of people, which isn't as common in bigger studios and bigger companies. I think because there you're more left to your own devices. Um, that had like everything has its uh, pros and cons, of course. Uh, but uh, it was really nice to have like always six extra sets of eyes. And then sometimes mm-hmm. even more to like check if you're doing well, if you're doing everything the most optimized way you could be. Uh, it's also just nice to have like professional opinion on how to um, improve your workflow, on how to do things faster. Uh, so yeah, that's really it's 
we felt very um, guided along the path, so that was really nice. Does that? Sorry. Okay. Sorry, someone's knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. Fantastic answer, thank you. Okay, so we will finish this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so. And now uh, we shall present a stay uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the connection. Uh, you will see the presentation of your school, Stilpa. So next thing will be uh, Dial the Graph on the Dean Sasha. So please uh, try to share your presentation and tell about your project. Uh, Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see. I hope you will right. also hear it. All right. Uh, yeah, Dayal and me would like to talk about our project Amber. And, well, what we were actually asked by a client to make something that has to do with how would robotic animals help nature in the future. So we got around and we thought, okay, what do we want to do? So we thought, why not make a product lodge clip that's about how robotic bees would help preserve nature in the future. And it's actually also going to be shown at a festival for future technology here in Belgium. That is our client. Uh, yeah, and we're just going to show you our video. Introducing the Amber Inspire B3 Pro. With new features and optimized efficiency. Equipped with multifunctional sensors and autonomous mapping. The Wings holographic design allows a dynamic adjustment in flight. The retractable nozzle ensures precise pollination. The Inspire B3 Pro replicates the flight pattern of its biological counterpart. to talk a little bit about kind of our uh, design process for the video that you just saw. Uh, like Sasha mentioned, um, we had a client approach OS, the school, and basically the assignment that we got was to make um, a one minute video, um, basically about a robotic animal that would help nature in the future. Uh, so we were one of the few groups that really had to start from scratch. Um, I think that was a big challenge for us because we had to spend the first few weeks, I think, at the beginning of October, uh, really doing a lot of brainstorming, a lot of concepting, uh, and we ended up choosing a B because I think a main goal for us was to keep it very simple and readable, um, and we really wanted to deliver um, 
kind of like a finished product. I think that was very important for us, something that we use for our portfolio, something that we were really proud of. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think a B for us was pretty readable because a lot of people know that, you know, nature is being kind of uh, affected. And um, so that was a strong message for us. Um, at the start, we also had different ideas. We were thinking of like a stylized short story uh, with a bit more like a heart and um, a narrative behind it, but we didn't really feel the connection to it. And I think um, then we decided to kind of go in the direction of more of a product design video, a product launch video. Um, we were heavily inspired by companies like Tesla and Apple that have these really sleek, kind of like expensive products. And here you can see some uh, mood boards that we created for um, our story. Uh, we were thinking of kind of like way far into the future with uh, a company that would design these robotic animals very sleek, very minimalistic. Um, also, we had to include some hexagon patterns, of course. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, you'll see some inspiration for the bee that we came up with. So we really liked the idea of transformers. Uh, we really wanted the bee to have some moving parts, uh, but still have this sleek design. So a lot of the moving parts were hidden inside. Uh, so we had some inspiration from motorcycles, hovercrafts, drones, and like I said, kind of like Apple products, Tesla cars. We were really thinking of car commercials. Uh, we also found one um, vacuum cleaner commercial that we used a lot for inspiration. Um, and then um, once we started thinking more about the story, what we want to tell with uh, our video, um, uh, our team member, Thor, he created a beehive um, where the um, bees would be stored in and they, it would kind of be used as like a power-ups uh, station for the bees. Um, so the idea was to kind of sell this beehive as a product with the bees uh, that could then be released into nature and help pollinate flowers. Um, and his idea was really to have kind of this modern artwork um, kind of sculpture and um, that would be the beehive and here you can see some inspiration for it we really wanted to kind of uh, keep the same design throughout the bee and the beehive and as the company as well the environments so very sleek very black and white with some yellow or gold accents um, and then in the next slides we have some concepts some early concepts um, and here you can see um, uh, we were thinking of having like a, a lab environment that would show the beehive. It's kind of ominous, a little bit eerie, uh, where they're testing out this beehive. Um, and then because like Marie also said in the previous presentation, we had to deliver storyboards and edits every week. Uh, so we really had to think about the shots from uh, 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 our uh, video. Uh, so this was kind of, I think, one of the earlier shots that we thought of with the lab. And then we really liked the idea of kind of flying into the beehive and showing the inside of the beehive. So we also have to think about the interior, um, how we want to present that this beehive has multiple bees inside of it, um, while still keeping it kind of like a sleek structure, very science fiction-y, um, but still realistic. Um, and then once we get into the beehive, you will see the bee appear. Uh, and we really like the idea of these like car commercial turntables kind of showing all of the different parts of the bees. Uh, here you can see some earlier versions of the bee and at the bottom more finalized versions of the bee. Um, we really wanted to kind of add a, a lot of different features to the bee so that it has like sensors and cameras that it maybe can be remotely controlled like a drone. Um, it also needed a pollinator at the back so that it can pollinate flowers. Um, and I think this design process was quite challenging because, like I said, we wanted to keep the design minimalistic, but we also had to think about the moving parts. So what parts could move, could open up um, so that it would feel very dynamic and alive still. Um, and, like, and we ended up going for gold accents to kind of emphasize on the fact that it would probably be very expensive product uh, so it's very high-end and um, yeah 
it would maybe be kind of placed somewhere in a city so that the bees could be released into nature. And that you can also see in the next slide for the beehive, uh, we kind of kept the, the same motifs, the white and black with some gold accents. Um, these were created by Thor as well. Uh, and every week we got a lot of feedback uh, on the designs. And I think the main takeaway is that our teachers also really wanted us to be happy with the designs. So sometimes we took their advice and sometimes not as much. Um, but uh, I think for this beehive, we got a lot of kind of ideas to kind of incorporate realistic beehives into these kind of more um, uh, hard surface sculpture ideas that we had. Um, and then once we really like the idea, once you see um, uh, the, the bee, the, uh, the bee would uh, leave the beehive and it would be kind of released into the world uh, so that it can do its job. And we wanted the video to really end on a positive note. Um, so that's why the video also becomes more colorful towards the end. Um, and we really wanted to sh make sure that you know what the purpose is of the bee. That's why it's flying towards this kind of testing terrarium where you see it pollinating the flower. Um, we also did a lot of iterations, mostly in Unreal, uh, for that uh, specific room to make sure that the room was readable um, and that it was colorful and that it matched our previous kind of lab environment as well. Um, yeah, and then the, the bee is released into nature and um, we would like to show the video once more with a little bit more of a background on our um, thinking process. Introducing the Amber Inspire B3 Pro. With new features and optimized efficiency. Equipped with multifunctional sensors and autonomous mapping. The Wings holographic design allows for dynamic adjustment in flight. The retractable nozzle ensures precise pollination. The Inspire B3 Pro replicates the flight pattern of its biological counterparts. Join us in creating a lasting tomorrow. One pollinated plant at a time. Inspire B3 Pro. Amber Sustainable Engineering. Yes, all right. Now that you kind of know what we made, um, I want to talk about what team member did what exactly to so kind of get an idea what all went into it and how we kind of divided all the tasks. Um, me, the VFX student, uh, mostly as a team lead, was in charge of the planning and the deadlines. I also created the Beehive interior, as you can see here. I um, modeled it in Maya. I made some shaders in Unreal. I then also made all the camera movements and all basically the layouts for the shots and made simulations in Houdini. I made a kind of like a pollination effect of a bee pollinating a flower and having like a big swarm going through the top of a window out of the ceiling. And of course, uh, did the final compositing, all the final color grading, adding some extra effects on it. Next up is artist. 
he is a 3D animation student, and a big part of what he did were the storyboard and animatic in the very beginning of our project. And also he created a lot of graphic designs, uh, for example, the storyboard, but also posters and all the uh, things you could see on the screens in the first shot, he created all of those. And he also modeled an environment. He was mostly busy with the first environment, the computer one. And uh, as an animation student, he was, of course, in charge of all the rigging and all the animating. And he also took uh, the task of making the edits and eventually also the breakdown video. Yeah, I think I'm back. Sorry, my team's crashed. Um, so uh, our next team member, Thor, like I said, he mostly worked on the beehive at the start of our project, kind of at the same time as I was working on the bee. Uh, and once that was finished, he continued working on the rest of the assets um, that you see in the lab room. And then also in the, uh, we called it the flower room with uh, the big terrarium. Um, and uh, yeah, he also did a lot of the concepting at the start. I think we all really worked on the concepts at the start of um, our project, B did a lot of brainstorming. And then at the end, we kind of all did a lot of the graphic designs as well. Um, so a lot of TV work. Um, he also, um, yeah, a big reason for us choosing Unreal is that we, uh, Thor and I were both graf uh, game graphics students. Um, so he worked on the environment, the lighting, the design, and the composition. Um, and then finally, that's me. Uh, it's my turn. Uh, like I said, game graphics student. Um, uh, I have a more experience with characters, so I uh, worked a lot on the bee, uh, did the designs for the bee, um, and the texturing, the sculpting, modeling, asset creation, and as you can see here, I also worked on a lot of the concepts, uh, some of the stylized concepts at the start of our project, and then uh, working on this uh, sci-fi product design. Uh, yeah, here you can see some of the uh, uh, texturing and materials that I worked on. I think the B was kind of the only thing that really uh, we made in Substance Painter. Uh, a lot of the other textures are just shaders in Unreal, I believe. Uh, and here you can also see the wings, the way they are created were done by uh, Sasha and Houdini. And then I made textures of that in Unreal. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, environment concepts that I did. And I also made the flower that is eventually pollinated by the bee. And then finally, uh, I, I also helped with the graphic design. I think this was the one thing that I really didn't know that much about was After Effects. Um, I helped artists with the uh, logo animations for our company that we created. Um, and then I also created the poster that we kind of used in the uh, end uh, to showcase our final presentation. We are also very lucky to be able to have a student from our school that made our sound effects and we were also in contact with uh, students from another school that made original music for our video and that really sold it as well. Um, yeah, we just want to put a thank you out there for them. Um, but the thing I really want to talk about as well is our team dynamics because I think the way we worked as a team definitely was part of why our project went so well and why we got it where we wanted it to be. And some things I think about when I look back at our, our teamwork are, for example, the first thing is um, as a team lead, I kind of looked over the deadlines and I would start every day with asking everybody, oh, okay, what are you planning on doing today? And I would remind them, okay, make sure it's finished by then. I would make sure everyone was on track of when the deadlines were. And another part that I think is very important when you yourself are doing a group project 
is that we were not afraid to ask each other feedback. It was like if Dayal was sitting, was sitting next to me, I would just ask what he was doing or I would ask if he could look at what I was doing or if a person in the group got stuck, we would just put it on the big screen and we would all take a look at it together. So that one person that got like creatively stuck doesn't stay there. You as a group take a pause of what you're doing yourself you take a look at it together and come to a solution so the project keeps going forward you can keep making progress and you don't stay behind that much um then yeah something that fits with that is that we would regularly check in with each other just during the day ask uh, oh is it working what you were doing or are you having any problems really keeping that communication in there was very important for us and also, yeah, really made it so we all knew what everybody else was doing. Um, then another thing I think about as a team lead, I didn't really feel as a team lead, the way that I mean that the only time I felt as a team lead was when we were having a discussion and we couldn't really agree on anything, then one person needs to step up and say, okay guys, we've been talking about this for an hour, we're probably gonna keep talking about it, so you know, you have to draw a line and say, okay, we're gonna take a vote, we're gonna choose either this or this, because then we can continue forward. I think that is the biggest thing that if you work in a group, one person has to kind of keep track of that big picture of not getting sidetracked um, or doing endless discussions that get nowhere. Um, and then the final thing that fits with that also is that it's very important that you listen to each other's ideas. And with that I mean is that, especially when you're making the concept and coming up with the idea for a project, you kind of, you will never like everything from the project because um, everybody has different opinions about everything. So always keep in mind that when a team member says, oh, I want this in the project, think, oh, why would you want it in the project? And ask, why do you think it is the best for the project? So in the end, not everything that you, how do I say this? Not everything that is in the project, you'll like it personally, but if it's the best for the project, then I mean, just go with it. Some decisions just, yeah, you won't like it personally, but the thing I always kept in mind is, is it good for the project? Does it make the project better? Okay, then we go with it. I think that was a very important part, yeah. I think all these little elements that I talked about um, made it able for our team to run so smoothly and to have that good communication with each other. So I hope if you're ever working in a group yourself and you having some problems or you can't work something out, you can think back on these things and kind of remember, okay, maybe this will make it work. Yeah. I think um, something to maybe add to that as well is I think we kind of stepped into this project really being very open to the creative process. No, not, not one of us was really determined to have our way. Uh, I think that's probably something you also have to learn once you enter in a studio. You don't really have a say in every aspect of what you're making. And I think we were very open to just each other's ideas and we were really determined to make something great. And if you kind of have to sacrifice some of your own creative kind of aspects, then that was completely fine for us. So I think that's also helped us a lot. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about Unreal. Um, I think the reason why we chose Unreal is because, like I said, me and Thor, the other student, um, we are, have a game uh, production background, so we were more accustomed to Unreal than rendering in Maya. We also had a lot of experience modeling in Maya, but not so much uh, rendering. And once we kind of determined that we had this concept with the B and the uh, the environments that we came up with, we realized that they were very similar to um, an environments course that we had previously, where we created environments in Unreal, both interior and exterior scenes. Um, so we kind of just proposed like, hey, maybe we can make this in Unreal. I think we could really uh, streamline our process. Um, and um, 
I think that it did. I think Unreal really benefited this project, uh, and we learned a lot from it, both good and bad. Um, in the next slide, you can see that we kind of, uh, I think our biggest challenge was uh, rendering. It's something that none of us really knew a lot about in Unreal. Um, I think we as a team, and maybe the teachers as well, kind of underestimated that uh, rendering in Unreal still takes a lot of time. Um, so I think once we were kind of closing into the end of the project, we had to start rendering, we realized, oh, it actually still takes quite a while. And like you can see here in the first scene, um, because that environment was so reflective, it kind of caused a lot of issues for the render. And you can see quite a lot of um, flickering in the uh, render. And uh, so to kind of fix that, we still had to up the samples quite a bit, which added a lot to the render times. Uh, and I think, in all honesty, that was something that required a lot of research. We also needed to know how to export our scenes out of Unreal so that they could be composited in uh, DaVinci. Um, and that was our biggest challenge, I think. Um, a lot we kind of also saw a lot of pros, I think, a lot of advantages from uh, using Unreal. Um, I think something that we really noticed during the weeks uh, once we started working on Unreal is that we felt like we were kind of ahead on a lot of the other groups um, because we could immediately see what our scenes were looking like. We could apply materials. There's a lot of um, easy integration into Unreal with assets. And we got a lot of feedback early on that I think a lot of the other groups kind of had way later into the process, uh, which made it a very iterative process because um, we were kind of streamlining and finessing our scenes very early on, which you can't really do when you're rendering in Maya at the end, because then you'll notice a lot of issues and uh, it's kind of too late. So I think that really helped with this project. And um, also flexibility wise, like I said, asset integration in Unreal is really easy. We used a lot of shaders uh, for the flowers and plants. In the flower room, we used mega scans. Um, so I think, I don't know, there were a lot of things that um, really helped our workflow and the flexibility of our project. And I think in the end, we were one of the few groups that weren't really worried that we would finish the project, uh, which was pretty rare, I think. Um, so yeah, I think those are kind of the pros and cons of um, using Unreal. And um, I don't think any of us really regret using it. Um, so that's really all I have to say. Uh, thank you so much for letting us speak in this conference. Uh, we really appreciate the time and uh, the opportunity. Uh, and if there are any questions, please let us know. Nice, thank you. So uh, we have once more prepared questions for you. So for uh, Sasha, uh, we'll put the first question, Mr. Baralai. Microphone here, hang up. Hang up. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the project. Uh, I really like the style that it has. And anyways, I was wondering, uh, uh, how do I say it? Uh, how was your, uh, how did, uh, how any of you uh, were satisfied uh, by, by the end result and what could, could have been improved, like overall, not just like in the project, but like in the workflow, etc. And uh, also, what uh, had the uh, client had to say? Um, well, our client loved it. <laughs> she was over the top uh, with it. She also kind of, she kind of let us go free. I remember the first time we met her, we asked her, you know, do you think our idea is a, is good? And she was like, oh, I love it. Do anything. I love everything you guys do. Do your vision. So um, we didn't really have any difficulty with the client not liking it. Um, and looking back, I think, yeah, we all were kind of bummed out that the first scene um, had so much noise in it, like the flickering. So if we now look back the next time, I would do it 
where we kind of spend more time figuring out how to render in Unreal and how to really optimize the quality of the video. Um, but that's really the only thing I can think about that we would do differently. It went, it went so well. Yeah, I don't know if Dial thinks of anything. Um, I'm thinking maybe importing simulations in Unreal as well was pretty challenging from Houdini. I think that we kind of lost quality on the simulations, but that I think is another kind of research thing that required more time than we expected. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Next question, uh, Miss Bernatova. Oh. <laughs> She's a student of game design. So the question is uh, to uh, Sash. To, to, the, uh, to Dale, yes. Uh, hello, so first of all, I love your project. I think it looks great. And uh, I would actually like to ask both of you, what posed to be the biggest challenge to you? And did something take longer than you anticipated? Were you ever in like a time crunch? Did you have to cut something? Or did, you, did everything go according to schedule? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think, well, a big uh, reason that we were so successful with this project, I think, was Sasha's planning. I think we were really able to stick to it pretty well, honestly. Uh, she also kind of planned in that a lot of stuff would take longer than expected. Um, and I think we were all kind of willing to also maybe work a little bit on the weekends. And there was a holiday in between that we also were willing to just continue working on. Um, in terms of challenges, I'm not sure. Um, I mostly worked on the B, which took a very long time. Um, I think for myself, I kind of wanted it to be finished faster, but it's also the main part of the video. So everyone kind of constantly said like, just make it perfect, make it as, as polished as possible. Um, I think maybe the integration with animating the B was quite difficult. Because uh, we had to be able to kind of import the animations into Unreal as well, which was challenging. Um, but I don't think there was a whole lot of crunch where we kind of had to remove stuff that we really wanted to add in there. I think we were kind of ab able to add in a lot of stuff that we liked and that we were working on. Yeah, for me it was, um, as a team lead, I made like the project planning. And I really kept in mind to keep in as much as wiggle room as possible. So even when something took longer, I mean, it was no problem because we had time, we had time for it. Um, I remember I struggled the most with um, creating the beehive interior because I'm like really more of a compositor. I don't <coughs> model a lot. So it was, um, yeah, I need to like, search up, oh yeah, how do I do this again, and figure out what the best way was to do it. Um, but at the end, I really learned from it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, next question, Mr. Faita. Uh, I really like the whole concept of the bee, and I would like to ask, uh, how did you tackle the sharing of the files between all of you? You know, in a school or a student environment. Uh, I think we um, and we didn't end up using something like F Track. Uh, I think we shared everything over Google Drive. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but I think it really worked for us because every person kind of had their own little tasks and and projects that they could work on, even if someone else was working on something that you were working on. I think we always find a way to make sure that everyone has something to do. Um, I think, um, how did we do it in Unreal again? I think we made, for every shot, we made a different level. So uh, even if someone was working in one scene, we could still work in another. So there was never really an issue with um, not being able to get your files and not be able to work on something, I think. No, it was very important for me to that we all worked on a Google Drive because if a person gets sick and you need to access something, 
you know, you can access it because it's all shared with everyone. Because if one person has it at their computer at home and the person is not there, well, then we're all stuck because we can't, can't get the files. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, next, that was like, yeah. next question, Mr. Sbin. Sorry? Uh, next question. Okay, so I really like your project. And you mentioned that you used Houdini, Unreal Engine, and DaVinci. And I would like to ask if there were any other softwares or programs that you used, or any other like unexpected challenges or technical difficulties you faced during the production. Uh, I think the softwares that we used, I did a little bit of sculpting in ZBrush. Uh, most of the modeling is, it was hard surface, so we did it in Maya. And uh, then the simulations and the interior rings of the beehive were made in Houdini or animated in Houdini. Um, uh, let me see. Do we, uh, I think the, the, the rigging and animating was also done in Maya. Um, and then After Effects for all of the kind of like logos and, and um, logo animations of the company. I think in terms of, yeah, the only issue that we had was that uh, we weren't very optimal in the way we used Unreal because half of our group also was not experienced in Unreal. So I think towards the end of the project, we really like Unreal was struggling or while well, our laptops were struggling with Unreal, I think. Um, Luckily, one of us had a pretty new MacBook, <laughs> so he was able to kind of always open and reel on all of the shots. Uh, he also mostly worked on the editing and the, the, the scenes and the uh, sequencer within Unreal. So I think that was the biggest limiting factor was the hardware for us. Yeah, because in the end, you know, in the beginning it was all fine because we had blockouts, we had minimal textures, but by the end, when everything was in the scene, I mean, especially the last scene, it had a whole room, it had all the textures, but we imported plants um, from Megascans and the plants were moving as well. Um, and then I had to import my simulation in there and a real just was like, ah, oh, this is too much for us. So I kind of had to tone down the simulation from Houdini to be able to import it and make, uh, make it so the file would run as well. Um, so there are definitely limitations on what you can uh, import, uh, but it's just when you have so much in a scene. Yeah. Time for a question for Mr. Uh, Kulchar. I, do. I have some technical questions too. You said you're using DaVinci for compositing, did I heard correctly? What did what can you repeat your question? Uh, did you use DaVinci for compositing? Did I heard it correctly? Yes, uh, DaVinci Resolve, and then we uh, we used Fusion. Oh, Fusion inside it. Okay. Yeah, Fusion and inside. My question was also uh, you used Unreal Engine, and I wonder, did you use some real time rendering, or did you use path tracing in the Unreal Engine, and also in compositing what? Was there any problems with the multipass or some other passes from the render from other engine? Unreal Engine? Yeah, for, I remember for the intermediate feedbacks, like every week we got feedback from the teachers. For that, we just used the real time because it was very, very fast. But for the final video, we rendered with ray tracing. Um, and I could just, I looked it up, I could just choose different AOVs, I could have my alpha, I could have my specular. Um, so I was able to as access all of those passes in, the, in Fusion. Um, so yeah, there weren't really any problems with that. Yeah. Okay, so it was like offline render in the Unreal Engine. And yeah, basically. when you were working on real time and then you just turned to the path tracing, was there a need to relight or change some materials or lighting? The, the lightning, the lighting definitely need to do the, I think less bright, where, yeah, we need to adjust it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I think Thor did a lot of readjusting of the lighting once we decided to go with path tracing. Yes. 
so you light the scene and then you relight it when you want it to render thing off, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, a free question for uh, Mr. Sharha. <laughs> Hello, thank you for sharing your work. Um, I have a question. Is it uh, uh, important for each of you to somehow influence the, like, the main concept of uh, the B and uh, so on? Or j are you just like uh, happy, to, um, happy to deal with uh, your part of uh, the project? Like somebody who who creates the concept, uh, doesn't do the textures, and vice versa? Um, no, I remember we all, I mean, everybody had their tasks, so they all did the concept and somebody else did the environment. But when we created the concept for that, we always threw it on the big screen in the group and asked if everybody was okay with how it looks. Um, and then if you <laughs> got a problem with it, I mean, we just help each other out, for example, I remember artists sometimes got some problems with modeling his environment, so we would all take a look and someone else would maybe take over it for uh, an hour or so and work on it, because it was important that, that not one person keeps staring at it for like two hours. If another person takes a fresh look at it, it was uh, very easy to see what could be adjusted. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, from the start we were pretty like I was pretty important for me to to kind of determine who did what, um, so I I did have more of a character background, so I proposed to make the B because I really wanted to, but if someone really wanted to make the textures, then I would have been fine with that. Um, and I think kind of throughout the weeks we kind of kept asking each other like, hey, are you okay with doing this environment, or do you rather work on something else? Um, and that was completely fine, I think. Um, but we kind of stuck to our planning on what everyone wanted to do. But sometimes someone was struggling with the concept. And then we would just put it, like Sasha said, on the big screen and kind of think about, like, oh, what do we like? What do we not like? Um, kind of let's get as far as possible. And then I think we usually had supervisor meetings on Wednesday or Thursday, I think Thursday. Um, so then we kind of try to make sure that we had a few options and then we could just ask the teachers for advice, like if there was something that was really off or not. Uh, and then we could continue the next week as well. Yeah, um, I also remember I made like a project, I made like a, a planning with like all the tasks and I put someone's name on a task. And when a person was finished with it and he didn't really have anything immediate that like, for example, if Dayal finished his textures, he's done with is what he was supposed to do and I would just look oh okay what needs to be done next and what is kind of left open is not what is nobody doing yet and I would just assign that person to the task so we would really step in in all the tasks that were still open and not wait for just one person that said oh I will do the textures to solely do the textures. Okay so uh, now it's time for Mr. Peter van Hoyte some comment. Uh. <laughs> I'll, get I'll get it right. One, one, one. Um, thank you as well for um, for um, for a marvelous uh, presentation. Um, I would like to respond a little bit to um, um, a remark that um, Dial uh, made uh, when he said, you know, at a certain point we were just really focusing on on the design and not so um not so we weren't busy so much with uh, with the narrative um but i found that your film um uh, and and your um your presentation as well has got quite a few potential narratives in it so it's, it's very slick uh it's very uh, your presentation is very slick as well um, and you talk a lot about uh, teamwork and planning, um, which, which actually makes your film, your film subject being the bees and the hive, you know, sort of almost the perfect metaphor of, of how you've done, how you've done the project. Um, and aside from that, um, when I, when I was watching the film, 
and I saw how slick it was. And first, it, it's, it's, it's like a, a very nice uh, product presentation. It's actually, to me, it's, it's also a very scary dystopian film. Um, because, and especially with the tagline at the end saying sustainable engineering, if this would ever be a viable product, that means that we as humanity, we have completely failed um, being sustainable. So I was wondering, is that, was that intentional? And, and if not, uh, did you have personally a narrative underlying this project um, while you were making it? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, um, yeah, I think with like, you know, the narrative part that I mentioned, I think I was mostly thinking of, um, we initially had this idea of a more like stylized, cute story, like more of a short film. And we didn't really connect with the story. So we wanted to kind of choose this one because it was a bit more abstract and we could kind of fill it in the way that we wanted. Uh, but we definitely heavily thought of like, Okay, what what do we want to tell? What is the message of this uh, commercial or product launch video? Um, and I think we kind of like this idea of maybe it being a little bit grim, a little bit eerie in the future. Um, but the message that was also kind of important from the client is that it was a positive message. So that's why um, you know the, the the whole purpose of the video is is to kind of show that. Um, that the product is helping the environment. Um, we also initially wanted to add some shots where you do see like actual bees that, that are real, so not robotic. So that the whole point was to kind of have the animal help nature and not replace nature. Um, so I think that was kind of our thought process. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes. Uh, now Thank you. Uh, somebody from uh, uh, University Lusophona, maybe some student, or maybe Philip. No? Uh, okay, so please, Dirk, uh, uh, Dirk uh, tell the last word about the project. M microphone? Yes, yes, yes. I so the last words of the project. Uh, well, um, with this one, of course, and uh, also Marie said it, Marie, Marie said it before with the giant of the step like was it was too much all at the same time. It's not easy to really follow up a project like this. But as also mentioned during this meeting, if I talk now about Amber sustainable engineering, <laughs> uh, we had a very well oiled machine and a very good planner. Uh, Sasha did a great job. I mean, it was so inspiring every single week, but it was practically from all the group projects, I must say, from all eight of them, but it was always so inspiring when they went to the barn, that means our, um, our uh, projection room, uh, when we would sit together with the six uh, supervisors, that every week when we saw their presentation, that we were looking at each other, we were silent, we were overwhelmed, like, how the hell did they manage this in this week? If we compare it with what we've seen last week, with what was already also a lot in the given time that they were already working on it, then we saw something new again, and we're like, okay, this is going in the right direction. And as um, and also a well-oiled machine, I remember this because I passed by plenty, plenty times uh, during the day or or um, in those weeks. And what they said, we put it on the big screen and we saw them communicating to each other and they really did give each other a really nice peer feedback. And that's really what helps this project as well. Paula? Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now it's time to uh, have as guests uh, students from Lusophona, from our Portuguese uh, uh, conditions, uh, and uh, it will be presentations about uh, game, mostly game design, but probably there will be also multi-professional. Uh, uh, we'll try to introduce each other, so please, uh, uh, can you stop share, please, uh, uh, Sasha, or... <coughs> Stop share the window. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to stop. <laughs> or or, or I, I try to take my sharing. Oh, oh, OK. 
Fantastic. So please turn on the camera, students from uh, uh, Sofona. Oh, you see several students on one camera, I see. <laughs> Hello. He Hello, okay, we can uh, hear each other. So please uh, uh, try to uh, um, introduce your project and uh, one after another. Uh, let's show your faces and tell something in, about your careers or uh, your vision, visions about future. Uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't hear uh, very well. Uh, okay, tell something about you, ab about members of uh, of your team, about your project, or uh, okay. some introduction, and then you will share next information about uh, your presentation. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Enrique Montaigne. Uh, I'm a student from here, from uh, in uh, Lausanne University. And I'm with my colleagues. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll let them uh, talk uh, in a minute. Uh, I'm studying at uh, the moment uh, video games, and I focus more in uh, 3D art and uh, game design. And in this uh, in this presentation, we are going to show a little bit of what we do in the university and uh, projects that come also. Uh, outside of the classes, projects that inspire us to do more and projects that inspire us to do different things that we all share and like so much. Um, with me, I have some colleagues. Hello, uh, so my name, <laughs> my name is uh, Afonso. I'm a first year here at Los Ofnes studying with Enrique and the rest uh, of the group. Uh, so. I'm also more of an artist, uh, but I do tend to focus more on 2D, especially pixel art. I'm, I'm a big uh, pixel art aficionado. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, I try to also explore a little bit more outside my comfort zone. And that's kind of what I'm, at least my part, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, how uh, specifically GCC, which is the main event in this presentation, how it made me start to explore different things and how it inspired me in my own comfort comfort zone to improve and continue to develop my own skills. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically it. So okay, funny. next student, please. Uh, hello, I'm Antonio, and I'm a second year student here at uh, Luzofna, and I'm also from video games. I am mainly a programmer. I don't do a lot of art. I try, but I'm it takes a while. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm a programmer in GCC. I'm going to talk about it, but I explore mostly programming, but I also try to dabble a bit with uh, art to try to learn since it's out of classes, so there's no repercussions, but I'll get into it better the presentation. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, uh, Jose, uh, nice. Uh, <coughs> Oh, Hello, my okay. name is my name is Julia. Uh, I'm also here at the first year at the video games uh, course. Uh, uh, I also focus more on programming, though I know a little more about art than Antonio. Um, but I guess during the presentation, I will show more of what I did here, uh, especially in the Games Creator Club. Some games, I little games I've developed, and so on. So. Hello, I'm the last member. I'm Ricardo. Um, I'm here as well in the video game course from Luzofna. I'm a second year as well. Um, I mainly focus on programming and throughout the presentation I'll also be showing some of the projects that uh, I've developed for the um, Game Creators Club and hopefully um, the presentation works out and everyone enjoys it. Okay, and uh, we'll introduce also uh, members of the second group. So, Jose Reis is the first. Uh, try to tell something about you. Hello, I'm Jose Page. I'm on my final year of Computer Games and Programming Skills Bachelor's degree. Uh, I'm a 
a hundred percent programmer. I don't touch anything related to art. And yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, Tiago, please. Hello, uh, my name is Tiago Berlin. I'm, uh, I'm in my last year of the graduate in Lusofna. I'm a 3D artist and I don't touch anything related to programming because I'm the contrary to Jose. Okay, and Ms. Madalena. Hi, my name is Madalena. I'm a 2D artist, but uh, contrary to my colleagues, I touch a little bit of programming in a little bit of 3D, not as much as they do, but uh, if there's anything easy to do, I do it. So they don't have to. And yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your uh, brief uh, uh, introduction. Uh, uh, so uh, the opening word for Philip, you just teacher, try to explain something about these two projects. Uh, it's it's a work for you, Philip. Uh, try to tell anything about yeah. projects so, from a point sorry, of because we are, from, from point of we, 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 and for all these same um, issues with your mic, because sometimes we don't hear it perfectly fine. So uh, once again, thank you very much for for this opportunity. The the presentations for today were really really inspired. Uh, just to say that uh, at the end, due to the the reasons our students are in the middle of uh, uh, a very heavy period of the delivery project. They will see uh, a synchronized, the other students will see this conference later on the next weeks, but we will prepare for them uh, a presentation of all of the projects that that have been recorded to YouTube. But basically, so what, uh, as they explain, uh, the first concept, I think it's, um, I suggest, suggest, sorry, to the students to present the Games Creators Club, which I think is a very good uh, practice, um, education practice, and that could be open to your students because the participants, I don't want to be a spoiler, but the participants of these events came from everywhere, not only from our university. And secondly, uh, the second group will present, I think, two projects. One uh, developed in a subject that the goal is to create some interactive app game or app uh, in VR. And the other, a final project uh, that they did. Uh, they are now working on them to on that on that project to try to finalize a fantastic vertical slides and to get some funding probably uh, in June to, to create a company, to develop the game further, etc. And basically it's going to be that, those two presentations. Okay, thank you very much. So now the first group, uh, please uh, share your presentation and try to tell us, now, uh, to tell us something about your project. I think it's streaming. Y yes, it's fine. We can see it. Okay. Thank you. Then, okay. Um, once again, thank you so much for having us, and um, we'll start by um, uh, talking about a little bit of what we bring in today. The today we wanted to bring a topic that it's very important for us. Uh, it's our Games Creator Club. Uh, here, um, I am a second year student, so I started uh, last year attending to this uh, little event, and uh, it's what I think monthly brings us as a video game student, um, a little bit of freedom to explore what we learn in the classes. And that ends up making us show a lot of projects that we normally wouldn't if we only do stuff for our classes. If, um, but um, 
how does it work? So Names Creator Club, uh, we have one time each month a theme, and we decide to do a video game about that theme. It can be something very short, a 2D uh, platformer. It, it can be anything as long as it doesn't even have to work. Mostly of my programs don't work, but um, yeah, we have one a theme per month. In the end of a day, we sh all show our uh, creations. And then in the same day, a new theme is revealed. Um, can, I, can I just add something? Uh, I think it's uh, relevant to highlight that in GC, you, you should, or if you're participating, the objective is to produce something, but it doesn't have to be a full-fledged video game. It can be anything from assets, art, something even more related to tabletops, anything really related to the theme. Even cake, it has yeah. happened. So we have cake, yes. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to pass. <laughs> OK, so starting with me, uh, I've already kind of introduced myself. Um, I'm more of a pixel artist. But I do have a really tender and soft spot for character creation as well as concept art. So this was my starting point. Uh, with my first ever animation and some concept art for uh, a monk type of guy uh, and some really almost walking cycle. Really poor executed, but still proud of it for the time. Um, so, and then I started developing. This is all before uh, GCC, uh, where I uh, tried and put my feet a little bit into the water uh, with some rendering, some more concept art. And then uh, I came to Lusofna uh, this year. And just to give you a little taste of how, how fun and how diverse the themes at GCC, uh, GCC can be, uh, one of the themes was actually uh, Game Boy, uh, utilizing uh, Game Boy Studio. Uh, we were aiming to create um, a Game Boy game that could be ported into the, to the console. Um, and as such, I made some assets. Um, I didn't reach completion on this project, <laughs> as many times it happens. But just to show you, that you're really free to do uh, a ton of things and really different stuff uh, from sprites of characters to splash arts, uh, in-game scenes, anything really. Um, then uh, with uh, GCC and some sessions of it already under my belt, uh, I started seeing other people creating uh, their own stuff, including characters, renderings, and it kind of incentivized me to create uh, little tests, little little fantasies, little worlds as like a way to practice my own creativity, because I do believe it is something that you can practice and get better at. Um, so I can. Uh, this is one of many examples where I try to um, start from typical uh, RPG or fantasy classes like mages, warriors, um, and then start to develop them based on animals, for example. Um, but yeah, you have some creatures up in there as well for another project, um, which will be awarded uh, more into the presentation. But basically, it's uh, it was a theme related to the play dates. So those little creatures were also really fun to make. Uh, and not to mention that with this comes also a practice of my own flexibility within the medium of pixel art. Because it's easy to draw consistently, at least, okay, from my experience, it's easy to be consistent with the style that you're comfortable in. So when you're forced to take on different hardware limitations, uh, different uh, different artistic concepts, different ideas overall, and when you're more exposed to that, uh, I think these are kind of the results you start to be more creative, more productive even. Because I, at a certain point, I did felt to feel Decided to try new things and color schemes and just changing a little claw in a lobster turns out so much fun. So this is one of the effects that GCC had in me. It really, it really impacted the way I see creativity and how I express it. Uh, but yeah, uh, more, more designs. My animations were another thing that I could take uh, from GCC and apply them to other classes uh, here in college. For example, that that bound uh, was actually a project for one of my classes. Uh, so that's maybe why it's a little bit sketchy at certain points because I didn't have the time. But anyways, uh, I could take what I learned and what I honed in GCC and transfer it into other uh, areas of 
my art per se, I guess. But yeah, uh, many different styles as well. That's another thing that by having many themes and monthly theme, you are kind of forced to explore different styles, to think a little bit outside the box, uh, experiment overall. And I'm really grateful for that, in that uh, to this scene in that regard. And talking about getting out of our comfort zone, uh, this is something that I only now start more practicing, uh, which is 3D, still with the, um, with the pixelated look, because I do love it generally. Uh, but yeah, you have more on the left my wall, my first attempt at 3D uh, modeling. Uh, and it turned out cute, a little too eager to leave, in my opinion, but it's fine. Uh, but, but yeah, I continue to, to improve and to try my best at new areas, and that's mainly what my part in this presentation has to say about GCC. It's a really nice spot and makes you feel really comfortable uh, to miss targets and to fail at stuff and sometimes succeed and show it to the rest of the, um, of the group. And it's always positive, the reaction, I'd say. So, no fear there. So, passing the microphone. Okay. So, hello again. I'm Antonio. Like I mentioned before, I'm a second year student. Uh, and I'm here to talk about what GCC is to me, because I feel like uh, everyone in the uh, Game Creators Club has a different take on how they use GCC. And for me, it's a lot about experiment experimenting with stuff that I've never done in classes or that I don't learn in classes, so trying to learn by myself and trying to level with it. So I'm going to uh, talk about talk about it chronologically. So this is my, my two first projects. And at the time, we didn't know anything about Unity in classes, so this was my first games ever in Unity. On the left is a game, like a platformer, where you are uh, an alien, where you, and you throw this little ball, and wherever the ball lands, you teleport to it. And it's supposed to be like a frustrating platformer, because if you miss, you go all the way down. And uh, I don't know if it was beginner's luck, but it ended up being a big hit. Uh, my teachers love playing it, and it's been very fun. And it should come to Steam soon, possibly with the, our university's game collection. So it's also very fun and exciting. Uh, and I made all the pixel arts for this game, even though I don't, I'm not really an artist at the time. I didn't really know knew any artists, so I had to make it up myself. So it took me a while because I'm not that good, but I did my best, and I think it turned out okay for a programmer, I guess. Um, yeah, then my second project, oh, actually, I forgot that the theme for this first project was poetry, and I kind of cheated, so I made like a platformer with where the platforms are the words for the poem, which is kind of cheating, but it's okay, because everyone loved it, so. Uh, okay, so then my second project, which is this codfish trying to get garlic. Uh, so this theme was uh, for Christmas, where every, it was like Secret Santa, so everyone got a theme from other people, and my theme was codfish. And I just thought, like, what, what am I going to do with codfish? I have no idea what to do. I thought about bringing a codfish to GCC, but yeah. So in around one or two days, I tried to make this little fish, jumping fish. Uh, I didn't, don't really like this game, honestly. It's not on my itch anymore because I don't really like showing it, but I think it's funny to see the progression. Uh, so these two games, uh, no, one is a game, one is a model. So the first game is one of my first games for GCC for this year which is like a mini games type of party game. This is one of the mini games where you play volleyball and each player is one of these little characters. Uh, the art wasn't made for me, now I had already some artists to help me out with, some people from the first year. Uh, and it's a little fun game, people had fun with it. It's very incomplete, I have to go back to it. I kind of abandoned this project for now, but it was a learning experience to just have a, a lot of games inside one game. Uh, then it was my the, on the right, there's a play date, which is a console, and the theme for this month was the play date, and I didn't really feel like learning um, how to code for play date, I was just wasn't feeling it, but I really wanted to learn some 3D modeling, so I knew what how it worked, uh, and we actually made a, a second ca category, kind of for GCC, where we just do modeling, so this was my first attempt at it, my first model ever that I didn't do from tutorial, and I think it turned out pretty okay, and I'm really proud of it. Um, and I'm actually still modeling sometimes to thank to this project because I really had fun with it. Uh, but okay, so these are my most recent slash proud projects. 
I mean, I'm very proud of the Alien 2, that was the first project. So, but on these first project, these two projects on the left, uh, we have this monkey game, which you, is very similar to ZX, ZX Spectrum games. This game started as a game jam project. It actually got first place, which was very nice. It was with most of the people that are here with me right now. Uh, we ended up. Uh, um... Something happened with sound. <coughs> what happened with sound? Some, some issue. They are in the classroom. I think it's frozen. It's frozen. Probably. It's frozen. I, I think it's better to go out and back in. If if I, yeah. for a, for as far as I know, Teams. Even if they know about this, that uh, something happened. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> they are still speaking. I will try to contact them. The question is maybe the second group is uh, online, maybe uh, they will have less problems with connection. Dolena, probably you could start the presentation. Uh, we try to yeah. figure out what's happening with your colleagues. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, we, so we, we could. Yeah, something happened, so the first group will finish the presentation later and announce with uh, the second group. So we'll try to share your project. On oh, the they are back on again. So Hello, sorry. If, yes, so if you know where you finish your presentation, you can try to continue. Let's try to share the screen. Uh, okay, so should we share it and keep going? Sorry. Yeah, keep, keep, keep going, yes. Okay. Uh, just, okay. Try, try to recover these five minutes. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm going to be quick, I promise. I was about to finish. Uh, so yeah, all right. This uh, where the cra where it crashed. But I was saying, my first on the right, it was my first time uh, trying with procedural procedural generation and AI, and it's just a little game like Terraria where the map generates automatically as you progress, and yeah, it was very fun to do, and I got uh, very into generation uh, procedural generation and AI because of it, and I'm doing some projects with it right now. So I'm going to pass it to Ricardo now to talk about this take on GCC. Thank you very much. Okay, so.
So um, the way I see GCC has always been not only as a way to practice, but also as a way to learn new things. So um, I'd like to, I think the most interesting thing that I could bring to this presentation was just to show how GCC helped me evolve personally and the kind of things that I learned from it. So um, first of all, um, in terms of the practice, I decided that it would be interesting to bring one of my first um, submissions for the event. In this case, it was this little almost uh, walking scene, pseudo horror game. And as you can see through the image, you barely can see anything. It's very, very dark. Um, this was a learning opportunity because uh, my monitor back home is very, very bright. So I always guided myself through it and I adjusted the game accordingly. And then when I brought it, uh, no one could see anything. It barely worked. So um, just right there, not only did I learn a lot by making the game, but I also learned a lot by trying to showcase the game. And that helped me um, then tweak it for further um, showcasings, uh, further um, um, further submissions, further events. And for example, as I will show in a bit, my most recent uh, horror game also was turning out to be very dark. And then um, with the help of some colleagues and with the help of people from the GCC as well, I've been able to tweak it and make it so that it does have a slider to adjust these kinds of things so that it's able to be presented anywhere. So um, I would just like to just show a little excerpt from the game. So all we did basically was we would walk through this very long corridor and there would be like these little boxes here. You would click it, there would be notes, and then you would keep going until you find another note. And that was basically it. You just walk through there and you just told the story. And I would like to then uh, showcase that this was uh, my first presentation, and then I just kept learning as I went to not only to the course, but also to more um, submissions and more events of the GCC. And uh, just to showcase a bit of an evolution, I did decide to give my hand at um, so, sort of the same style of game, sort of like this horror-esque um, kind of game uh, as well. And this is the submission from last month, so um, almost one year um, after the previous. And uh, I did learn a lot, not only from also how to control the characters, the kind of events I can put, but also um, on how to make the setting. So the previous one was just a very long corridor. And as you can see on this one, not only did the sound, which I'm not sure if you are able to hear, get very revamped, but the whole game as a whole, as you can see, it has been very tweaked. There's a lot of new lighting that I was now able to do. And there are some kind of interactables, scripted events, as you can see with the little ball here. Um, I don't want to show too much. You, um, at the end, we will show our um, pages and our, our socials so that you, if you want to test any of these games, you can do so. And uh, finally, not only is this a very good way uh, to practice, but also to learn. Because as Antonio said, uh, we do have to do some submissions for the course. However, um, they are obviously linked to grades. So sometimes we don't want to make GCC also does um, give us a platform to give a try to those sort of things. So I would just like to show this. Um, this is one of the um, things that I've tried, which was completely new and I've never tried before, which was VR, which I didn't even have a VR headset. So I was very intrigued on how it worked and how to do it. So I asked in university if I could lend one. They very generously um, accepted and lent me one. And I was able to utilize it to develop this as a way to not only experiment with it, but also to learn new things that um, are not um, and that are not usually learned in the course. And as such, I would just like to show a little clip of it. And I think it came out um, very well. It's quite fun to play. And this is just like a little showcase of not only the, the amount of things that we are able to experiment and do new things of, but also that you also utilize this um, event to refine the things that we do know and to keep improving on it. And now I will just pass the microphone to my colleague. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm Julia again. So uh, I will talk how GCC for me is a way to help me develop my skills. I come to this course. I came to this course as a complete beginner. I and work very little with programming. I, I never even used Unity. So here are two projects. The first, the one to the right. Yes, the one to the right is the first project I've ever presented in ETC. 
the team was visual novel, so I did uh, <laughs> satirical political thing. Uh, I, I guess you you guys won't understand very much because it's about Portuguese politics. So, but to to the left here is the last project I presented. Uh, it's a li little game that about two miners uh, miners uh, <laughs> fleeing from a giant boulder that's going after them, and they have to pump the carts to be able to escape. It was very really fun to do this project. I did it in less than 24 hours with help of my colleague Afonso. He did all, all the art. He also gave me the the idea because I had no idea what I would do to this month's. PCC and I was like, hmm, what can I do? I asked the phones when he gave me this idea and it and I said, yeah, let's let's do it. So one sleepless night and it was done. But now I will show a, another little project that I presented in PCC. It was also, I, I think it was my second project. It was a recreation of Minesweeper, a game that I like very much in Python because in maths class, we were uh, experimenting with Python, with uh, a Python library that uh, let, let us visualize things. So I, I was thinking, hmm, perhaps I could do something fun with this. And I decided, I like Minesweeper a lot. Let's, let's do this. So as you can see here, my code is very spaghetti code. It isn't very good. I wouldn't let my teacher see this, probably. But it was my first time doing a project like this. Uh, and my one of my most popular projects now is this little game that I made for the Playdate. It's another game about bombs. I know I do a lot of games about bombs. Uh, it's about you have a little bomb and you have to spin the crank because the, this console has a crank to be able to disarm it. You sometimes you have to press buttons and at the end you get a little certificate. Uh, it will appear here at any moment. <laughs> and this ex there's a ex certificate of expertness and a certificate of incompetence if you completely fail it. So it was a very fun game. It gained some track on each I.O. and I'm actually really proud of it. I like to use VCC as a way to try new things and develop the things I, the skills I have. So now I will pass the mic to Enric again. And Hello, again. So now I would like to talk about a bit of the diversity, uh, because like Afonso said in the very beginning, uh, we use uh, Games Creator Club also to uh, not only make games, full games on or like undeveloped games, but also to just assets and 3D models, songs, uh, visual novels, we try to be creative and bring a little bit of everything, even if you don't have the time to do a full game, because it also helps us, like, it's helpful, also helps us a lot um, in the middle of the semester when we're full of <laughs> uh, work to do. Uh, it ends up being a little escape because we can choose what to do and see the little passion and the little knowledge we gathered throughout the whole classes and bring it here. So I have uh, two fun examples. One, like my colleagues showed, um, we had the play dates, the console uh, theme one month, and one of the first uh, year students uh, decided to do a different model. And he made uh, this <laughs> beautiful uh, play date uh, robot. And then we have my creations that are completely the opposite. And I decided to do a little joke on my uh, teacher and maybe him a train. So uh, this is the two sides we weigh in, in the Games um, Creator Club to bring. We can be serious about it or not at all. As long as we have fun and be productive, it's always a fun time to be there and show our projects to everyone. Uh, like I told, we also started this year with uh, some different effects. We started with TV studios. So we, like Afonso already uh, told, we made a um, Game Boy, very uh, Game Boy games. Then we went to play it. And then we were uh, given the theme of the teams, uh, basically uh, to choose a new engine. And that also ends up bringing uh, our productivity a lot. And 
to try new things, try new ways to do new things. He ends up bringing us new knowledge and having fun doing so. So it's a way we can learn and it's a way we have fun doing with our friends and showing the creations we bring in the end. Even our professors hate some of the engines. Uh, so it's always fun discussing about what is the best engine they're not, and we end up learning by it. So it's very good to to practice your skills and show it to everyone. But we also do stuff uh, more non-digital. We like to uh, bring some uh, board games from time to time. The one on the left is actually Professor Wilson one uh, from a couple months ago. It was. It was, he was kind of Dungeons and Dragons, it was fun. Uh, and the other one was the, when the theme was trains and to play was or to trains and get a lot of actions. So we don't stop on um, like games like I was saying. Uh, board games, uh, 3D art, songs about games, or even uh, images about games. We, that this is our little spot when we can bring all the things we cannot like bring to classes and let it thrive inside here. And it's a little SKP also when we want really to touch a, a certain aspect of a game or we want to show, oh, okay, I don't have time to do all, all of this, but I could do a model for it and we do it and it's always good and we always get great feedback from people. So it's very relaxing and very, um, very good. And now that the presentation is over, uh, we would like to know if there's any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and so uh, we had the first pro uh, several projects of uh, game design in um, a university in Zofona and for uh, first student, uh, Alfonso Kuna, uh, will uh, put question uh, Ms. Buizoshova. Sorry, can you just repeat the last part of the question? I'm a little, I'm a little yeah, deaf. She, she, she'll ask once more. Okay, hello. Um, my, my question is for the first guy because I'm really interested what got you into bringing your 2D pixels into 3D objects. Okay, that's a really nice question. Uh, first point, I think, first of all, uh, <laughs> FOMO, <laughs> because I saw everyone doing, and as I said, uh, when you're uh, presenting stuff in the GCC, you're really exposed to other people's projects. Uh, and one thing that appeared a ton was all these beautiful models and, ooh, look, shiny stuff on the screen. And I was like, okay, I want to I wanna be able to do that as well, but in my own way, right? So to apply what I already know, what my comfort zone, and expand it into a new domain, uh, per se. And 3D is always uh, a useful skill to have. Um, now this is a little bit more, uh, I guess, uh, extra info, but I do enjoy uh, taking part uh, in a lot of game gems. Um, and sometimes there are really cool concepts uh, where looking back, uh, I, I may think, Oh wow! I, I really wonder how it would look if it was still kind of this retro revive pixel uh, style, but in 3D. Uh, so yeah, there are many reasons for why I decided to start practicing. But overall, I say that it's curiosity. I, I think I think it's uh, about that. Yeah, I say. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. I really like this so Keep the good work. Uh, next question will be for Antonio Rodriguez, uh, Miss uh, Ciscova. Hello. Uh, Hi. Uh, it's a bit of like an off topic question, but I want to say I like like all of your work. It was amazing. And I would say maybe it's not a question just for you, but maybe for all of you. It's uh, what genres or what are some of your like favorite games? Because we know that we not only make the games but also play them so <laughs> okay so my favorite genres it's kind of hard because i play a bunch of things but not a lot of each thing uh, i'd say what i like the most is in general just online games i play a lot of games with my friends especially free to play games because they're accessible but when i'm playing by myself i really like uh, roguelikes because i like my favorite thing that's why i love 
also uh, procedural generation, especially, uh, because we're all excited all about that, and um, just randomness, and I really like RNG in games too, I'm a bit, <laughs> okay. So, you know, that, I'm not really into usually story games, uh, the only game I've been playing a lot that has stories, Baldur's Gate, I really like that game, it's crazy, a crazy game, right? <laughs> Uh, but mainly that, uh, all, of, all the rest are mainly roguelikes and just online games or sometimes puzzle games. I really enjoy puzzle games, casual, sometimes just to relax a bit. So, yeah. Okay, probably uh, everything was uh, answered. Um, a question for um, Enrique uh, Montero. Uh, uh, it will be put by uh, Mr. Stanko. Do you have a microphone? Um, what were like the biggest what were like the biggest biggest difficulties in your project? Uh, sorry, the biggest? Yeah, like the difficult. most difficult part. Uh, um, when we're talking about uh, university work, uh, sometimes I feel like I get a little bit um, not very motivated for some uh, works. Uh, some parts of it are more uh, outside of what we dream to do, and it's normal. In every part of our teachings and learnings, we find that not everything we're going to learn we like. But uh, I think that's the hardest part uh, for me when I'm doing a project. And that's why I said GCC for me uh, is, 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 is that part because we get to fully um, enjoy uh, ourselves uh, by doing what we want at the moment and giving creations to the most random and different stuff. Um, for my project alone, I think the hardest part for me was uh, the programming part. I still am working on that. Uh, and I focus a lot more in um, 3D modeling. So um, when it comes to do projects, uh, games from the start, I always struggle a little bit in the code part. I have to do extra research, research and ask for help from Antonio and everything around me. Uh, but yeah, I think that's basically it. Yes, thank you. Uh, next question thank will you. be for Julia Costa. Yes. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, so please, uh, the next question will be uh, for our guest from Czech Republic. He will be a future student of our department of game design. So please put the question. Okay, so um, I also really enjoyed the showcase. Um, I thought uh, your projects were really interesting. Um, Thank you. I guess my question would be, um, I kind of saw a lot of, um, a lot of personality and uh, like uh, your own personal style. Uh, where do you where do you find inspiration? Is it in other games or do you look in different places? Um, yeah, I usually take inspiration from games like I like. Uh, in the, this little project I did, as I said, it, most of them are related to mines or bombs in some way. Uh, I guess that that something, but uh, for me the, the things that inspire me the most are more games like I, I, I like a lot of the games with, that tell stories and things like that. I guess in this project that doesn't show a lot, but I also like very quick games where you have to use your reflexes. Like I like to play platformers, so I guess in, for example, the, the miners game and the little bomb game, you, that, that, it's a part of that. You really have to be quick and solve the, the thing you have to be able to win. So I guess that gives me some inspiration for the games I work on. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And the uh, uh, last uh, um, question will be uh, put to Ricardo uh, Lour. I'm gonna press the mic. 
Yes, and uh, I, I wish uh, Mr. Well. Kolesar will put question. Uh, hi, yeah. Oh, yeah it works. Uh, my question would be, um, how do you uh, come to, s if, if, if you get a theme or a subject uh, that you maybe don't feel inspired by or don't know what to do with it, uh, how do you deal with that type of situation? How do you find uh, something fun, even in a theme that you don't really feel like doing, uh, and what uh, drives you or inspires you? No, absolutely. So, um, regarding the themes, um, it is true that most of the times we arrive there and they give you a theme, and sometimes it's not quite the theme you wanted or were expecting, and sometimes it's themes that um, when you think about it, it's kind of hard to make a game out of it, like at first glance. So I usually always take some time to like just um, think of various ideas, or maybe I think of games that I would like to do personally. That's the way I do it more. I think of like, what kind of game do I want to do? Like the genre or the mood of it. And then I try to sort of like adapt it and incorporate the theme into the game rather than make a game about the theme itself. So for example, um, the last one I showed, the one on Underground Echoes, the one on the subway station, uh, the theme for that month was actually like um, trains. So, um, but I had decided that I did want to return sort of to this horror um, scripted events type, um, very atmospheric sort of game. So um, when I heard that the theme was trains, I was a bit um, unsure on how to proceed because when I thought about trains, I thought about like, big trains going through like um, prairies or snowy mount uh, mountainscapes, and um, it didn't quite fit together. But um, then I realized that, yeah, trains are also subway trains, and the subway stations are like underground, dark, moody places, especially if it's like um, completely uh, empty. So that kind of allowed me to sort of fit the theme into the game that I wanted. So uh, that's the way I usually approach it. I believe everyone should probably has their own ways of how to tackle the themes itself. But I think that if you do have a sort of an idea, sometimes the idea can come to you based on the theme, obviously. But if you already go into it with sort of an idea, and not only can you probably incorporate that idea and still do it, but you will also gain more theme from it and sort of more flavor. For example, I think one of the best parts about that game is indeed the atmosphere and the train itself, since it's very cramped, very linear, you need to go for it, which does allow me to put some jump scares and things like that. And the original idea would be sort of like in the house, an abandoned mansion or something, which doesn't really allow me to do that. So in sort of a way, I did get to do the game I want, but I also got to not only incorporate the theme, but the theme did add something to the game, to which I think is the, um, the most interesting part about having said theme in the first place. Thank you, that was a great answer. Uh, okay, thank you. So now it's time for three questions. If somebody will want to put uh, one prepared question, uh, please, uh, Peter van Hoyte, uh, try to tell something to us as inspiration. Uh, thanks, thanks for me as well for, um, for a, a very entertaining presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, even, even though I didn't know what I was looking at half the time. Um, but it was, it was great. I, I, I'd like to ask you about something um, that you were riffing on before the presentation started. There's obviously some sort of a, a balance, counterbalance between being on the art side and being on the programming side. Um, and it is a bit of a joke, but obviously one is influencing the other uh, in your, um, in your, um, in your field. Um, so can you, can you give an example of where you feel that's a good thing and where you feel that's a challenge? So just to make sure I understood your, your question, of course. Uh, where you're asking us where do you feel uh, or where we feel that combining the two is a challenge? Is that it? Yeah, and, and, and where, where art influences uh, programming and where programming influences art, because there's, there's an interaction between the two um, because, of, because of the medium. Right. That's actually a really good question. I, I need to think about it, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, I, 
even had an answer. Okay. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, it depends a lot on the game. Uh, a lot of games uh, depends where the game starts. So we've made a lot of uh, game jams, and most of them we have a theme. And sometimes the theme inspires on a mechanic for the game mm -hmm. or on an art style. If it usually uh, gives, us, uh, gives us an art style, we try to incorporate a gameplay that fits their art style. And when it's the other way around, we do the other way around, obviously. Uh, but I, I think both have limitations because we always have a, a, the person that's making us their limitations. And sometimes the artist wants something too ambitious uh, uh, mechanically, or the other way around, and the programmer, because they don't know that much about art, wants something that's too hard to make it work as an artist. So that's why it's also very good to know a bit of everything, even if you specialize in something specific. You should always know something about the other areas, just so you don't make like absurd requests, for example. Absolutely. Anyone? Yes. Um, maybe complementing what Antonio just said, but more from an artistic point of view, I will maybe um, pick up the example about the gem that we did, uh, where we had to more or less simulate a game uh, that would be able to run on the ZX Spectrum. And in that regard, uh, we have a really clear case uh, where the art is conditioned by uh, the programming per se, and how it molds how the whole aesthetic, how the whole process, how the whole workflow uh, happens. But it also happens, as Antonio said, uh, there are many times where at least I, that's a really big question for me most of the times, where I get to see how I will fit my artistic vision in the program itself. How, how will I give the things to the program so that they implement it, resulting in something that I imagine. I don't know if that makes full sense, but I think it makes it makes sense. Yeah, thank you very much. And do you feel do you feel that that's a good thing? Do you feel inspired by uh, by, by those limitations, or or, or do they do they typically annoy you? Um, at least from an artistic point of view, I don't know about you, Eric, but um, <laughs> as for me, I'm now uh, entering the programming world, so I'm learning the basis and making small projects. So. Uh, because in the art, I'm, I, 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 mean, I already invested the number of time. I'm like comfortable to do a model and put in on my game, but in programming, I'm not that comfortable. So I think that also pushes me to want to learn more, want to know the basis, so I don't always have to depend on other people on other sites uh, to search for what to do on the code. Because um, I think seeing other people showing their code and showing their programs doing all alone also motivates me when i see the projects to do better so i think um eventually one of another will have curiosity to explore both parts and i think both can be as important it depends on what you like and yeah that's my thought. not to not to say that sometimes uh, when you have too many options when you're working in such a free workspace, mm -hmm. you can feel a little bit overwhelmed slash paralyzed by the amount of choices that you could lead your game into. So sometimes being restricted to a platform, to, to the hardware, to a specific way of programming and building the, the whole game, it's, it's good for your own creativity. And I'm really coming <laughs> with a creative philosophy today. But um, I think it's really important because it forces you to think outside the box, inside the box, as in within these limitations, how can I uh, expand it or how can I push my vision to the limits? And usually, to me at least, that's what makes the best results or that's the track until now, I guess. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentation, your answers and uh, Please stop sharing and uh, I, I wish to uh, reply uh, next group. Uh, so please, uh, just, just before we pass it on, there's a really important there's a really important thing we'd like to share with you, which is to invite you all to partake in this uh, little monthly monthly session. Because it is really open to, to everyone, and you don't have to be with us presentially to, to, to participate. 
So this is, our presentation also comes as an open invite to anyone interested and feel free to talk to us, to contact us, uh, be it through the links that we made available uh, in our bios or even our teachers, Flip Blues and Bolsonaro Medu. Also, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, feel, feel free to, to participate, to contact us. Uh, we'd be the most, the most joyful to have you with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's also mainly for our students of uh, first uh, grade of uh, game design because they have the same probably uh, visual or technical problems as you as with programming and with uh, artistic side of uh, game design. So please, now there will be presentation of a second group from the uh, University of Zofona, so uh, switch camera, please. Uh, we uh, cannot see Madalena just now. Yes, okay, so we can see each other. So please share uh, your presentation. Can we have, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it, it's perfect. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. We're going to talk about uh, two of our projects that we've developed and it's called From Concept to Reality, The Journeys of Shades of Insanity and Deep Blue Dive. My name is Tiago Berlin, I'm the 3D artist Uh, my name is Magdalena Kajidu. I'm the 2D artist and the designer. And I'm Jose. I'm the programmer and so I'm the, the, the one responsible for all the coding on our projects. Very good, thank you. Really awesome stuff as well. Yeah. All right, so. Uh, in this presentation, we'll be talking about uh, two of our projects, Shades of Insanity and Deep Blue Dive. We will talk about how we came up with the ideas for them, uh, the develop development process behind them, and uh, we'll also show you a bit of gameplay. Then we will talk about uh, our experience in some events that we attended last year, and after that we will talk about our plans for the future. We'll finish off the presentation with a brief Q&A where we will gladly ask any questions that you might come up with. So the first game that we'll be talking about is Shades of Insanity. is the longest game we have ever worked on uh, for over a year. Uh, it started as a final project for a university but now we are developing uh, outside of us. Uh, so, what is Shades of Insanity all about? Uh, basically, Shades of Insanity is a single player, first person 3D psychological game, uh, puzzle game. Uh, the player plays as a mental uh, patient in a psychiatric. Uh, hospital who works from the uh, who suffers from a schizophrenia who suffers from schizophrenia so uh, the patient basically hears voices and sees uh, hallucinations uh, the player is basically in trying to find pills that help the patient to stay stable and to learn about the truth uh, of his past as the player uh, progresses along the game, they find clues and hints about the character's past. Uh, everything the player hears or sees or have, uh, every hallucination that the character has is connected to his past, past uh, to his past lives before he was admitted to the uh, to the psychiatric uh, hospital. 
So the two main mechanics are the force perspective and the mirror mechanics. If anyone here has already played Super Liminal before, you already know how the force perspective works. But uh, basically, it consists of grabbing an object from a certain angle and the distance, and then dropping it, dropping it either further or closer from us in order to change its size. With the mirror mechanic, you can use mirrors to fix broken objects. You can do this by uh, placing objects that are broken in front of a mirror, which will reflect that same object, but unbroken. Then you interact with the mirror and get the unbroken version of the object. So originally we wanted to really simple art style, very low poly, very minimalistic art style, but uh, basically as uh, our project grows, so did our ambition. So we develop a very uh, more realistic game environments. We wanted a very low style, so but we had a, a project that grew one year, so we wanted uh, more realistic art style. Uh, there are two major uh, uh, scenarios to our game. So when the player uh, first starts the game, he finds himself uh, in a hospital environment, a very dark and cold and very tight environment. So we want the player to feel uh, very, very scary. Uh, but as the play progressed, they find himself in a forest, uh, the forest that, that is a very bright and warm environment. And with these two types of envi environment, we want to make a, 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 a contrast between them. So when the, uh, when the, uh, the player is uh, in the environment, uh, the hospital environment, uh, when to make it dark in color, and when the uh, uh, player is on the forest environment, when to, to we want to make it very warm and uh, and, and bright. Um, uh, originally, we wanted to make the forest environment very uh, stylized very low poly and stylized like uh, uh, but be between the two we first sorry uh, but between the two we, sorry uh, can I Talking about Madeleine, Tiago, could you help here with passing? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're moving. So okay. uh, the sound design was a was a huge moment in our game because it's a very important part of uh, of the immersion. Uh, you can't have a horror game without uh, creepy noises and uh, and creepy environments. Um, uh, uh, an experience is if you watch a horror game without sound, it's not as scary. So we put a lot of effort in this uh, sound design. Um, basically, uh, our most like ambitious part of the sound design were the voices that the player would hear. Uh, originally, we wanted to make uh, binaural sounds, which is uh, 3D uh, in both head, uh, headphones. Uh, but that's uh, kind of complicated to do, and it's, it, we kind of pushed it back. Uh, we're now working on it to implement it. Uh, but yeah, we, we took a huge inspiration from Hellblade, um, Sand of Sacrifice. If uh, you don't know it, yeah, I highly advise you to look it up. They did an amazing job with the, with the voices. And yeah, it's our biggest inspiration for this. So uh, this is uh, our... Basically, uh, it's our final project. It's the project we uh, developed for our 
uh, final year. We develop it for uh, one year total, two semesters. And for developing it, we uh, we received multiple feedback from different uh, teachers, like uh, Flip Luz, like uh, who is here, and also Wilson Almeida, who also is here as our teachers. And all these uh, teachers are experts on different video game areas. So we have a lot of different feedbacks for developing these games. Also, something very important for developing these games is um, uh, play tests. We develop, uh, we make play tests with re uh, very different people, and we also did. Uh, we also did question questionnaires for for these people so we have everything they notice on the games uh answered and uh we just uh, with these questionnaires we developed the games so here we you can see a very clear difference uh, especially visually but everything we did is about uh it's with the the answers that people gave us Okay, uh, a bit of a side story. In the early development of the game, uh, we were still trying to figure out what kind of game we wanted to make. Uh, so basically, Madalena had the idea of, of a horror uh, game, but I am like a scaredy cat. I don't like horror games, uh, and I wanted to do something bright and uh, colorful. Uh, so we decided to compromise and do this project where the patient would hallucinate between uh, a scary place and a warm place uh, to give him a sense of security, like a safe place. And yeah, it's it's that funny story. Uh, now we're going to show you a bit of gameplay. Let me just uh, share. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Can you hear it? Y yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, we cannot hear, but uh, uh, I don't know if it is important to hear. Uh, you have to switch on uh, uh, the sound. Uh, During the sharing the screen, it is uh, important to... Uh, okay, okay, let me To, to sign sound. Computer sounds. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, how about now? Can you hear it? Yes, we, we can hear it, yes. Okay, great. Here is a medical note, and we use this to explain the symptoms that the character has. Each symptom is related to a game mechanic, and our goal with these medical notes is to try and explain to the players how the game's mechanic work without breaking too much immersion in the game.
introduce the first mechanic, the first perspective one. And here we introduce the player to the ability of rotating objects that you have in your hand. perspective, uh, re reinforcing the mechanic, making sure the player uh, learns it and adapts to it so he can progress through the game. Here we are introducing the mirror mechanic to the player. Uh, this mechanic is still being worked on and our focus right now is to improve how the player interacts with the mirror in order to fix broken objects. We have done uh, playtesting lately and we noticed that uh, the way we were doing the interaction was not very intuitive and most of the times players didn't really understand what they were doing and so they got stuck in some places. Uh, what you just saw is the new version of how the mechanic is working. Before uh, you had to grab the object, place it somewhere where the player could see it in the mirror and then go and click in the mirror. Now, as you saw, you just have to throw it against the mirror. said before, there is a contrast between the inside of the hospital and the forest, the hospital being more dark and cold, and the forest being more bright and warm, and we use the forest to give more context uh, of the backstory of the character. Okay, guys, so because we don't have much time, we're going to stop the, the gameplay here. If you want, we uh, uh, if you want no, uh, to play the game, it's go it's going to be available soon. Uh, but we'll talk more about that uh, later. We'll get back to the presentation and talk about the second project. Uh. Now we'll go on to our second game that uh, we are presenting. It's called Deep Blue Dive. This is the latest game we developed, also for uh, economic uh, purposes. And it's the it's probably the game we had the least time to develop, not counting uh, game jams that we only had like three days to develop. We had like uh, a month to develop the concept for the game. And we only had like two weeks to develop it. And we, it, it weren't like actually two full weeks. We had like uh, two or three full days with the VR headset uh, and two full weeks to develop. But even though we only had like two or three days to with a headset, we still uh, developed the game, but it was extremely difficult to to know if the mechanics were right or there was a lot of things that we had to take account for, like uh, uh, motion sickness. It was our first ever VR game that we had to make, so yeah, uh, motion sickness was one of one of the things that we have to take on, uh, account of and and like the mechanics uh, we have something called the VR toolkit that uh, simulated the VR headset on Unity 
So it never, uh, it was never uh, actually uh, right, never, even if you use it, you never felt the, uh, the real VR headset on you. Um, yeah. Also, basically the game uh, it was, uh, we had to, basically the player had, uh, were to, basically you are playing as a my, uh, marine biologist going underwater with tasks, uh, tasks uh, with documenting the marine, uh, marine wildlife in different areas of the sea. That's the, the game. So, uh, Deep Dive had three main mechanics. Uh, the first one, uh, we have basically uh, three tools on our di disposal. One of them is a tagging gun that shoots uh, tags and uh, trackers, and you need to hit certain uh, animals uh, uh, in a list like this that's underwater. Um, the second is a camera that we need to take photos of the animals that uh, are surrounding you. And the third is a, a little torch that you need to repair the cage. Uh, I'll mention uh, a bit uh, after, but basically the, the third level, the pressure of the water gets so high that it starts damaging the cage and you need to repair it with this torch. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the game will have three levels and uh, each level is situated in a different depth uh, zone in the ocean. The first one is the sunlight zone. We have animals such as sharks, uh, turtles, manta rays, animals basically that you is a twilight zone. It's a little bit darker. The animals are not uh, seen as much. Uh, you have animals such as a swordfish, sperm whale. We have a giant squid. And in all of these uh, levels, you need to do the tasks that uh, I mentioned earlier, tagging, photographing. And in the third level, it's the midnight zone. Basically, it's uh, the animals here are bioluminescent. You have uh, jellyfish, anglerfish, uh, and as I said, the pressure of the water gets so high that you need to repair the cage. Only after you have the full the full cage repaired, and you complete the game. If you take too long to repair the cage, it starts breaking again. So you need to do it a little bit quick. We have a little bit of a gameplay. Uh, that I need to share. So I'll talk a little bit about the game. Game or um, really like um, mechanical game. We wanted something rich. Um, Okay, so you are tasked with photographing and tagging different species of animals. We have given you a list of the animals you should look out for. Good luck. And also, while you're down there, try to enjoy the view. Don't rush the work. There's no need. Enjoy. Over. You see, like we said here, we advise people to not rush the work, to enjoy the atmosphere, to really like uh, take in all the animals. Here we're using the camera to photograph it. I'll, I'll skip a bit. Uh, we'll, later we'll give you all of our show, socials so you can check the full video, but we just want to sh show the main mechanics. We're using the different objects. Here we have the tagging gun. Task completed. We are sending you down. Hold tight. Okay, now we're moving to the second level. You see 
the ambience has changed. It's a lot darker, different animals. I'm going to test for a bit because there's a lot of the gameplay is looking for the animals and that's not really interesting. There's a, a little bit of a, play, a gameplay that you need to take it easy, not rush it. So yeah, that's all three animals. So we're going to move out to the deepest zone now. At this depth level, water pressure can start to damage the cage. Don't forget to repair it with the torch if you need to. Be careful down there. Over. So we have the anglerfish, the gapper eel, the jellyfish. You can actually hear the cage breaking. So I'll move on to just show the repairing the cage. And yeah, basically when you fix everything and it's all fixed at the same time, there's nothing broken, you move on and you finish the game. So I'll go back to the presentation. So we're, talk we're going to talk about uh, some of the events we attended. Uh, the first one is called Over and Out, and it's the, the last event on our university. It's like a, an award ceremony, uh, and we were, with, we were there with uh, both games and the third one. Um, we actually won an award with <laughs> the game that's not shown here. Um, and yeah, the second, one, the second event was Lisbon Games Week. Uh, it's a really big event here in Portugal that's meant to showcase all kinds of games. There's a lot of indie companies. Uh, a lot of, of big companies too, and we were there with these both games, Deep Blue Dive and Shades of Insanity, and it was a really great experience. Uh, it was really satisfying watching people play and enjoy your games, having fun. Um, we met some amazing people that day. It was really, really good. Uh, overall, uh, both experiences was, were amazing, but uh, on over and out, they actually gave us an idea to put uh, Deep Blue Dive on the Lisbon Aquarium. And we're going to talk a bit about, a lot of, about that uh, now. All right, so let's name it. Uh, we are currently working on Shades of Insanity, and our main focus right now is improving the mechanics and puzzle design in order to provide a smoother and a more fun experience to the player. Uh, in terms of art, we are also reworking some of the visuals and lighting inside the hospital. We also want to add more uh, moments of tension and some jump scares by playing with sound, but that current, currently has a low priority compared to the rest. We have until early June to make all these changes and some more that we want, 
and then the game will hopefully be published on Steam on the Lusofna's game collection. For Deep Blue Live, as Tiago said, we are currently in talks with the Lisbon Oceanarium with hopes of bringing the game there as an, uh, an immersive experience. As it was said before, we don't have much time to work on this game, and because of that, it is still uh, in a very early prototype stage. But if we manage to get the green light by the Oceanarium, we're planning on collaborating with the people that work there, the people that do the maintenance of the aquarium and the people that take care of the animals. And uh, it is by collaborating with them, we hope to get a better understanding of the, the work that is being done there so we can align this project with their goals and expectations. Okay, so now it's the time to answer all the other questions. We have a QR code with all, so all of our socials. Um, so yeah, go follow us if you want. <laughs> um, we can, you can also check out uh, some other projects that are on your, our YouTube website. Um, but yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, uh, we have one small prepared question for you. I don't know if Mr. Marej is here, probably not. Uh, uh, Mr. Spaccio, uh, so try to ask something. Uh, Mr. Spaccio is a student from Czech Republic. We are proud about it and uh, he, he can put question now. All right. Uh Hello. First of all, very nice presentation, very terrific, very nice. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what made you want to, with, with uh, in regards to your first project, like what made you want to tackle like such a subject like the mental health and schizophrenia and stuff like that, like what, what made you want to explore that? Okay, so uh, basically, um we we all w like uh, the same sort of of games uh, as such like um serious games leave you uh thinking and that's kind of the point uh, uh like uh, games overall are uh, to let you escape from reality as uh, sometimes uh, um but the best games or my favorite games uh, are the ones that let, that leave you like thinking after you, the game that leave you a mark on you uh and they they tackle the, some of these issues uh such as mental health schizophrenia um to also bring awareness to to the people that suffer from this we also don't uh, didn't want to make something unrealistic because it might be offensive or uh, insulting to the people that actually suffer from this. So we put a lot of effort to make it as, as real as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question will be for uh, Madalena. And uh, next uh, question will put uh, Mr. Uh, Kolar. Uh, <laughs> do you have some technical issues during uh, the uh, creating the project. Uh, sorry, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't uh, understand what. Sorry. Uh, if you have some technical issues, some problems with the, uh, the project. We had uh, some technical problems uh, involving the game, but they were more like uh, programming problems. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would also like to add that uh, I think the most difficult part for us, especially with uh, Shades of Insanity, was to balance out the difficulty of the game's mechanics because when you are working on a game uh, every time you make a change or add something new you go and uh, test it out see if everything is working okay so you end up replaying your game a lot and uh, what that makes is that <coughs> you get so used to it that it gets a lot easy for you to uh, complete the puzzles 
and so you start thinking that it will also be easy for other people and uh, if you don't you do not play test and that was something that we did not do for a long time uh, you won't get a good uh, feeling on how difficult the game actually is and uh, when you actually see people trying the game you will see them uh, not having such an easy time as you would expect and that uh, happened a lot to us in the beginning of the development. Thank you. And the uh, last question will put uh, Miss Shufriarska. Is she here now? So, Miss Bernatova. Thank you. I think you made two very lovely games with very unique mechanics and I think it's an amazing thing that you are working with the aquarium to have it as an immersive experience. Um, I'd like to ask for both games, how long did the concept stage take? Like how long do you think about how you, uh, what kind of theme you're going to give the game and what kind of atmosphere you're going to give it and all that? Okay, so basically I'll start off with Shades and then I'll talk about uh, Deep Dive. Uh, shades, uh, the, the idea was to make, yeah, like I said, two uh, ambiences that would resonate with each other, but uh, also with a huge contrast. Uh, and that was like the first stage of making the game. Uh, and uh, if you talk to developers, there are a lot of things that start off that you want to do, and then they're discarded by the end of the project. There are a lot of things that don't reach that, that end part. And this one actually made it because it's such a core concept to our game. We didn't want to throw it out, but it was definitely difficult because uh, some feedback that we had was that the people thought that were, they were playing two different games, that they didn't resonate. And uh, yeah, that was one of the issues. Um, and in terms of the like timeline, I think the first month and a half, maybe two months, it was just concept. It was just uh, thinking out what the game would be, what it would look like, what were the mechanics, um, and we had to we have to make this all on on paper first. We have to make paper prototypes before moving on to digital prototypes. Um, to make sure it's, it's this is the way to go, this is going to work. Um, so, yeah, maybe two months of concepts uh, of thinking out the, the, the games, uh, mechanics and all that. But uh, it's not only that. As you move forward, uh, you start to question, like, is this working? Uh, so you have, uh, how do I say this? Throughout development, you have several stages where you have to think about uh, if your concept is working. So it's not like uh, a first stage and then you never think about it anymore. It's like first you focus really on that on that thing, but then you don't like think about it anymore. You also think about it later on in the project as you develop it. Uh, for deep dive, uh, as Madalena said, we have one month to uh, find the concept, to make the whole game uh, before moving on into putting in it uh, in the VR headset. Uh, so yeah, that was about one month. That went uh, a lot smoother than this one uh, because um, it's it's not a, as serious uh, as, as I say. Um, it's more of a, of a chill ambience. We don't have a lot of uh, complicated mechanics and it's more if I say of um, an emotional prototype, uh, it's meant to like make you feel good, make you immersed in the in a different atmosphere underwater. Um, so yeah, maybe one month. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, presentation. I don't know if Peter uh, uh, want, want to tell something to this uh, presentation. First time. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for that, for a lovely presentation there. Um, I have a question which is um, a follow-up from the first question. Uh, because it's quite an 
a serious and potentially sensitive topic. Uh, what was your research like? And did you, did, uh, do you have an advisor from, uh, from the medical sector? Um, so yeah, I think uh, Madalena would uh, talk a little bit now because she she is the most <laughs> she has the most yeah. knowledge. Yeah. No, this. we didn't really had an advisor for the topic, but I I had a, a lot of first hand experience with this specific uh, mental illness. And uh, as a neighbor and as, a, as someone who worked for uh, my house, so I really know how uh, these people who suffer from this type of mental illness uh, act and react and cope with the with the the things they experience. For example. Uh, they draw they draw a lot, not necessarily on walls or on paper, but they draw a lot so as a way to cope with the things they experience. And if, uh, if some something uh, tells them to do some, uh, something, they will do it not as, uh, not necessarily because I think this, it's right, but because there's some inner voice or some some uh, something bigger than bigger than themselves uh, that tells them to do it. So yeah, uh, we didn't we didn't necessarily have a lot of professional help, but we did we did help uh, we did have uh, a lot of personal experience dealing with this so yeah also uh, if i can add uh, uh sorry no 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 go ahead please okay so uh, like madeline has said uh they they draw a lot uh and we we tried to take advantage of that and put it in a game uh, if you notice in the first room we have a lot of drawings uh, and we we use those drawings to teach the controls of the of the game WASD, uh, the mouse and rotate. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like uh, taking advantage of something that they do and turning it in, how can I do this? How can I take advantage of this to make my game better and uh, realistic, uh, as one would say. Mm -hmm. is, is your choice of the two main mechanics of the game, is that rooted as well in, in, uh, in, in the experience that you've had with with your neighbors and people that you know? Uh, no, the, the only thing we used that was inspired on people that we actually knew was what uh, Tiago just said, the drawings on the on the walls. Mm -hmm. and, and, okay. Um, have, have those people played your game? Sorry, what? The, the the people that you know, the neighbors who, who suffer from from your condition, have they have they played your game? Oh, yeah, that's a question. Uh, so, okay, so one of the people that uh, I know that suffered from those type from that mental illness is doing okay. He, he works as a painter, not necessarily as a arti artist, but like he paints walls and everything. If you need your house to be paint, like white walls or something, he would do it, not as, a, uh, as an artistic painter. So, <laughs> the other one is, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, you, we... We used to rent a house for her, and we we really really used to like her. She was a really nice lady, and we knew we knew her family, and we knew her, 
and her sisters and her past and we knew her story we knew everything about her and uh, we knew yeah basically we we knew her but as time go on uh, her mental illness starts to grow and i mean we 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 rent a house. We are not uh, caretakers. We not we are not nurses. We are not prepared to deal with this type of stuff. Mm-hmm. We knew we did the best we could, and now she lives with uh, her sister, and we hope the best for her. But we did the best we could. Mm-hmm. We called for the hospital. Yeah. So basically, yeah. what Lena is saying, like. Uh, we don't have contact with those people anymore, so we have no no mm-hmm. way of them trying the game. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your attention during the presentation. Uh, yes, thank you for this opportunity. Yes. Please uh, stop sharing. Thank you. And now uh, there is time for closing uh, remarks, so uh, uh, we'll speak in the end. I noticed that uh, Lejon Almeida uh, uh, was uh, for the whole day with us, so please uh, try to tell something that uh, you noticed uh, during our first day of conference with Lejon. Did you hear? Sorry, I could not understand the Yes, the, the so, so uh, closing remarks. So if you notice some interesting things, so try to tell about this first day of conference. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I was very impressed with the, the work that was shown by, by everyone. Um, so especially, of course, I, I also, I, I'm always uh, uh, eager to, to look for things regarding game design and game development. So I was very impressed uh, uh, with the project, um, the giant project. Uh, it would look very, very interesting and there was a lot of work in, put into it. You, you, could, uh, you could tell. Um, so yes, I'm uh, looking forward for, for uh, the next day because this day was very uh, full of, of cool things, of cool projects. Um, yeah, I am looking forward to tomorrow. Yes, thank you very much. Now, the last word for, for today for Peter. Uh, try to tell your opinion. What do you think about this first day? Compare probably a Slovakian student, a Belgian student, or if it is possible to, to compare them. Or because there are really very different philosophies, uh, as I noticed. Um, Yes. Wow. Uh, that is that is a big question. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed I enjoyed every single every, every single presentation. I'm I'm very impressed with the range of things that I've um, that I've seen today. The the, the different uh, the different approaches. Um, I would say in terms of in terms of comparing, um, I would say that. Perhaps um, the school here is is um, no. I'm going to say it differently. Um, it, is 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 that I I feel more of an emphasis towards um, sort of professional environments in um, the schools of uh, Belgium and Portugal, maybe more so than here, which reminds me of my own education and my own school which which I'll talk a little bit about tomorrow um, um, although Portugal Portugal the, the, the Portugal students seem to have like a really nice mix of two where the first the first group was a bit more nutty than the <laughs> <laughs> um, forgive me the expression I, I, don't, I don't I don't mean that in a, in a, in a bad way at all um, and it, it also made me rethink a little bit my approach for tomorrow um, um, so I've got I've got a couple of a couple of stories and a, and a storyline in mind, um, which is maybe a little different than what I what I first 
first imagined it's, it's going to be a little bit a little bit looser um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to have quite a bit of a bit of dialogue um, as well as I as I go along um, yeah I'm looking I'm, I'm really looking forward to it I'm, I'm very very pleasantly surprised with um, with what I've seen today and it's it's been it's been a long day but it's been an, a, anything but boring um, so it's it's um, yeah Right. Yeah, yes, top, thing. top Th marks from <laughs> from the back row. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much too. Uh, now, please, uh, Dirk, uh, try to tell something from the point of view. As uh, we spoke uh, yesterday, so we said that in the end we'll uh, speak about philosophies of our school. So try to tell about the global concept of uh, your school or, uh, uh, or of your students or department or also. The philosophy of digital arts and entertainment. <laughs> um, yes. So um, we've started in 2006, and it started as a game education. But there was a so 3D animation was like the backbone, and then we had the developers, and then we had the artists. But they were not only coming for games; they were also coming for 3D. And then later on, at this moment, we have six majors. And uh, yeah, we have to differentiate because there are too many students also. So that is something that we did. Uh, but then on the other hand, what else did we change? Uh, so now we are in our sixth iteration, the 6.0 as we call it. Um, and um, now we have six majors. And uh, on all the majors, we have group projects in the last year. That means first year, second year. First year is really like pumping them up with skills, with tools, second year experiment, third year group projects, really project year. And um, as, so this is something we did like, I think six years ago, but since last year, I was thinking like, I'm going to, we need really dedicated team of teachers for the group projects as well, that they can be followed up uh, as a simulated uh, company. I mean, a simulated company, really a production company, where we say, okay, guys, we have 12 weeks, this is the deadline, and we are going to produce this, and we are going to show this to the clients, to the world, uh, after 12 weeks. And uh, that really helps to really, uh, as, as they said before, the students, they worked with F-Track, uh, they had their weird weekly sessions, they had the presentations they had to do, so therefore, then, yeah. Well, what I would say is the, the other thing in our philosophy is also the soft skills that they know about planning communication because you can be very good in the skills, you can be very good, yeah, uh, you, you can have all these competences, but if you're not okay or you don't fit in a team, then it's also a big problem. And that's something that we're really, 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 really working on uh, to create this not only with group projects but also in previous courses where they have peer-to-peer -peer evaluation, we've put them in islands uh, together. They just come in in the class, then we say, you, island one, you, island two, you, island three. So every week they are sitting on a different island and they always show their stuff to really, yeah, that they can communicate a lot better. So that is actually the philosophy now because <clears throat> I said before with six majors, everybody has already more his own thing. What really helps, uh, voila. And uh, yeah, the other thing is, they need to work together. Yes, it, it, there was a very perfect word about uh, cooperation. And uh, now, um, please, uh, your last remark, uh, uh, Philippe Rouge, uh, from your point of philosophy of, uh, uh, of your school. Okay, thank you. Um, I had prepared a, a PowerPoint, but oh, wow. I will skip it because it was a long <laughs> a long day and i know that everyone is tired so basically uh, what i would like to highlight and regarding the amazing presentations for today that um, our university um, that we are now connected with film you and uh, i would like to pay attention that you all could pay attention to the film you audience because the networking has bringing new amazing things that are happening. So in the past, our film department, which is quite uh, vibrant, quite enthusiastic, uh, we started our games 
studies in 2009, the industry in Portugal was almost new, just a few game developers, etc. was very a challenge period. And nowadays, lots of things is, are happening here. Um, the industry is rising a lot uh, against the, <laughs> what's happening in worldwide here is growing. There's a lot of, there's an amazing gaming hub with a lot of international companies here, which means that our philosophy was not, as mentioned before, by our colleague is not a technical, more oriented technical school, more uh, high sk skill, diversity skill um, for our game students. So they are challenged with several things. So they have to program a little bit, they have to do a lot of game design, they have to do a little bit of art, etc. to try to work a little bit more oriented to an indie company. Normally our students came to the university, they dream with a AAA, but that's not the, the reality of our studies. And regarding, for instance, this schizophrenia theme, uh, we work a lot with series games in the during our semesters in the second year and third year. They have a subjects where they work with people with intellectual disabilities, specialists. They change all the uh, challenge the students, and they have to develop games for people with intellectual disability. In the past, it was for deaf kids that needed to learn mathematics, among others, um, and. After these experiences, uh, the social impact for our students is amazing because they lead with other different realm of the games, not all the entertainment, but more the, the serious topic. And also this brings us to develop after research. So we, we try to put some research on our activities and now we have several research programs and activities and we are hiring our students to to be with and we can award them with scholarships to do develop research activities and they went to masters and to phd some of them are already in phd doing research so but basically to summarize uh, we have this uh, video games partial degree uh, of course in the film department there's a lot of degrees the film the computer informa uh, the informatics the uh, fine arts etc fashion design design etc but recently we started to do a game design and playful media master which is oriented towards game design and playful media what could be the alternative of control games games more more for performance more interactive in terms of the embodiment, etc. And now I'm going to start the games and uh, artificial intellig uh, intelligence, AI, sorry, games, uh, new master, and also with the, within the consortium of um, the film EU, we started the replay. We're going to start in September, replay is Erasmus Mundus program that we will uh, the first semester will be in Lisbon, Lusofi. the second semester will be in Genk in Belgium and the third in the University of Alto in Finland. Um, which means that uh, this Erasmus Mundus is something that all the students should be aware of. They are quite competitive. Normally we accept between 18 to 24 candidates and we receive 200, 300 candidates. And they are sponsorship by the EU. So you at SMU uh, universities and among the others check for these uh, Erasmus Mundus because they are happening worldwide in several domains of expertise. So basically, is that to uh, no no to to finish? Sorry. Um, the one thing that we are trying to push a lot is the integration be between students to work in teams. So the first thing is to uh, increase the number of game jams. We do a lot of game jams. Wilson Almeida is the most authority uh, to speak on that because it's the one that since 2014 is doing game jams with us. And, and also this Games Creators Club because they open the network for the students. So the students have the opportunity to meet other 
students, professionals from the industry, our game jams are developed within the university, but with alumni, with professionals from the industry that came here just for fun to create uh, games, apes, whatever. And that is something that we wanted to push a lot in our course, is the interactions, the collaborations, the collaborative work. And basically it's that. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Felipe. Uh, so something about our school, we uh, started to educate in uh, 2011, so in comparison with uh, Dirk, uh, who started in uh, 2006, and uh, uh, Philip Perush, uh, which started uh, 2009, so we are the youngest, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we started uh, with uh, um, uh, visual effects, and uh, just four years ago we started to teach also game design, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, that uh, we are in the same department, game design and visual effects, that uh, is. Uh, very uh, fantastic uh, possibility for our students. We are in the same place and uh, they have, we must meet each other, game design students uh, with uh, visual effects every day and uh, gather together uh, the, the same space. So uh, I think that from this uh, um, uh, space will come uh, new nice projects. And uh, if I think about this, uh, this uh, project jump, jump that I think that uh, was uh, really very excellent and uh, what uh, what was for me uh, very um, important that, uh, that there was different kind of students there, there, uh, there was student of uh, visual effects uh, student of animation student of game design and so on so uh, uh, this thing I, I think that is uh, very interdisciplinary uh, that uh, for future will be very important. Uh, generally, if uh, uh, I'm thinking about our, our school, so it is art school. So we focus mainly about uh, art, and because we are three faculties: one uh, faculty is theater faculty, and the second is uh, uh, beside our film faculty there is uh, uh, music uh, uh, faculty. So I count very much on cooperation. So for our future development of game games of our students, I count that they will must to use uh, acting, they must to use storytelling, and to be uh, as much realistic as possible. So I like very much uh, stylization of uh, Mary in her project, but, but the future of our students I, I see in different way. I, I see a, as uh, much realistic as, as possible, you, you know, and uh, it is very hard and uh, it is also the question how to do it, because ge generally the answer is yes, it, it could be done in, in uh, um, today's uh, technologies, but uh, it is possible just by big industry firm or uh, industry uh, companies, yes, and, and the question is how to make very realistic uh, game uh, if uh, you don't have too much money and, uh, and uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, you are just a uh, few students uh, in, in group and uh, you have to compare your result with uh, big companies. So it is my personal very big question how to do it and uh, I see it in, in cooperation, you, you know, to, to uh, to uh, find the ways uh, of communication among uh, students uh, around the whole Europe. <laughs> and I appreciate very much that uh, our school, as uh, Philippe said, that uh, uh, joined uh, this uh, um, uh, Film AU uh, project, and we will be part of, of this project. And uh, in, in future, in three years, we must cooperate together. It, it, is not that we can, but we must. So it is new, <laughs> new possibility how to raise our ideas and uh, how to uh, make our education better and better. In, in this project, it means that our teachers have to go to, for example, to uh, Lisbon 
or to Dublin or, or to Brussels or, or to whatever. And uh, I, I count also that your students will must to go here <laughs> to our ground and to be here for, I don't know, two or three months and, and uh, to share the same conditions and to find uh, ideas how to put it to maybe art work, not, not uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think uh, that uh, our future is in uh, games for uh, mobile or uh, games uh, that uh, could be done very fast and very easy. It's not future for, so, so I, I see future for our students something that will be maybe in 15 years, not now, but in, in 15. And, uh, and uh, in 15 years, I, I think that uh, the most important will be storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. Yes, so regarding our day, I, I think that uh, uh, it is a very, very successful meeting, uh, and uh, everything is uh, recorded. Uh, and uh, uh, tomorrow we'll start uh, at uh, once more at uh, 10 o'clock and we'll see what uh, they will uh, show us uh, uh, professionals that I, in I invited. And uh, in the afternoon uh, there will be a program with uh, Mr. Peter van Hoyte that came here personally. And uh, if uh, today we heard something about Netflix, so we'll have also a very good uh, professional uh, uh, senior supervisor from London uh, that uh, cares about uh, cooperation with uh, uh, Netflix. So I want to invite you if you will have time or, or so, if not, uh, it's okay too. And uh, I think that uh, today's meeting is very, very successful. And the last time we will cla clap our hands that everything is okay, fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much, participants. <laughs> I, I see also visually clapping the hands. Very good. So, uh, the first day is closed, and uh, we'll meet together at uh, 9.30 here in, in this room. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Yes, see you Thank tomorrow. you. See you tomorrow.